Visions Dragon Rain Book 7 By Kit Bladegrave Chapter 1 Sabella Tristan was going to kill me. I swore I'd stay at the castle, stay where it was safe, with Lucy and the others, waiting for him and the hunting party to get back. I might have found out I was part god, but my power wasn't the most reliable thing in the world. Worked wonders when I was under a high-stress situation, like fighting for my life or saving those around me. Otherwise it was just pretty flashing lights. Which was why he ordered me to remain behind. Too bad I wasn't a very good listener, but he should have known that by now. Even harder to stay behind after having a vision telling me there was going to be an ambush that he didn't know about. With Hank and the few other wolves with me, my personal guard actually thanks to my new position and Tristan's overbearing nature. We traipsed through the mud and muck of the boggy lands near the outskirts of Torolf, before reaching elven territory. I hadn't been to Silver Valley yet, but Tristan promised it was on our travel list, if we could ever find a way to beat back the darkness that had taken over all the realms. For three weeks now there'd been no sun. No light except for fires and torches, and it was starting to get on my nerves. Everyone's nerves really. The only bright side to any of this was spending so much time around Tristan kept the insanity far, far away. The visions would come and go, but now at least, I could see clearly. Too bad I couldn't see everything Baladin was about to throw at us. We're getting close, Hank whispered behind me, pointing to the exact cliff face I'd described from my vision. You're sure they're up there? I'd been wandering around the castle, impatiently waiting for Tristan and the rest of his hunting party to return from rescuing a group of villagers they said were bogged down by more of Baladin's nightmarish creatures. I'd found myself in his room. I'd barely touched the wardrobe when the vision hit me full force. I saw the hunting party at the village, killing the three grotesque, massive rats with their rabid young scurrying around the village, attacking anything that moved. They'd killed them, but it was when they'd been leaving the village the ambush happened. Spiders the size of carriages, and pincers longer than my arms had descended from that cliff, and the dying screams of the hunting party had been ringing in my ears as I'd sprinted through the castle in search of Hank. Yeah they're there, I assured him. How many? Four maybe five. I closed my eyes, forcing myself to concentrate on the power within me. My mother Farah was a goddess of light, and she'd passed on some of that power to me. I thought only of the light, and when I opened my eyes I knew my eyes were glowing, lighting up Hank's face right before he shifted to his wolf form. He didn't have to tell me he expected me to stay behind him, but it all depended on how the fight went. We crept through the trees, nothing to light our way except the glow from my eyes. I mostly clung to Hank's back since they had much better night vision than I did. I wished I could say I was fearless, but every time I left the castle, it took everything I had not to curl up in a ball somewhere and hide. If not for the fact I was saving Tristan's butt, and the rest of the hunting party I'd become close to, I would not have left the castle. Baladin had unleashed every beast and monster ever conceived. Each time we encountered a new one, I felt my newly regained sanity tested. Creatures I didn't have names for attacked scouts and tore them to pieces. Left behind piles of nothing or worse, pools of blood and clothing. Everything else was eaten or taken. I thought I knew what a real nightmare was, but since the darkness had fallen, we found ourselves living in a never-ending hell that was only going to get worse. When we started ascending the rear of the cliff, Hank grunted and shrugged his shoulders, signaling for me to fall back. I almost refused, but I'd seen those spiders in my vision, and unless I could get my power to work correctly, I'd be pincered in half instantly. Though I'd shown some skill fighting Baladin's demonic statue, I was far from being on the same level as shifters who had been trained since they could walk. I stopped, watching their furry bodies slink further away before they were gone from my sight. I took a few more steps, hoping we'd get rid of this threat before Tristan and his party ever came close to this spot. I squinted at the wisp of white floating high above me in the trees. Quietly I moved closer, reaching my hand up to grab it. Sticky. Webs, I whispered, staring ahead of me in the trees. Oh no. Webs covered the treetops and were hanging down in long strands, glowing a dull white in the surrounding shadows barely visible. 
If Hank and the others walked into those, they'd be stuck, and the spiders would kill them before they went after the hunting party. Muttering angrily at my visions for not being more helpful, I raced up the hillside after Hank, hoping I caught up to them in time. It was hard to see, and the glow from my eyes kept flickering in and out as my fear started to get the better of me. I stumbled into something malleable and furry. When I reached down I felt fur covered in sticky webs and heard an annoyed growl. Hang on I whispered, not sure who I just walked into. I pulled at the webs, cutting them with the dagger from my hip holster, until the wolf was free. Might be easier not to be in wolf form, I added. A moment later, Danielle stood in front of me, her yellow eyes flaring in anger. I got that, she muttered and drew her sword. The rest are stuck too. We moved together, and each time we found a wolf trapped in a web, we raced to get them unstuck so they could shift back and we could continue on our way. The further along we got, the more my unease grew, and I felt like we were being watched. They're in the trees, I said in a breath, grabbing hold of Danielle's arm to stop her. Where? I gulped as I those pincers began clicking. Right above us. None of us moved, though I couldn't stop myself from shaking as tree branches creaked under the weight of the monstrosities overhead. Danielle put a finger to her lips when I met her eyes, and I nodded. Then she motioned to the shifters we'd freed, waving for them to spread out further as the creaking grew louder. I shut my eyes when leaves fell over my shoulders, throwing a hand over my mouth to stop myself from squealing in alarm. A shadow fell over me and I felt this evil presence drawing closer and closer. Now, Danielle yelled the attack and grabbed my hand at the same time, dragging me out from under the beast as it crashed down to the ground. It shrieked as the shifters swiped at it with their blades, reared back on its rear legs, those pincers clicking loudly, dripping with a thick gelatinous substance that made me gag as the stench of rotting meat hit me. I fell to the ground with Danielle as those long legs swiped toward us, until another shifter drove his blade right into its abdomen. It screamed, black blood that smoked was pooling on the ground. The beast whirled around, still going strong. Some of that light magic would be great right about now, Danielle yelled. The sounds of whining wolves up ahead turned frantic. More creaking sounds came from the trees above head. We have to get the others out of the webs. Sabella, wait. Damn it. She yelled for me to get back, but Hank and the rest of my guard were about to be eaten alive, and I was not just going to stand there cowering in the shadows while it happened. I shook my hands out hard as I ran, willing the light to work with me, but nothing happened, other than a few sputtering attempts. You've got to be shitting me, I muttered, staggering into another trapped wolf and furiously hacking away at the webs to free him. It wasn't Hank, but he stuck with me as I moved to the next and the next, until another dark shadow fell from the trees. A wolf snarled in fury and I gripped my dagger tighter. Hank, that was Hank, about to be torn apart by that beast. Not thinking and ignoring the guards trying to pull me back, I launched myself forward with a yell and felt a rush of power explode outward. The spider tumbled backward, crashing through the trees as I raced to Hank's side. As soon as his fur was free of the webs, he shifted back and drew his sword. It's coming back. I gasped as Hank threw me to the side and then he hit the ground, letting the monster run over top him. He rolled back and jammed his sword upward, over and over again, into the spider's underside until it collapsed with a thud that shook the ground. It remained down and when Hank found his feet, he was covered in the black sticky blood, grimacing as he tried to wipe some of it off. The shifters down the slope yelled in triumph as they managed to take the first one down, but then leaves fluttered over our heads, and I was filled with a sense of dread. I craned my neck, trying to make out the shapes in the shadows of the trees. How many did you say? Hank asked, holding his sword at the ready as we backed up together, our eyes glued to the branches overhead. I don't remember, I hissed. We should. A web shot out of the shadows and took Hank with it, plastering him to a tree. I aimed my hands and prayed for the light to work through me, but all it did was sizzle. Come on. Just work already. Sabella get out of here, Hank yelled as another spider crashed through tree branches and hit the ground, those pincers clicking menacingly. I froze until those eight blood-red eyes turned to me and it stood on its back four legs. Then I was running, drawing the monster as far away from Hank as I could get it. 
I yelled when a shot of webbing flew past my head, weaving between the trees as another monster hit the ground to my right, knocking over trees and sending me staggering far off to the left. I felt the light inside me, but no matter how hard I tried or how loud I yelled at it to come out, nothing happened. With those pincers clicked right behind me and death coming for me much sooner than I expected, I growled in disbelief. Silly me, I'd thought I'd be lucky enough to have a vision of when my time would come, so I could prepare for it. Apparently, that hadn't been in the cards. Shit, I shrieked as my arms windmilled at my sides when my toes reached the edge of the cliff and a 50-foot drop onto sharp jagged rocks. The two spiders clicked their pincers excitedly as I turned around, gulping while I stared them down. Or tried to. Those eyes reflected their hunger and I desperately tried to get my power to work, mumbling under my breath as I stretched my hands out again and again, but after yet another bright flicker, the light was sucked away by the shadows. I sagged. I swore the spiders cackled as they moved in. Did I let myself get eaten or jump off the cliff? The spiders prepared to shoot me with their damned webs, and I crouched low, covering my head. A thunderous snarl cut through the night, and a large, furry body appeared out of the darkness, throwing itself into the two spiders and tackling them to the ground. A wolf. All three figures disappeared into the trees, and I ran after them, waiting for a yelp of pain from the wolf. Instead I ducked as a long hairy insect leg came flying toward me, followed by more before the shrieking of the spiders. Their shrieks were cut off by fierce growling and the wet sticky sound of bodies being torn apart. That same furry body stalked out of the shadows, yellow eyes glowing, black blood covering his face and half his body. He bared his fangs at me, his hackles raised. Don't look at me like that, I snapped at Tristan. He huffed a snarl. What? He shook out his head, refusing to shift back. I crossed my arms and didn't back down. I know you told me not to leave, but what choice did I have, huh? I got a vision of those things attacking you and your party. And what about the villagers that were with you? He growled louder as Hank and my guard slowly crept forward from the shadows. He started to turn toward them, but I picked up a stick and chucked it at his head. He whipped back around, eyes narrowed at me as he gnashed his jaws. Don't you dare take it out on them, I warned. They came out here to keep me safe just like you ordered them. And you can't sit there and tell me you would have checked this ridge? Would you? When he didn't move a muscle, I smirked in triumph. That's what I thought. I came out here to save your ass, I said. He huffed. Yeah, I know you wound up saving mine, but still. I wasn't just going to sit back at the castle, waiting for you to come back home, when I knew these things were waiting for you. His eyes moved in a circle, and I threw another stick at him, making him snap his jaws. Did you seriously just roll your eyes at me? Really? You know what, maybe the next time I see you being torn apart by some vicious monster, I won't come help you. How about that? I stalked past him. He moved his body to try and block me, but I kept on walking. I was not in the mood to deal with him right now. Ungrateful furball. Hank let's go. I could tell Hank was trying to hide a grin and failing. Tristan snapped his jaws at him, and Hank coughed harshly as he fell in line behind me. The remainder of my guard followed, and I stomped down the slope, stepping carefully over spider corpses, sloshing through puddles of black blood, until we finally reached the trees where we'd hitched our horses. You know he's going to give you hell once he gets back, Hank warned as we mounted up. Yeah, and? And I'm just saying, maybe you should start listening to him more. So, you want me to not let him know when I have a vision that's going to save his life? I argued. I'm saying you're acting like a seer and not part of the pack, he corrected. I know you're not a shifter, but you have to see this from his side, Sabella. The Alpha is always obeyed. I flicked the reins and my chestnut mare started down the road. Maybe it's time for a change. You can't change instincts, he warned but I ignored him. Shifter or not, Tristan was making it very difficult for me to do what I was brought here to do. Protect him and the rest of the races. Every time I had a vision now, his first order of business seemed to be finding out what it was, and then tricking me into staying behind while he sent others out to deal with the threat. 
Forrest had returned to Gregorneth to deal with the sudden threat of hellhounds and banshees that had moved into his territory, but Craig and Kate were still in Torolf. There'd been plenty of nights where I would find her and vent about Tristan. I thought that after proving to him I could handle myself, he would let up a bit on the overprotectiveness, but it had only gotten worse. The darkness unleashed by Baladin did nothing to help me prove I could keep myself safe. It zapped the light from me every time I tried to use it, just like tonight. I might get one or two hits with it, but then it would just disappear. Tonight would be like so many others. As soon as Tristan returned, he'd track me down and lecture me on putting my life in danger, and on and on and on. I told him repeatedly, though he refused to listen, that being part God meant I was not as fragile as he assumed. I healed much faster from wounds now, and though I wasn't sure about the whole immortal thing, I sensed it would take a lot to kill me. I hoped. That didn't mean I wasn't scared of having that theory tested, such as tonight, when I was almost eaten by spiders, but it should have made him feel better. Not like he had to watch me every second of the day. The moments where we seemed happy with each other were starting to be few and far between. Some days, I couldn't stop my mind from wandering and drifting toward the notion that there was a chance we weren't as perfect for each other as we thought. By the time we reached the stables, I was in no mood to talk to anyone and kept my mouth shut, as I helped the two wounded shifters inside to see the physician. From the way your brow is furrowed, Kate said, and I glanced up to see her at the stairs, I'd say tonight did not go as planned. What happened? I shrugged. Let's just say Tristan is not a happy wolf. That bad. I went out to save him, and what happens? Oh that's right, he winds up saving me. Again. I told her exactly what occurred as she followed me up to my room, so I could change out of my spider blood drenched clothes and scrub the rest of the crap off my skin. You can't blame him too much, Kate said a few minutes later. I scowled at her. What? You sound like the rest of the shifters in this damned castle. She tilted her head back and forth with a cringe. Your power has been a bit shaky. She waved her hand back and forth. If it was still like when you defeated the statue, I don't think he'd worry as much. And then there are the visions. I ground my teeth, vigorously scrubbing at a spot of spider blood on my arm. There's nothing wrong with my visions. Really? Cut the bullshit, Sabella. My head shot up as my jaw dropped. Don't look at me like that. Tristan talks to Craig, and he talks to me. I know you've been having visions at least two times a day, if not more. She crossed her arms as her green eyes fled at me. Tristan's worried about you. Says it's breaking you down and that your sanity is questionable afterward. I avoided her intense, worried gaze as I went back to scrubbing my arm. I'm fine. No you're not. Is it really getting that bad? I set the cloth back in the basin and glanced up at my reflection, specks of blood dotted my face, and my hair was a right mess after running through the woods with giant spiders chasing me. With Tristan around, everything was sharper, clearer, but that didn't account for the moments right before or after a vision hit me. I'd forget where I was, that I was even a seer. A few times, I hated to admit, I forgot who Tristan was and would freak out until everything came back to me. So far, we managed to keep those moments private, so no one else knew how bad it got, but I refused to give voice to my fear of not coming back from the craziness after a vision. I felt terrible for it too, making Tristan have to deal with me on top of fighting a war. Not to mention, we were still clueless when it came to that damned riddle, and trying to come up with a plan to free the trapped gods, including my mother. My shoulders hunched, and I fought back the first round of tears, hating that I felt like breaking down. Kate sighed and hurried over to me. It'll all work out. You just have to have a little faith. How am I supposed to do that, when I might fall apart before we find a way to win this war? You won't. I laughed bitterly. You didn't know me before all of this. You didn't see me at my worst when nothing made sense. When I would spend days lost in my own head, I whispered. If that happens again with Baladin around? And these powers inside me? I couldn't stop my imagination from running away. The last thing I want to do is hurt someone. Then don't. I wished I could have that much optimism, 
But after tonight, knowing Tristan would be upset with me again and that Hank seemed to think I was the one messing up, my happy thoughts went out the window. I told Kate I was going to finish washing up, and then wait for the return of His Majesty. She hugged me and promised again that everything would work out. As I splashed water on my face and scrubbed at it until it was red, I willed myself to have a vision, one that would give me all the answers. Chapter 2 Tristan I stormed into the castle, shifting back the second my paws hit stone. Get the villagers set for the night, I ordered Boris who shifted next to me. See to the wounded. Of course sire, and where may I ask will you be, he asked, a hint of a smile on his face. Where do you think? I snapped and ran up the stairs toward my chambers. My clothes stank as did the rest of me. I was covered in blood, saliva, and other shit. I didn't want to know what it was. After the fight at the village, I expected to have a quick run back to the castle and turn in for the night, but then we'd heard the panicked yells, and the second I saw that bright flash of white light, my heart had been in my throat as I took off, heading straight for it. Sabella. Why didn't she ever just listen to me? Those creatures had her back to the edge of the cliff. A few seconds later, if I'd been just a few seconds too late, they would have killed her. It didn't matter to me if she was part god or not, we had no real idea what her healing was like, or if she was immortal. I for one was not willing to risk it. My hands curled into fists so tight my fingers protested, but I didn't let up. If she was going to be part of this pack, she had to learn there was no disobeying orders, not mine. Not ever. I did it to keep her safe, keep the rest of my pack safe. Why couldn't she understand that? She swore to me she was stable, but she was only lying to us both, and one of these times, I wouldn't get there in time to save her life. I washed up hurriedly in my chambers, growling the entire time, pulled on fresh clothes, and stormed through the side door and into the short hall that connected my rooms to hers. I threw the door open so hard it banged into the wall, and waited to hear her yell at me, but her chambers were silent. Sabella? I cautiously stepped inside. She'd been known to throw things at me after a fight like the one we had out on that cliff. Nothing flew at my head, and I took another few steps, starting to worry. Sabella? I sniffed the air. Lilac. She was here, and then I spotted her red hair blowing in the night wind as she stood out on her balcony. Taking a deep breath and reminding myself to keep a tight leash on my anger, I went to her, but stopped a few feet short, remaining in the doorway. I hadn't tried to be quiet, so she had to know I was there, but she didn't turn. We're going to play it like this then? I muttered, but she didn't even glance back at me. Fine, if you're not going to talk then I will. You deliberately disobeyed me, again. You can't keep running off like that and straight into danger. None of us know what these creatures are or how strong and yet you insist on taking off with only your guard to protect you, and are you even thinking about their safety? She bristled at my words and whipped around. About damn time. Of course I do. Just like I was thinking about yours which is why I was out there in the first place. I would have been fine, I argued. She crossed her arms, rolling her eyes. Really? What? What am I supposed to do, when I get a vision and see you being ripped to pieces in it? Sit here, bat my eyelashes and think to myself, oh he's a big bad wolf, he'll be alright. Nothing can hurt him. I'll just stand on my balcony, holding my handkerchief, and pray he'll come home to me. Is that really what you want me to do? Really? I ground my teeth as I growled. I am stronger than you seem to realize. So am I. You are not a shifter. You are a seer. And part God. You always seem to forget that part. That means nothing, I shot back. We don't know what your limits are because you're half God, only half. We glared each other down, both of our chests heaving in anger before I grunted in annoyance. You will start listening to my commands, Sabella. You agreed to be part of this pack, and that means do as I say. I am the Alpha, not you, I yelled, losing grip on my anger very quickly, all out of fear of losing her. A flicker of doubt flashed across her face, and I wished I could take my words back. Too late. You're right just like I'm not a shifter and, and, oh hell, she mumbled. She collapsed as her eyes turned foggy. 
I caught her and sank to the floor, waiting impatiently for whatever rambling words were about to spill out of her mouth this time. Leave it to you to have a vision to get out of an argument, I whispered more to myself since she couldn't hear me. Her hands twitched and her head jerked to the right and left. She sucked in a sharp breath and my gut clenched. This was not like any other time. Sabella? The fog in her eyes darkened, and an evil cackle that was not hers slipped from her parted lips. How sweet you are looking after my niece. I froze as those dark eyes focused on me. Baladin? This wasn't happening, it couldn't be. The cackling grew louder. I see you continue to kill my pets, King Tristan. That's not a very nice way to treat one of your gods now, is it? No, no, it's not. What am I to do with you and your pack of mangy mutts, hum? What indeed? We will stop you, I warned him. And I will personally find a way to end your existence. Is that so? I look forward to your attempts before I destroy you and all the others who defy me. A cold shiver shot down my back, hearing this horrible voice coming from Sabella's mouth. Perhaps the next test will prove what type of leader you truly are, King Tristan. Tick tock, soon, very soon, I will have the power I need to make the darkness permanent and turn this world into a never ending nightmare. His words cut off and Sabella went rigid in my arms, then she coughed harshly and sat up, eyes wild as she blinked, and the fog disappeared. I held her loosely, and then her eyes shot to my arms then up to my face, and she screamed, scrambling to get away. Who are you? she demanded, pressing her back against the railing as I stayed right where I was. My name is Tristan, and you are Sabella, I said calmly, while inside I wanted to yell in frustration and worry about having to go through this again with her. You are safe here. You just have to remember. Tristan, she repeated, her eyes focusing only on my face. I, I know you. Yes you do. Take your time, it'll all come back to you. She nodded fervently, breathing in and out through her nose hard. Slowly, the recognition came back, and I sighed when she threw herself back into my arms, tucking her head against my shoulder as I embraced her. I'm sorry, she whispered. I'm so sorry. It's not your fault like I tell you every time, I grunted and cupped her face in my hands. But you have to stop scaring me like this, can we agree on that at least? She nibbled her lip. I won't sit by and do nothing, I can't. I sighed but kissed her before we both got to our feet. I waited for her to tell me what she saw, or about having Baladin inside her head, but all she asked was what she told me this time around. I kept her hand tucked in mine as I shrugged. Nothing important, at least not that I could tell. Just more talk about monsters and whatnot, I lied. I waited for her to call me out on it, but she was too distracted by forgetting her spell again. It's getting worse, she whispered, sounding as lost as she'd been the first time we met. What happens if I can't come back? Don't say that, I said sternly, don't even think it. You will always come back. Tristan? No, we're not having this conversation, again. Yes we are because we need to. What happens if I freak out worse? What if I hurt you, or someone else? We need to talk to Grayson and the other sorcerers. Maybe. She trailed off but I saw the idea in her eyes and tore my hand free. No. You belong here, and you are going to remain here. You're just angry because if I'm not here, you can't order me not to try and prevent the horrible outcomes I see in my visions. I refused to answer, screwing my mouth to the side as I fought back the urge to order her right now not to talk to the sorcerers or anyone else who might take her from me. If she was with them, they would listen to her visions, and they would gladly go off with her, without a care for what might happen. I get these visions for a reason, she went on. And they're not going to stop. How do you know? I muttered, and she reached for my hand but stopped short and let hers fall back to her side. Because there's too much darkness in the world right now. Darkness that is clearly sapping your light, which is why I ask you time and again to stay here. You don't ask. You command me like I'm one of your damned guards. She shoved past me, aiming for the door. Where are you going? We're not finished. Yes we are. Red get back here. But she yanked open the door, stepped out into the corridor, and slammed it shut behind her. Red, I yelled but she didn't come back in. 
I spent a few moments snarling at the empty room before I went back to my rooms in an attempt to cool off. Boris waited for me there, and his worried frown told me he heard everything. Hard not to when this entire castle was filled with shifters, and we'd been yelling. I was sure everyone just heard our argument, just like every other yelling match. Well that sounded fun, Craig said from by the door. Problems? Always. The wolf in me wanted to howl in aggravation, while the human part said to go after her, until we could figure out how to make this work. I did neither. She's getting worse. The words slipped out before I could stop them, and I ran a hand over my tired face. And she doesn't listen to me at all. Why? Why does she have to turn everything into a fight? Craig failed to hide his smile. Welcome to my world, he muttered. Kate's just as bad. Yes, but to be fair, Kate's not slowly losing her mind. I hadn't told Sabella about whose voice had come through while she'd been out of it, but there wasn't a chance I would keep it from them. Has it gotten that bad? Craig asked. Yes. Every time now, she doesn't remember who she is, who I am. What happens if she never comes back to herself? What then? I said, my voice growing louder in my anger and aggravation and now knowing what to do. And if I wasn't afraid of enough already, I spoke with Baladin tonight. Boris choked on his mug of ale as he stared at me in shock. What? When? I pinched the bridge of my nose, feeling a headache coming on. Sabella, I thought she was falling into a vision, but she opened her mouth and, and his voice came out instead. I plopped into the nearest chair. Craig let out a string of curses. Did she say if she saw anything helpful? Like where he is, so we can just kill him and be done with it. He's a god. You can't just kill a god, I snapped. Never know until you try. I shot him a glare. Sabella didn't remember hearing his voice. Or if she saw anything. Craig straightened and shook his head. Seriously? You didn't even tell her, did you? Would you have if it was Kate? I challenged. She needs to know. What if it happens again, or who's to say is not using her to spy on us just like he used that statue? What are you saying? I jumped to my feet and stalked toward him until we were barely a foot apart. You want me to what, lock her away in a cell? Put up a magical cage around her to keep her trapped? What, Craig, please tell me what you want me to do to make her life more miserable than it already is because of those damned visions. My words bounced off the stone walls and I wanted to smack myself for yelling. Aside from Kate and Sabella, those here would have heard everything. I growled furiously, but then instantly Boris was there, gently pushing us apart. Take a breather both of you, he said sternly. I backed off as Craig did the same. I let him get away for ordering me around for once. Sabella's concerns of being a danger to herself or others came back to me but I refused to think she would ever accidentally harm me or the pack that had accepted her, finally, with open arms. Or at least most of them. A few, Danielle included, seemed to be a bit more hesitant, though they did not let it interfere with their duties of keeping her safe. For the most part though, she was their queen. If Baladin tried to use her to harm us, she would know, and she would stop him. Perhaps this is a discussion best saved for the morning after a good night's sleep and a hot breakfast, Boris suggested. And then we can speak with Kate and the others who should know. Including Sabella. No. Tristan, Craig started. I raised my hand. Fine, if you want to be an idiot and keep things from her then that's on you. I'll see you in the morning. He stomped out of the room. For the second time that night, I had a door slammed on me. He's right you know, Boris said lightly. She should know. I think you should get some sleep too, I snapped. We've all had a long day. It was a command from his king, his alpha, and he knew it. Very well, sire. If there is anything else you'll be needing. That will be all, thank you. He nodded, and carrying his mug of ale, left me to brood alone. After stoking a fire in the hearth, I dragged over the furs and collapsed to the floor, staring into the flames as they crackled and popped. I waited for an answer to all my problems to present itself, but my headache only grew worse, and my fear of losing Sabella made me sick to my stomach. 
The hours ticked by into the night and sheer exhaustion had my eyes closing. I breathed in deep and caught a whiff of lilac a second before the door to the short corridor opened slowly. I remained where I was, propped up by the pillows I dragged off my bed. A shadow fell over me, and all I did was lift the furs for Sabella to sink down beside me and curl against my side. I kissed the top of her head and pulled her in close. I'm sorry, she whispered, but I was already shaking my head. This life is new to you, I said gently. I get that it's not going to be so easy for you most days. Any day, she corrected grumpily. I chuckled. I know you're not a shifter, but you are the most important person in this world to me, and I do what I do to keep you safe. Just as I do what I do to keep you alive, she insisted. Tristan? Red? I glanced over to see her staring up at me, those eyes filled with worry and doubts. What's wrong? But then she smiled and leaned up enough to kiss me sweetly. Nothing. Nothing at all. A few moments later, she was sound asleep, and I settled in deeper among the furs, holding her close. If only this was how our lives would be every night, then I could guarantee her safety and our happiness. But the darkness crept in closer every day, and sooner or later, it would snuff out the light within her. Chapter 3 Tristan I jerked awake, staring at the dying embers of the fire in the hearth. Sabella's body was still curled up against my side beneath the furs, and I lay my head back, wrapping my arm more securely around her as I tried to shake the last remnants of a nightmare. She'd been on that cliff, and those spiders were eating her alive. I shuddered, knowing how close it had been to coming true. I glanced toward the window, but darkness reigned. There was no real way to tell when it was night or day, except to trust my body when it said it was time to get up. I sensed it was early morning, too early to function so I closed my eyes and attempted to get a few hours more sleep. The furs were tucked in around us, and I sank into their warmth. Bad dream? Sabella whispered. Didn't mean to wake you, I said as she shifted in my arms to see my face. Go back to sleep. What did you see? she asked. Nothing that needs to be shared, trust me, I grumbled. Sleep? There you go, giving me orders again. She mumbled even as she yawned and settled her head against my shoulder and her arm snaked around my waist. Stubborn furball. I smoothed my fingers through her hair, nodding in agreement. You'll have to get used to it. And if I don't? My fingers stilled for a second before I forced them to keep moving. There's no reason to question this, Sabella, I promise. Relationships are hard, and ours started in the midst of a war. I think we're allowed to have some issues. I sensed her agitation, but then she settled back down and said nothing more. When I checked, her eyes were closed and I felt her steady breathing. She'd fallen back asleep. Good. I was terrible at lying to her, and both of us didn't need to be worried about our future together. I stared at the dark red embers for a long while before I finally drifted back to sleep. It might have only been an hour or so before there was a loud knock at my door, startling us both awake. Sire. Breakfast is being served in the hall, Hank called out. Thank you Hank. I yawned and stretched, shaking out my hair as Sabella laughed. Some days you're more wolf than man, she informed me as she got to her feet and reached her hands up to the ceiling, standing on her toes like she always did first thing in the morning. I admired the view as she sauntered toward the adjoining hall. Where are you going? Freshening up, don't worry, I'll see you down there. I caught her hand right before she disappeared through the door and kissed her softly. She leaned into my embrace, and I wove my fingers up through her long locks before we reluctantly parted, and I let her go to her rooms to get ready for another day. How could she make me so mad one day, and then make me want nothing more than to hold her the next? I'd have to ask Craig how he managed it when we were all together again. I dressed in fresh clothes, tugged on my boots and found my way downstairs. The hall was filled with my guests, as well as the other occupants of the castle. They started to get up to bow when they saw me, but I waved them all back down. Too early for formalities. Who's got the coffee? And steak, steak would be fantastic this morning. Boris shoved a plate toward me as I sat down, and I thanked the servant that poured me a large mug of steaming coffee. Sire, he muttered. 
I shot him a look before I dug into my food, eating half the steak in a few large bites. Should I ask why you're so ravenous this morning? Kate asked across the table with a mischievous smile on her face. Craig grunted and held his head in his hand. What? I'm just curious. Curious about what? I asked. Nothing it's nothing, Craig insisted loudly and nudged Kate. That is not breakfast conversation. I'm just curious. Can't a girl be curious? Just thinking of Sabella after all. I stared from one to the other as they continued to banter before it hit me, and I dropped my fork, feeling my body grow hot. I choked down my mouthful of food and chugged my coffee, making it worse when the scalding liquid burned my throat all the way down. Kate and Craig watched, the first grinning widely, but I shook my head and her smile fell. Can we not talk about this right now? I growled in warning. She sighed heavily but held up her hands. Fine, be a party pooper. Craig mouthed an apology, but Kate punched him in the shoulder. What? There's nothing wrong with me asking. Yes there is, we snapped at the same time, and she burst out laughing. Wow boys. What about boys? Sabella asked from behind me, and I stilled. Did I miss something? Kate was nodding as Craig and I shook our heads. Sabella sat beside me and reached for a mug and poured her own coffee. She had not gotten used to having people do anything for her, and she told me she doubted she ever would. She spooned sugar into the dark liquid, she and Kate having a wordless conversation that I did not like with their eyes and smiles. Kate finally shrugged, rolling her eyes in disappointment, and Sabella bobbed her head, sipping her coffee. What are you two talking about? I demanded. Huh? Who said we were talking about anything? I heard the annoyance in her words though and pushed my plate away, not hungry anymore. Since the darkness fell, there'd been little time, admittedly, for Sabella and I to talk much about our relationship and where it was headed. Or how we wanted to proceed with it. This was new territory for both of us, and I assumed she wanted to take things slow. She was the one constantly reminding me that there was a chance she could still go back to being the crazy girl from Maine if she wasn't careful. How was I supposed to take that except as a proceed with extreme caution in anything we did? But now, watching her and Kate continue their silent conversation, I started to wonder if we weren't going so slow because I was more hesitant than she was. Sabella was all fire and determination on the inside, but she was fragile in my mind. How many times had I picked her up off the ground after a vision? Or had to rush in to save her life? Watched her bleeding and screaming in pain? I stabbed my fork into my steak, and everyone at the table turned to stare at me. Sorry. You sure you're alright? Sabella asked quietly. Yes I'm fine. We should finish eating so we can discuss our next move, I instructed. Picking up my coffee, I excused myself from the table and went to wait for the others in the council chamber. Think I'll join you, Craig announced and together we left the hall. Once we were out of earshot of everyone else, he leaned in. Sorry for Kate. No it's fine. I guess at some point it's going to happen. She said she's worried about you too. Thinks, moving forward, he was clearly struggling to get the words out, would go a long way to getting you both past this wall going up between you two. There's no wall, I muttered. Craig cringed. Is that what everyone thinks? You two have been arguing nearly every day. I growled the rest of the way to the council chamber. Unable to sit and relax, I walked slowly around the room, shaking my head. I just want her to listen to me, just once. She's not a shifter, remember? Oh, I remember. She makes it clear to me every damn day. Then perhaps it's you who needs to change, he suggested. I glowered at him, not about to admit the thought had crossed my mind. But what was I supposed to do? She was my beta, part of the pack now, and the pack was stronger together. One weak link, one person acting recklessly put all the others at risk. Somehow, I had to make Sabella see that. You going to tell her today? Craig asked. About the voice? I am, and she's not going to be happy. You thought she would be? You should have told her last night, he said quickly. I bared my teeth. He added, I understand why you waited. She won't. 
As soon as I told Sabella what really happened last night, she was going to be pissed. If I told her last night, it would have led to an argument too. So either way, I was screwed. I fell deeper into my thoughts, and eventually found myself musing over what Kate and Sabella had been silently discussing. Did I want to know? That wasn't even a question, but I was stopped by my worry for what could go wrong. What if she had a vision and woke up like that next to me, in bed with a man she didn't recognize? What if didn't come back to herself? What if this wasn't going to work out the way I hoped? I hated the uncertainty of my day-to-day -day life now, but then the doors opened and Kate and Sabella walked in, followed by Boris, Hank, Grayson, Lucy and a few other shifter commanders. The other pack leaders were busy protecting their lands, and instead of constantly calling them to me, I sent out messengers whenever there was an event that occurred or a new addition to our plan that was yet to be an actually formulated strategy. Those here found their seats at the table and waited for me to join them before everyone sat down. Before we decide where our next move is going to take place, I said slowly, avoiding Sabella's gaze, there's another matter we need to talk about. And that is? Kate asked. I finally lifted my gaze to Sabella's, trying to tell her I was sorry with my eyes as the words came out of my mouth. Last night when you thought you had a vision, it was something worse. Baladin, he spoke to me through you. A hush fell over the room, but it was the way Sabella's eyes widened in panic, then narrowed in anger that had my chest squeezing like it was trapped in a vice. Each breath I took was more painful than the last as her jaw clenched and her hands gripped the edge of the table, until her knuckles turned white. You, you lied to me, she whispered harshly. I was protecting you. She pushed back from the table heatedly, and I rose to follow and stop her in case she tried to leave. You, you had, you had no right. Sabella, please. No. Damn it, Tristan. You can't do this, you can't keep things from me. Especially when they happen to me. I reached for her hand but she yanked it away, storming toward the door. I was faster and blocked her from leaving. We need to talk about this. Move. Not happening. Red, sit down. Her eyes narrowed at my order and she crossed her arms, that glare promising this fight was far from over. She stalked back to her seat and sat down hard, not uncrossing her arms and glaring at the table so intensely, I expected it to burst into flames. At least fire was not in her control otherwise I was sure she would have had me up in flames by now. When I made it back to my place, Kate scowled at me like she wanted to smack me upside the head. I couldn't blame her but I met her eyes glare for glare, and growled for her to back off. She had her own issues with Craig. She needed to keep her nose out of mine and Sabella's. What did he say? Lucy asked. Baladin. Not much except there was a test coming for me to see if I was a true king or not, I relayed. And he was upset we were killing so many of his pets. Good Craig snapped. Means we're getting to him. Or he's planning something worse, Boris suggested. We need to find him. That leads me to my other idea, I said, wishing Sabella would look at me, but she refused. I would like to return to the stone maze and see if Baladin is still there. If he is, I say we aim to wound or capture him. Kill him if we can. Are you insane? Sabella yelled. Really? You want to go back there? Just like that? We have no other leads. Going there will give us information if nothing else. Or it's a trap and you'll get yourself killed, she snarled, but what do I know? I'm just a seer, right? This time when she stormed for the door, I didn't try to stop her. I just let her leave. Kate excused herself and followed her out, hopefully to calm her down. I rubbed my forehead. Why is this so hard? I muttered to myself. She's frustrated we all are, Lucy said simply. Our hands are tied with no leads to go on, no way to know where Baladin is. But this plan of yours, are you sure it's what you want to do? What choice do we have? It's not as if Baladin is dropping us any hints here. Shall I prepare our warriors then? Boris asked. I looked around the table at Craig and Hank, as well as my other commanders. Al were nodding in agreement. Yes, we'll head out tomorrow, I ordered. Lucy, I would ask you accompany us if you are able. 
We may find ourselves in need of some extra firepower. Of course, she said bowing her head. They all rose to go. I felt Sabella's rage from this far away, and it set my teeth on edge. I had to face her eventually, and started to track her down. I scented the air and followed the light trail of lilac through the castle, and out toward the courtyard. When it passed through the main gate, my heart hammered with worry, and I picked up the pace, shifting so I could sniff her out better. I feared she had taken off, and no one noticed, but I followed her trail around the outer wall and back toward a grove of trees surrounding a small pond. When I neared the tree line, I spied her. Her pants rolled up to her knees as she moved delicately through the water. I stayed where I was, watching as she bent down and scooped up a lily in her hands. I had no idea what she was trying to do, but I couldn't turn away. What am I supposed to do with him? She asked loudly, and my ears flattened, fearing she was hearing voices again, until I saw Kate move into view, her pants also rolled up as she sat down and dunked her feet in the water. Craig is exactly the same way. Even after all you've done? Sabella asked, dropping the lily back to the water. Yeah. You and I aren't from this world, you know. We grew up without the fear of danger lurking around every corner. Think it freaks them out more, on some level. They don't think we have the right instincts for survival, you know? I sat down with a huff. Kate was onto something there. Sabella grew up isolated in the same building all her life. She knew nothing of how perilous this world could be. That's not an excuse to treat us like we're made of glass, Sabella muttered, swishing her foot through the water. I just want him to trust me. Was that really what she thought? I didn't trust her. He does, Kate assured her. I mentally told myself to thank her later. He's just worried. These visions of yours and the whole part god thing throw him off. You and I, we're not exactly normal, Kate added with a laugh. We're complicated, Sabella agreed. Maybe too complicated. Why did she sound so saddened by the thought? I almost went to her, but then their conversation shifted to a different topic, and I paused. I wonder sometimes though, if he has the same doubts I do, Sabella said. Doubts about what? About whether I'm meant to be part of his pack or not. We haven't talked about anything except this war. Nothing. You both have been a bit preoccupied, Kate tried to say, but she even sounded a bit doubtful. But if we're meant to be together, if that's what this is, then why haven't we made time to figure it out? Make it official and what not? I just, never mind. I backed away slowly through the trees, my mind racing with her words as I made my way back to the castle. Forrest and Craig had expected me to make it official right away, but I wanted to wait until there wasn't a war going on. Saving our people was more important than having a ceremony to show everyone what we already knew. Sabella and I were meant to be together. She was my queen, I knew that, but she was starting to second-guess everything we had together. How was I supposed to prove my feelings to her when she fought me at every turn? As I shifted back, walking through the courtyard, I vowed to set aside a night soon when we could sit down and decide our future together. But as I started to plan out what that night might entail, one of my commanders was coming up to me with questions about tomorrow's plan. I followed him and lost myself in the preparations for what could very well be another battle I knew we were far from prepared for. Chapter 4 Sabella I avoided Tristan most of the day, hanging out with Kate, or helping Lucy make salves and gather supplies for the infirmary, in case the trip into the pocket dimension ended with all of them coming back wounded. I refused to acknowledge the notion that some of them might not come back at all. All day long I waited for a vision to come, anything to give me a hint that this plan of theirs would end better than my gut was telling me it would, but nothing. I even snuck into Tristan's room and ran my hand over every surface. Still nothing. No visions, nothing to be of any help. I cursed my gift that was no longer a gift. In addition to the anticipation of a vision, I worried about Baladin using me to get to the others. If he spoke through me once, he could do it again, right? What if he was able to control me? I could attack the others and then what? Sabella. I jumped turning quickly. Grayson bowed his head in apology. 
I smiled. At least I tried to. Sorry, lost in my own head. I can tell. I'd been standing in the courtyard watching, as more torches were lit to replace the ones dying out from burning non-stop in this confounded bleak darkness. Supplies and horses were being prepped as well as weapons. I just want to see one little glimpse of what's going to happen tomorrow, just one. Sadly, I don't think that's how your visions are intended to work. Yeah well it'd be nice, I muttered. Yes yes it would. I wondered if I might speak with you a moment? Sure, not like I'm doing anything else right now. He seemed to be wrestling with whatever was on his mind, then he nodded to himself. In Silver Valley, there is an elf we sorcerers have often turned to for aid in matters concerning the gods. And? I asked, not sure where he was going with this. If there is anyone in all the realms who knows about the gods, how they work, how they think, maybe even about those born half-god, there is a chance he may have the answers, he told me. His name is Hansi, and he is wise, even beyond my many years on this earth. I believe if we were to seek him out, he might not only have insight into Baladin's plans but about you as well. You mean like with the visions? I asked trying not to get my hopes up. Too late for that. Why didn't you say anything sooner? Hansi has been away traveling for many months, but I have received a missive from King Drake that he has returned to Silver Valley. And I will be quite frank, he is not the most down-to-earth elf. He can be a bit out there, he admitted. But if he can help, it's worth seeing him, right? Yes, I believe so. I know of late it's been hard for you. Afterward, I mean. There is a chance he knows of a way to assist you with the light as well, he suggested. The darkness has been sapping it from you. And Baladin, if he has any knowledge of him, it would help Tristan. My excitement plummeted. But Tristan and the others are heading out tomorrow. He should see this Hansi first, right? In case he knows anything that could help? That was my thinking. He won't listen to an old man, but he may listen to you. I laughed at that. Tristan hardly seemed to listen to me anymore, but I had to try. I'll go and talk to him. If nothing else, he'll at least let me go with you to Silver Valley while he goes bounding off into danger. I would be happy to accompany you. I'll send word to Hansi now, to let him know there's a chance he'll be having visitors. Excuse me. He bowed his head before he left me to my thoughts. I walked around the courtyard for a few more minutes, debating on how to approach Tristan with this request. As long as I phrased it the right way, he had no reason to think I would be in any danger. I'd have Grayson with me if no one else. A sorcerer should count for something, right? And I could take my personal guard if he didn't need them for tomorrow's trip. Yeah, that'd work. I'd have plenty of protection, and then I could go track down what might turn out to be helpful leads while he tried not to get himself killed. As I made my way back inside the castle, I ran my fingers along the walls and doors, anything he might have touched, praying I'd get a vision before I saw him, but whatever power gave me my sight was quiet. Where's Tristan? I asked Boris when I saw him hurrying down the main hall. Last I saw he was in the armory, Boris said, eyes narrowing. Why? Have to run something by him is all, I said with a bright smile that made Boris frown more. What? Sabella, if you are planning on asking to tag along, I can tell you already the answer will be no. And if I said I had a vision? Did you? He asked. I fidgeted. Didn't think so. Well, I still have to talk to him, so if you'll excuse me. I hurried past him, moving quickly for the armory. When I entered, I grimaced to find he was not alone, and started to turn around to leave when he called my name. I was wondering if you had a minute, I said, not moving from the doorway. Always. Alone, I added pointedly, and his eyes darkened with worry. Give us the room, he told the other shifters, and they cleared out quickly. I shut the door behind them, and when I turned back, Tristan stayed right where he was. Sabella, I don't have much time. There are still a few details to be seen to. I tucked my hair behind my ears, suddenly nervous. Yeah, I know, I just... I was talking with Grayson and I, well, ah, uh, I think he's onto something. 
I wanted to go check it out with him, since I have a feeling you won't put off this idea of yours, to go back to that maze. Can we discuss what happened earlier first? Why? I snapped then hung my head. Look you lied to me and I got mad. It's fine right? Is it? He challenged. I feel like we're pulling away from each other, he said quietly. You said it yourself, relationships are hard and this one, well it's different. It's just going to take time. I said it, wanting to reassure him, but the words sounded lame even to me. Then why do I feel like we're running out of time? I don't know, but this isn't the time to talk about it. Never is, I mumbled, and his eyes darkened. It's fine all right? But if Grayson thinks he can get us answers on Baladin and maybe even help with my visions, I'd like to go with him. I could tell he wanted to keep talking about our latest fight, but he crossed his arms and asked instead, go where with him? I dug my toe into the stones as I said, Silver Valley. Absolutely not, he growled. Oh come on. Why not? You know perfectly well why. I'm going to be leaving and after your stunt with the spiders, I'm not about to let you out of my sight, or those that will keep you under close watch while I'm away, he shot back stalking across the room. You are to stay here where I know you'll be safe. Why don't I just come with you then? I might be able to help. Do you even hear yourself? Do you understand how crazy that sounds? Do you? I poked him hard in the chest, ignoring his growling. You were almost killed the last time we were there, remember? I was not. I should go with you. No. Why not? Because I'm the Alpha and I said so, end of story. He stormed around me, heading for the door, leaving me with my mouth open. Get back here, furball. I took off after him and caught his arm, dragging him to a stop. You do not just get to order me around like that. I should be with you. It's too dangerous. What if it's a trap? What if it is? If I go with you, I might be able to see it before you walk right into it. Tristan, you know you should take me with you. You just won't because you don't actually trust me to take care of myself. His whole body stilled as if I'd struck him. If I wasn't constantly saving you, I might. Wow, so there it is, everyone. I threw my arms up as I backed away from him. The truth comes out at last. You tell everyone around I'm your beta, your queen, and yet you don't trust me. That's just great. Sabella, he said quietly, glancing around at the crowd of shifters who'd stopped what they were doing to listen. Oh, I'm sorry, did you not want everyone to hear us again? You are being ridiculous. I laughed harshly and backed up another few steps. You're right, absolutely right. This is all my fault because I'm not a shifter and I can't fit into your pack. His jaw clenched and the muscles strained in his neck. I waited for him to deny it, to say something, anything to the contrary, but when he kept his mouth shut and his shoulders sagged like the fight had gone out of him, I felt a bit of my heart shatter. Okay. No, you know that's fine, I whispered, wiping hastily at my eyes before any tears could fall. Sabella, he said. Suddenly, I felt dizzy. I threw my hand out to the wall to catch myself as a vision slammed into me. The last thing I saw before I slipped under was Tristan holding me in his arms, his eyes filled with worry. And then he was gone. I spun around, but all around me was darkness. I waited for something to happen, to see anything in the midst. Fog swirled around my feet and the darkness grew dimmer until there was an eerie light falling over me and the nothingness around me. Well this is new, I whispered to myself. Hello. I had no idea who I expected to respond, but then I heard a wolf howling mournfully in the distance. It was heartbreaking, and I felt drawn to it as the howl went on and on, stretching into eternity. I walked and walked, the fog parting for me, and then there was a wolf silhouette ahead, standing on a ridge, but it wasn't alone. Four others stood by him to his right, but they were all in shadow. The howling died away and its gaze focused on something at its feet. Tristan. Why was I having a vision of him? And those other people, who were they? The light grew bright enough I could make out Craig's face, and his hand was on Kate's right shoulder. They stared sadly down at the ground too. 
The next face that came into view was forest, but the last one remained hidden from my sight. I took another step, then paused. I glanced down when my foot nudged something solid. No, I gasped and staggered backward. I stared at myself on the ground, eyes wide open, staring back at me. Lifeless. A sharp gasp sounded, and Kate tumbled to the ground next, followed by the third figure standing beside Forrest. I scrambled back further away as that mournful howl was joined by Craig's pained yell, and Forrest's furious roar. Death. That's all this vision showed me. The deaths of those to come. Look closer my daughter. Mum. I shook my head, not seeing her, unable to look away from the three dead bodies before me. What is this? The future that must happen, you have to find them, Sabella, find them and remember what it will take. What, we're going to die? All of us? But she said nothing else. The figures vanished, and I was thrown back into a pit of utter darkness. Cackling sounded around me, and I wanted to curl in on myself and disappear. You see how futile it is to fight against me? Baladin. He was here, but I couldn't see him. You're not really here, I whispered to myself. Oh I'm not, am I? A chilling breath brushed against my neck, and I spun around, catching a brief glimpse of red eyes flashing in the darkness before they vanished. You will fail, Sabella. You and your friends, your shifter. You will all die. Is that truly the future you want for yourself? Death? What else did you have in mind? You are my niece, family. Join me and we will rule this world together. You're currently murdering the rest of the family, I pointed out, proud to hear my voice wasn't shaking like the rest of me. Why would I help you? Why not? Do you wish to live? Not in darkness. Pity you have such potential, such power within you. If only you would see the truth of who you really are, he sighed. You could be unstoppable. I'm happy right where I am. Are you? He whispered right in my ear and I jumped. You don't seem happy to me. Every moment brings your sanity closer to slipping away. That shifter you think cares for you, he will be the one who drives you over the edge. He'll be the reason you lose all you are, and fall back into the endless turmoil that exists inside your mind. No, I argued. Tristan is keeping me sane. Is he now? Or is it merely an illusion? You started growing saner once you were back in the realms. You honestly believe he has the power to hold back the madness inside you? Do you? A shifter who wants nothing but to use you for your visions, control you? I scrunched my eyes shut, shaking my head. That's not true. No. Ha could have fooled me. Get out of my head, I yelled. Fine if you insist, but you and I both know what Tristan truly wants you for, and fears. He fears nothing. Baladin laughed again. I cringed to feel him so close. That's a lie, we both know he's as scared of you as you are of losing control. How about a taste, for experimental purposes of course? What are you going to do? Baladin. He'd said he was going to test Tristan. He couldn't mean with me, could he? I screamed for him again, but then a horrible cry resounded in my ears, and I fell to my knees, but then I kept falling and falling, down into never-ending darkness, waiting for the end. I opened my eyes and screamed. Some stranger was holding me in his lap. I screamed again, pushing away from him, and he let me go, but I was surrounded by a hall made of stone. Where the hell was I? I shook from head to foot as I strained to remember something, anything. Who, who was I? Sabella, the man who'd been holding me said loudly. Who, who is that? I asked. I'm not her. Yes you are, he said patiently. Why was he being so nice? He was the reason I was here, right? And I didn't know where here was. What was I wearing? Take your time, you'll remember. I frowned, backing away from him, until I found myself against a wall with nowhere to go. No. I don't know you, get away from me, I yelled when he reached for me. What's going on? I glanced at the woman and her worried face. Why was everyone so worried about me? What happened? 
I waited for names, events, anything, but my mind was a complete blank. I had to get away from them all, get out of here. Sabella, you need to listen to me, the man tried to say, but I didn't want to listen. Get away from me, I hissed. Get away. I needed to run, and then I saw a gap in the crowd. I took off at a dead sprint, slipping around people, as the man yelled that name again. I kept on running, not about to stop and go back to him. I rounded a corner and blindly continued on, searching for an exit, a way out of this maze. On and on I ran until I finally saw a large set of doors propped open and beyond them, a night sky with no stars. Where were the stars? What horrible world was this that there were no stars? Sabella. Another man said and stood in the doorway, blocking my way. Cray grab her. The man reached for my arms and pulled me against his chest, holding me firmly. I screamed and thrashed trying to break free. Let me go. Get off me. What happened? The man demanded as the other rushed up to him. She doesn't remember. They kept talking but a rushing filled my ears and the rest of their words were lost on me. Heat spread out from my middle and I sensed something inside me clawing to get out, to save me from these strangers. The man holding me let go with a yelp of pain and they staggered backward as a bright light emanated from me. Sabella, look at me, the first man said, and I focused on him. Leave me alone please, I begged, backing toward the doors. I can't let you leave, all right? Just calm down and we can talk about this. He held out his hand for mine, each step I took, he matched it. I just need you to pull back the light. I had no idea what he meant. I couldn't control it, and it pulsed in time with my racing heart. Sabella. I threw a glance at the door behind me and saw him lunge forward out of the corner of my eye. I yelled and the light shot out at him like a whip, slashing down his body. He growled in agony and hit the ground, holding one hand to his scorched chest. I blinked and the light disappeared. I fell backward as if punched in the gut as my memories flooded back. Tristan, I whispered, horrified at what I'd done. No, oh my god. What did I do? Sabella, he mumbled, reaching for me as I went to him. Tears fell down my cheeks. I carefully pulled back his burnt shirt, dumbfounded by the burn stretching down his body. I'm... I'm so sorry, I uttered. Tristan. I didn't. I couldn't remember and the light it just... My mouth kept moving but there were no more words to try and explain. I hurt him. What if it had been worse? What if I killed him? I got to my feet, backing away. Sabella wait, he pleaded. All I could see was this ending worse. Don't. But I had to get away. I was dangerous and as I ran past the others gathered, while Tristan called my name, I saw fear on some of their faces. Fear of me and what I'd done to Tristan. It wasn't safe for me to be around them anymore. Baladin, he'd gotten in my head. I'd forgotten who I was, who everyone else was, and instead of protecting, I'd hurt the only person I'd ever really cared for. I slammed my door shut and locked it, doing the same to the adjoining door too. I stood in the center of my room, flinching when Tristan knocked loudly, barely a minute later. Sabella, open this door, he ordered. No, just go away. I'm fine all right. Swear it. Open the door. No, you were right. You can't trust me and I can't trust myself, just, just leave me alone. No, I wasn't. Please open the door. I shook my head and felt the voices creeping back in, just like they had in the old days before coming here, before meeting Tristan. I was on the floor, tucking my head against my chest, pleading for them to go away. But they only got louder, and soon they drowned Tristan out. Leave me alone, I yelled, unable to take it any longer. Fine, Tristan shot back. But this is not over, Sabella. The second I get back, you and are having a very long talk, so don't you dare give up on us. You are not going to just lock yourself away forever. Then he was gone, and I was alone with the madness. Being alone forever sounded like the safest place for me to be now. I hurt him, could have hurt Craig or Kate. I could have killed any of them so easily. There was no coming back from that. 
I stayed curled up in a ball as the vision I had came back to me, bit by bit. We were all going to die, all of us. I'd seen my own death. That in itself was enough to push me closer to the edge of an insanity I wouldn't come back from. I was going to die before this war was over. The second Tristan heard those words, I would lose the last bit of freedom I did have. He'd worry about me non-stop, and it would get in the way of his thinking clearly about his people, about his warriors. I would not be the reason he got anyone killed, or himself. There was only one choice left to me, and I knew there'd be no coming back. Chapter 5 Tristan I winced as Lucy applied a salve to the burn. Can you try again? To what end? Lucy asked. If she doesn't want to see you, then she doesn't want to see you. She's blaming herself for this, I growled. She could have seriously hurt you, or someone else, she pointed out. How would you feel? I wouldn't lock myself away. I shrugged into a fresh shirt Boris had brought me, rose to my feet and started for the door. Where are you going now? Boris asked, hurrying to keep up as I left the infirmary. I'm going to break down that damn door that's what, I seized. What do you think she's doing in her room right now huh? She's going to drag herself down and make it worse than it is. I have to talk to her. Boris said nothing, but I sensed his unease. Seeing Sabella like that had scared many of the pack and unnerved more of them, me included, though I wasn't going to admit it aloud. When she'd fallen into that vision, she kept muttering over and over again about death and Baladan, whispering his name and shivering like she was freezing to death. Nothing coherent came through, but when she'd opened her eyes, it was like I was staring at a stranger. Sabella had been gone, torn from her own mind. I was pissed at myself for getting into an argument that ended with her falling into another vision, and then coming out of it not herself. I told myself over and over I trusted her, that she was wrong, but when she'd accused me of it all I'd done was stand there. I reached her door just in time to find Kate and Craig standing there, talking quietly. Just leave her be, Kate told me sternly. Why, has she said anything? I demanded. Kate hesitated but Craig nudged her. She doesn't want to see you, or anybody. She's afraid she'll hurt someone again. I'm fine, I insisted. Kate shook her head. What? She said specifically she did not want to see you. I'm sorry Tristan. She needs time. Time to do what? I feared the more time she had alone, she'd talk herself into believing we couldn't be together. I have to see her. I'm leaving in the morning. She's not in a good place right now, and you going in there is only going to make it worse. What do you mean? What's going on with her? Kate, for the love of the gods, tell me, I roared, my heart ready to beat right out of my chest. Craig took a half step forward as if to shove me back, but Kate placed a hand on his arm and he stilled. She's hearing voices again, she whispered. She's not exactly all there right now. My hand was on the door a second later, but it was locked. I banged my fist on it, calling for Sabella, but there was no reply. I rested my forehead against it, needing to see her, feeling her desperation, her fear, but I couldn't get to her unless I busted through this door. Half of me said to do it, but the other half knew Kate was right and Sabella needed time to sort through her emotions. Did she say what her vision was? I asked quietly, not moving from the door. No, but as soon as she's ready to talk about it, I'll send word Tristan, I swear it. This wasn't happening, it couldn't be. I'd found Sabella, and our lives were supposed to come together in a way that made sense. We were supposed to be happy with one another, not tearing each other's heads off every other sentence and lashing out, then hiding away our true emotions. I ran my hands through my hair and backed away from the door, telling Boris to get me when it was time to head out. I disappeared into my chambers, locking the door behind me, and went to the adjoining one. I knew it'd be locked but tried anyway. When it didn't budge I pressed my back against it and slid to the floor. She was so close but wouldn't let me get near. What if that was the last time I ever got to hold her? Or talk to her? And all I'd done was make her think I didn't trust her, or that I didn't want her in my life. I stayed by that door until I fell asleep. You sure about this? 
Craig asked the next morning, if it even was morning anymore. The darkness made it impossible to tell, and I hadn't exactly slept. My back was stiff from being propped up against the door, and when I saw Kate as I headed out to the stables, she shook her head. Sabella hadn't left her room yet. Yeah, we'll go, see what we can find, and get back in a hurry. And if there's a trap? Avif is still there? We don't exactly have an army with us. Recon only, I stated. I'm not going there looking for a fight, not now. You sure about that? The angry snarl you've got going on says otherwise, he said. You're too emotional right now to think straight, let alone fight. I'm not sending my men out and staying behind. I'm the Alpha. This is my duty. And your duty to Sabella, he asked, climbing up on his horse beside me. What about that? What the hell is that supposed to mean? I asked after I was in my saddle. It means exactly how it sounds. I know the pack is important to you, and so does she, but she's not a shifter Tristan, and instead of working to find a way to make your lives work together, you keep forcing it on her. You're saying you can't trust her because, at the end of the day, she'll do what her instincts tell her is right instead of following your orders? Craig flicked the reins of his horse and was out the gate before I had a chance to respond. I stared back at the castle, searching for Sabella before I rode out of this courtyard for what could very well be the last time. But she wasn't there. The rest of my guard rode out the gate as did Lucy, until I was the only one remaining behind. Craig's words were harsh but they were damn true. I tugged on the reins, nearly jumping from my saddle to go track her down and not leave us damaged like this. But the alpha in me was stronger and rebelled. The pack was the only thing that mattered. Nothing came before it, nothing could. Otherwise, the pack was weak. I spotted Kate and Hank by the doors, nodded my head at them to watch over Sabella until I returned, then kicked my heels into my horse's sides and took off to catch up with the rest of our small army. The ride back to where the scene resided would take a full day if we rode hard. The warriors were quiet, and I kept myself a fair distance from Craig, not in the mood to hear more about how I was screwing up my relationship with Sabella. I had a fight to prepare for. With any luck, Baladin would be there, and we could end this horrible darkness. I missed the sun and looking up at night and seeing the inky darkness filled with bright stars and a full moon. The darkness wore on everyone, this oppressing night. Worse was the sensation of not knowing what else waited for us out there, hunting from the shadows, ready to devour us whole. Or not whole. I sniffed the air, breathing in deep, and turned my head sharply to the right the same time I raised my hand for a halt. I stared back down the line, searching for Boris as I tilted my head to the right. He nodded and signaled for four to slip from their saddles and shift, hurrying into the fields of tall grass. He motioned for two more of our warriors to flank Lucy and guide her back down the way we'd come, and wait there. Whatever was about to attack, I did not want to watch Lucy get killed. Kate would kill us if we returned without her. Craig waved an arm over his head, and his demon guards continued further down the road, taking it slow to see if we could draw out whatever new monstrosity was stalking us. He drew the executioner blade from his hip a few inches, his head on a swivel as the urge to shift had me gripping the reins tightly in my fists. After a few minutes of nothing but the wind blowing through the dry grass, and the horses whinnying as they waited impatiently to move forward, I thought the stench of decay had been nothing more than mushrooms or mold, but then a wolf's cry shattered the calm. I was off my horse and shifting a second later, sniffing the air as another cry had me digging my claws into the mud, ready to take off. Boris had shifted and stood shoulder to shoulder with me. My ears flicked forward, and I listened to what sounded like slithering coming toward us. Snakes please let it not be snakes. Boris shook out his head and I growled pawing at the ground. I hated snakes and whatever was coming toward us sounded like a rather large snake. And here I'd thought this day couldn't get any better. Keep your eyes open. There might be more than one, I told my pack and had another of my wolves shift back to inform Craig. I heard his grunt of annoyance as he told his men to leave the horses on the road and fan out, but not to go in the grass. Going in there was suicide and I doubted the two wolves I heard cry out were still alive. Their deaths would be simply added to the number that already weighed on my shoulders, as the alpha that sent them to their ends. 
The slithering was coming closer, and I lowered my head, attempting to make out the large, dark shape moving through the grass. A demon yelled, and Craig ordered the attack. I whirled around. A giant snake's head, far too large to be deemed anything but a nightmare snatched the demon around his torso. Another demon grabbed hold of the captured demon's hands as Craig drove the executioner blade into the beast's head. It screeched and let go of the demon as its body thudded to the ground, tail whipping around aimlessly. Craig yanked his blade free and checked the man that had been bitten, who was shuddering from whatever venom the snake held in its fangs. One snake. Every other one of Baladin's pets that attacked us worked in groups. There was never just one. Keep alert, I warned the wolves. There's more out there. I barely thought the words when a massive dark shape shot across the road, taking out a horse and disappeared back into the grass with it. The horse screamed until the wound was cut off sharply. The others reared and bucked, trying to get away. Another body launched from the grass, jaws abnormally wide as it went for a wolf, but I was faster and slammed into him, sending us both rolling further down the road. Boris latched himself onto the snake's back, but his claws scrambled against the hard scales, not getting purchase. I shifted back and yelled for the others to do the same, drawing my sword and dagger. Watch its fangs, I yelled in warning as the one Boris struggled to hold on to whipped its head toward me. Those fangs were a foot long at least and dripped with venom. I bared my teeth right back at it, bouncing on the balls of my feet. As soon as it reared its head, I dove to the side, and it barely missed snatching my leg. Yelling, I spun around and drove my dagger into the beast's eye. Its body coiled in on itself as it thrashed its head, tearing the wound open even more and spilling blood all over the road. And me. I yelped as the blood hit bare skin, sizzling on my flesh. I waited to see if it was poisonous, but aside from the burning where it created a wound, I felt fine. No time to stop now. The snake was far from dead, and though I blinded it in one eye, the other functioned well enough, and it threw itself at me. I leapt over its head, rolling across its twisting body before I fell to the ground. Taking a break at a time like this, Craig muttered as he yanked me back up. You know me, I replied, searching for my dagger. How many you think are out there? Three is all I've seen so far, but I could be wrong. The road that had been peaceful moments before was in total chaos. Two remained that we were sure of, but as Craig turned around, he cursed. Do I want to know what's behind us? I asked roughly. Do you want nightmares for the rest of your life? He replied. How bad? I heard the massive body rustling the grass, and a sharp hissing that drowned out the fighting around us. You ever wonder what forest would look like utterly pissed off and without wings? I hung my head. Come on. How you want to go after it? Depends, what's it doing? He tilted his head. Right now, eyeing us both like we taste damn good. We could barely kill the ones that were normal size, not that these monsters were normal. I heard Boris yelling as they brought down the one eyed blinded, and saw the demons tag teaming the last one, but who knew what else that grass hid? What I wouldn't give for a dragon right now to set the whole field on fire. Craig got a match? I asked. He frowned, then slowly reached into his pocket. Actually, I have something better. He dug around, his eyes never leaving the monstrosity behind us, and when he revealed a glowing red vial. I frowned. Courtesy of Lucy. I was saving it in case we ran into Baladin, but I think this calls for extreme measures. How you ever got by without magic is beyond me. Now was not the time to complain about the pack's mistrust of magic. Carefully, I turned around as Boris and the rest of our small army faced the largest damn snake I'd ever seen in my life and hoped it would be the last. It towered over us, its body coiled, just waiting. What is it doing? I asked quietly. No idea. Craig blinked confused and turned to me. Hear that? The grass rustled once again, but this wasn't just one or two snakes. There had to be a small army coming toward us. We needed to clear the road, but there was no time. Throw it, I told Craig. Do it now. He drew his arm back at the same time the giant snake decided to launch its attack. The fiery vial lit up the darkness. We yelled for everyone to get down as we waited for the fire, but the snake swallowed the vial whole and kept on coming. 
Shit. The grasses were practically lying flat in the field, and I yelled for a retreat, thinking at least Sabella was not here to die with the rest of us, when the massive snake suddenly reared back and shrieked. A second later, the creature exploded, sending a rolling wave of fire through the grass. We hit the ground, covering our heads as those flames boiled and destroyed everything in their path. Chunks of burnt snake landed on and around us, splattering to the ground with sickening crunches and squishes that would make it hard for me to eat well-cooked meat for a very long time. The back of my shirt was scorched and was hot to the touch as I found my feet unsteadily. Are you insane? Lucy was yelling as she came running toward us. I told you that was a last resort. Yeah well it worked, Craig argued with a shrug. He kicked at a huge hunk of roasted snake. Hungry? He smirked as I glowered at him, sheathing my sword and looking around at the damage. The entire field was nothing but blackened ruin now, a few small fires burning here and there. Think they saw that back at the castle? Possible. Boris, send a messenger back and let the castle know we're alive and there's no need to send a party to check on us. I turned to another of my guard. How many did we lose? Craig's somber face matched my own as we walked down the road, seeing the dead and dying lined up. We hadn't even reached Baladin's dimension yet, and we had dead to burn. Three demons were succumbing to the venom of those snakes. They would be dead in minutes. Five of my own were dead, two still shifted in wolf form. I closed their eyes, laying my hand on their foreheads and saying the blessings of our pack before rising, praying for our ancestors to guide them home, and asking those still alive to load the dead into the supply wagon and return to the castle with the messenger Boris was to send. The supplies we still needed we divided amongst the surviving horses. I helped carry the dead, and once they were on their way back, and the last of the fires had died out, Craig and I stood shoulder to shoulder watching until the wagon disappeared around the bend in the road. Lucy had tried to stop the venom from spreading, but it moved too quickly. The demons had passed painfully, but at least it was over quickly. She hung her head, wiping a tear from her cheek before she cleared her throat loudly and mounted back up. We need to keep going, Craig said. This is not how I hope to start this trip, I muttered, finding my horse amongst the others and pulling myself up into the saddle. Stay alert. I doubt this is the only surprise Baladin has for us. Craig and I led the column of riders, and we set off into the darkness once again, leaving behind a trail of snake corpses and a field that would forever be poisoned by their evil existence. We'll make camp here, I told Boris as we dismounted and stared into the trees where Lucy said the scene was still intact. Let everyone get a few hours of sleep, and then we'll find out if the god of monsters is home or not. You think he's got any more guardians in there? Craig asked. Only one way to find out. Get some rest. I helped set up camp, took my few furs and my saddle, propped them up in front of a small fire and rested my hands behind my head. My eyes closed and I started to drift off to sleep, more exhausted than I thought I'd be from the fight. I imagined I was back at the castle with Sabella curled up at my side as we talked about nothing that really mattered. What are you so worried about? I blinked and found myself sitting in my chambers with Sabella resting her head on my chest. We were lying in bed, and she stared up at me, running her fingers over the worry lines on my forehead. This is a dream, right? Probably. Why are you so worried? She asked again. I caught her hand and kissed her knuckles. Why am I not is the better question, I sighed. What am I supposed to do? You're asking the crazy person for advice? Wow, good thing this is a dream. Why do you think I don't trust you? I whispered. I can't answer that. Why the hell not? Because I am you right now, this is all up here, she said poking me in the forehead. You'll have to ask the real Sabella that question when you get back. If she'll talk to me. She will, but right now you need to focus on the fight ahead. I don't want to wake up from this moment. I hugged her closer and would have sworn it was really Sabella I held in my arms. Promise me you'll be there waiting for me. Tristan? I frowned, staring into those eyes. The surprised look on her face said this was no longer just a dream. You're really here. She glanced around and started to pull back, but I held on to her. I hurt you, I can't be here. It was an accident. 
You weren't yourself. I cupped her face gently in my hands, forcing her to look at me, and hated the guilt I saw staring back at me. You and I are far from over with, you know that, right? She leaned into my touch, kissing my palm. I wish it was that easy. Her words trailed away and then she was gone, and the dream shattered. I opened my eyes, the warmth of her body pressed against mine, but she wasn't here. The small fire crackled away at my feet, and I hunkered down for a few more hours of restless sleep. Wait for me, I whispered to the night one more time as I shut my eyes again, willing the breeze to carry my words back to Sabella. Chapter 6 Sabella Tristan His hands I felt them holding my face but he wasn't here. He was gone and it was nothing more than a dream. I rolled over on the large bed, reaching out for a warm body that I'd gotten used to falling asleep next to. The silence pressed in around me and I finally gave up, climbed out of bed and paced out onto the balcony. We'd seen the explosion, Kate and I. We'd been standing on my balcony when those flames erupted, and both of us clung to the other, wondering if we'd just lost the two people we cared for most. That we loved. Hank had come up to check on us and say he was about to ride out with the rest of my guard to see what happened. I told him to be careful, and then he was off. We'd waited impatiently for them to return, but then they were back, the supply wagon that had left with Tristan bumbling along behind. The heads hung and my heart had dropped to the floor. Kate and I raced out the door and down the stairs, needing to see who was dead. Craig and Tristan were alive, but we had lost more warriors. Hank and the rest of the shifters suddenly turned to me about what to do. They need pyres, Danielle whispered helpfully in my ear. And the demons, they're for Kate to see to. I'd nodded and gave the order, my first true order as queen and beta, while Tristan was gone. The one shifter who returned alive told us what transpired on the road. I'd walked to the gate, Hank right behind me, and stared down the road. Tristan was alive. For now. And as I stood on the balcony again, his touch lingering and his words ringing in my ears, I clutched at my arms and sent my own message to him, hoping he would forgive me for what I was about to do. I was not going to risk hurting him again, or anyone else for that matter. I'm sorry, I said to the night then turned around and hurried back to my rooms. I changed into more comfortable riding clothes and grabbed a leather saddle bag from the wardrobe. I threw in an extra pair of boots, breeches, two shirts, and made sure the dagger I had was at my hip. I braided my hair back and crossed through the hall to Tristan's rooms. I searched around for the map I'd seen and as I rolled it up, realized I had to at least leave him a note of some kind. Leaving without saying anything was wrong. What are you doing? I jumped and spun around. Kate stood in the adjoining doorway. Nothing. Liar. You're leaving, aren't you? I tucked the map at my waist and picked up a quill and a piece of scrap parchment from the table. I don't have a choice, and you know it. I have to figure out how to control these visions. And this Hansi, he might know something about Baladin. And well, Tristan, it's just better if I'm not here when he gets back. You almost sound like you believe those words, she said as she walked into the room. My hand with the quill froze. I do believe them. No you don't. He's going to be pissed when he gets back and realizes you've left. Yeah, well, this was never going to work out. He's just too stubborn to say it himself, I mumbled. This is what's best for both of us. Trust me. I tried not to meet her gaze as she walked around the table. I can't drag him down with me. What's that supposed to mean, she demanded. Sabella, look at me. I did, and she flinched at whatever she saw on my face. You saw something, didn't you? She whispered. It can't be that bad, can it? It's nothing. That's bullshit. Who did you see? When I didn't answer, she snatched the parchment away from me. Did you see Tristan? Don't make this difficult, I muttered. What did you see that's making you run away? I'm running to save him, I shouted. I won't. I won't be the reason he falls apart. I can't. If I leave now, if I make him see we aren't meant to be together, then when, when it happens, when the end comes. I couldn't get the rest of the words out and fell into the nearest chair, 
holding my head in my hands. Kate crouched in front of me. You saw your own death? Is that what you're telling me? I sat back, running my hands down my face annoyed. I don't know what I saw exactly but I was dead and Tristan, he let the curse take him, but Kate. I wasn't the only one I saw dead, I whispered. But that's why I'm leaving. If I'm not here, if I can find a way to stop Baladin, then no one else has to get hurt. Tell me what you saw. No. Sabella please, I think I have a right to know. I took a deep breath, then relayed everything I saw in that vision. When I finished, she was handing the parchment back to me, a dark look in her eyes. What are you doing? Write your letter to Tristan, and then I'm going to have to borrow that quill. I'm coming with you. Kate. She held up her hand. No, the second Tristan or Craig catch wind of what you saw, we'll both be on lockdown. We'll sneak out tonight, head to Silver Valley, and find this Hansi. If he can help you with your visions, get you to tap into your power, then we'll have a few shreds of hope, right? She sat in the other chair as I put the quill back to the page and pondered over what to tell Tristan. I settled on the simplest version of what I was feeling and folded the letter, writing his name on it, then handed Kate the quill. She took her letter and said she was going to leave it in her and Craig's room and she'd meet me down at the stables. I set the letter for Tristan on his pillow and walked back to my chambers, grabbed my saddle bag and left my room. I was halfway toward the main stairs when Hank called out to me. What are you doing? He asked, running to catch up. He spied the saddle bag and tried to reach for it. I yanked it away. Sabella. Don't. You can either come with me or stay here, but I have to do this, all right? You expect me to just let you leave alone? Who said I was going alone? I started for the stairs again. Kate's coming with me. Are you two insane? The second Craig and Tristan return they'll go after you both. Yeah I know but it's worth the risk right now. You're killing me, he grumbled but followed along behind. I'm coming with you both. Fine but don't be a pain. We're doing this whether you like it or not. He kept mumbling under his breath but I kept my gaze focused straight ahead, hurrying to the stables, where I saddled up on one of the few remaining horses. Hank did the same, and I heard footsteps coming not too long after. Kate stepped into the barn and right behind her was Grayson. I hear you are taking my advice after all, the sorcerer said. And I'm also going to assume King Tristan has no knowledge of your leaving. No, not even close, I said. Still want to come. You are the daughter of Crane, a man I was close to for a very long time. What kind of man would I be if I did not aid you in your time of need? Tristan's not going to be happy. Then I suggest we leave before he comes back, Grayson said with a wink. The four of us mounted up and filed out of the stables behind Hank, one by one. I waited for another shifter to call us back, but then we were out the gate and on the road, headed towards Silver Valley. I thought of the words I left for Tristan and willed him to understand why I left him. My chest ached horribly. Kate assumed I was merely leaving him to figure out about my visions and find out what we could about Baladin. In truth, the pack life and I did not go well together, and as much as I'd come to love Tristan, I couldn't keep making his life miserable, no matter how much leaving hurt me. One day he'd understand. If he was still alive. Chapter 7. Tristan. Lucy had another crystal trap set, and ready to go just outside where the scene to the pocket dimension resided. I left six shifters behind to guard her, while the rest of us, after tying a rope to a tree, took the other end and stepped into the stone maze once again. As soon as we were through, I crouched low beside Craig, our fighters doing the same behind us. You remember how to get there? He asked me. Sadly, I replied, and after listening intently for a few minutes, started forward. The stone maze hadn't changed from the last time we were here. I stepped carefully around the destroyed columns from when Forrest and I had tried to take down the stone statue, then continued onward. I waited to hear that dreadful dragging sound of bone whips on stone, but the maze was eerily silent. Craig followed me without question as I sniffed the air and wove us through the columns, deeper into the maze. We never did figure out what those symbols meant, 
I said, pointing out the writings on one of the actual walls in this place. Nor did we see what was inside the ruins. If Baladin is here, why don't we just ask him? Oh yeah, that'd be a great conversation to have. I'm sure he'd love to tell us everything, I muttered. I paused suddenly, glancing back through the stone columns. Lilac. I sniffed the air more intently, but then it was gone. Tristan? Sorry, it's nothing. The dream I had last night had seemed so real. I half expected to see Sabella show up anyway, despite what I ordered her to do, but when I opened my eyes it was Boris nudging me awake. No sign of Sabella anywhere. I hated myself for wishing she would have defied me again and shown up anyway, just so I could have her by my side. As much trouble as she seemed to get herself into, she was a welcome presence when there was I chance I was walking into danger. There it is, Craig whispered behind me. I glanced up. The ruined castle stood silent, but the front door was hanging open, and there was no guardian standing outside at this time. We hung back for a few moments before I motioned for Craig and I to go first and check it out. Cautiously we crept closer then climbed the stairs and reached the front door. He peered inside then nodded and I rushed in, turning to the right as he took the left, putting our bodies back to back. I sniffed the air but all I smelled was staleness and dust. Clear the main level first, I said. Craig nodded as he turned. Together, we moved into the room that Baladin had been in when Sabella tried to destroy him. The doorway was destroyed, nothing but a massive hole in the wall. A giant iron cage was in the center of the room, and Craig growled when he saw it. Thankfully it was empty this time, and there appeared to be no sign of Baladin or any of his shadow minions here. We cleared the entire first level, then darted upstairs to the only room holding more cells. The place had been vacated. Craig said he was going to go call in the others, as I headed back to the room with the cage. There were more writings carved into the walls there. I ran my fingers over them, but the language was beyond me. It was probably the language of the gods, and the only half-god I knew was not here to help us translate. Lucy might be able to help a bit, but she told me when this all started their knowledge of Baladin was slim to nothing. The floor was covered in dust and dirt, dead leaves and spatters of dark black blood. I reached to press my fingers to some of it, but it was only stained into the stone. Nothing fresh. Still, it gave me hope that Baladin could be wounded. This had to be from the attack Sabella made against him. I followed the trail around the cage toward the stone archway that led into a smaller room we already cleared. Here, I found nothing but a pedestal with a metal tripod, as if something had sat atop it until it was taken away. I waved my hand through the empty air just in case but that's all there was, air. Find anything? Craig asked, walking around the room the opposite direction. What do you think was here? I asked him. Dunno but I doubt whatever it was bodes good news for us. I studied the tripod a few minutes longer, before I turned back to investigate the rest of the room. Aside from more dead leaves and dirt, there was nothing but that pedestal. What's this? What? I joined Craig at the far wall where he was pulling dead vines away from the stone. I helped him, and together we uncovered a large 4x4 section of carvings, etched deep into the stone and stained black. That's this right? I asked, motioning to the pedestal drawing, then to the one that stood behind us. Looks like it. We both squinted as he studied the engravings. The first showed an image of what appeared to be an orb of some kind, and there was power or light coming from it. The next image was of a doorway, one that looked like it had been created by the orb maybe. I scratched my head as I stared at the final image of a figure in a cloak stepping through that doorway, and that was it. Still don't know what it's supposed to be, Craig muttered. I think it creates doorways, I said slowly, maybe into the realms of the gods? And what, Baladin has it? Maybe, you know, we don't really know what this realm is either. If it was his to begin with, or someone else's. So, this could be some other god's realm? I shrugged, feeling like we were once again playing catch-up in a game that we were not going to win. We needed answers to these riddles that continually popped up. Every time Sabella opened her mouth after a vision, she only added to our ongoing list of confusion. And the riddle she relayed when she touched the stone guardian, we were no closer to solving that either. 
I slammed my fist into the wall with an angry snarl, watching the particles of dust fall over my shoulders from the force of the hit. Boris, I shouted, and a few seconds later, he appeared in the doorway. We need Lucy in here. And send someone back to the castle. Tell them Grayson's presence is requested as well. And what would you like the men to do until the sorcerer can get here? Attach that main line to this castle, then get more ropes and have them spread out in pairs. I want to search this entire maze, see how large this realm actually is. I joined him in walking out of the ruins. See if there are any other secrets it's hiding. He set off to relay my orders. Craig and I turned back to what remained of the castle. Not much of it was still standing, and aside from the cells upstairs and the room with the iron cage, there were a few other tiny rooms that had been empty upon our first inspection. It's going to be a long few days, I muttered. At least here there's a bit of light, he said. Not sun but better than constant darkness. I glanced upward now. There was no sky, but if there was a ceiling, it was hidden by a dense fog that hovered over the maze. We'll make camp outside the seam. Not sure how I feel about us staying here, just in case. I sighed, then breathed in deep, trying to get a grip on the uneasiness growing in the back of my mind that something was wrong. The strong scent of lilac struck me again, and I could have sworn that Sabella was standing right behind me. But she was safe and sound back at the castle. As soon as I returned, she and I would sit down and have the serious discussion about our future together, like we should have done, weeks ago. It wasn't too late, that's what I kept telling myself, it couldn't be too late. Tristan, you coming? Craig called from back inside. Yeah yeah, let's get this search started. There's another one over here, I yelled, tugging down more ivy from the stone wall within the maze. This one's different I think, maybe? I dunno. Lucy, you're going to have to come look at it. I felt a tugging on the rope attached to my waist, and Lucy came around the corner with Craig. We'd spread out to the edges of the maze and found we were actually in some sort of stone mountain with no other exits or entrances, except the seam where our main rope led. It is different, she mused, running her fingers over the engravings and brushing away more dust. I can't read any of these. Grayson should be here soon though. Good. One of these might tell us who used to live here before Baladin moved in. She nodded at my words, her brow furrowing as she moved to the images near the bottom of the slab. These here, they have that orb in them. Any idea what it is? No, I've never seen these pictures before, or a reference to an orb, but I think... I think you might be onto something about a doorway. Whoever was here might have been its keeper, and Baladin stole it when he escaped his prison, Lucy said quietly as she crouched lower, tilting her head to see the images better but I think it did more than just create doors. What do you mean? I bent down too to see what she pointed at. This to me seems to be referring to stars? Or the sky, I can't decide which and then hear this explosion of sorts, almost like something's being created. The stars and the sky. Two things we had no clear view of in a long time. Right well, we'll just have to keep searching and tearing this maze apart for answers. Sire, Boris yelled, and I called out to him so he could find me. We have word from Torolf. And? Where's Grayson? I asked, my body tensing at the strain on his face. Boris, what's happened? Sabella? He hesitated, and I was already moving toward the main rope that would take me out of this pocket dimension. Sire, you might want to wait a moment. You can tell me on the way, what happened to her? All I could see was Sabella falling into a vision, and then not being able to come out of it. Worse, she did, and she couldn't remember anything again. What if she hurt someone else, or herself? The wound on my chest was already healing, but I was the Alpha. It took a bit more to do me serious harm. I was running until I stepped out of the seam and detached the rope from my waist. We don't know, Boris finally said and grabbed my arm. She's gone. I froze and felt sick at the same time. Gone? What do you mean gone? It appears sometime during the night she left the castle, but she was not alone. He stared at Craig behind me, who'd followed me out. The Vindica has gone with her, as well as Grayson and Hank. I glared at Craig, and he had the decency to look guilty for the part Kate played in this. 
Do we know where they went? I asked Boris as I proceeded to my horse. No, not yet, but I'll send out scouts. Don't bother. I'm going to find her myself. I mounted my horse and took off, Craig hurrying to keep up as we raced back to the castle. How could she do this to me? Up and leave without a word to anyone. What did she expect me to do, just let her go without a fight? All I could think of was her on that cliff facing down those spiders again. If she had a vision of someone in danger, she wouldn't have waited around for help. Oh no, she would have gone off to try and deal with the problem. Alone. Having the Vindica with her did not count as sufficient backup in my opinion. I kicked my heels into my horse harder, and he picked up the pace, flying down the road. When the castle came into view hours later, I patted my horse's neck in appreciation and told the stable hands to see to him as I ran into the castle, yelling for Sabella. She's not here, Danielle yelled to me from the stairs. Why didn't you stop her? I demanded and she immediately bowed her head at my fierce growl. I didn't know she was leaving. She was in her room and then the next, the next they were gone. I'm sorry sire, if I'd known I would have chained her to a wall. Did you search her rooms? I climbed the stairs as I spoke, taking them two at a time until I reached Sabella's room, not waiting for Danielle to answer my question. Craig mumbled something about checking his and Kate's room, and he'd catch up with me. I threw open Sabella's door and searched the room. Clothes were missing as well as a saddlebag, but there was no indication of where'd she gone or why. I stalked to my room next, cursing and kicking the door open. A map that had been on the table was gone, and when I spun madly around, I saw the note with my name on it waiting for me against my pillow. Wait for me outside, I ordered Danielle. I waited until her steps retreated and the door closed before I let myself move to grab the note. Hands shaking as I reached for it, I steeled myself for whatever words she left for me. I unfolded the paper, and the first words forced me to sit as my heart pounded painfully with each breath I took. She'd left for Silver Valley to seek out this handsy elf, and see what she could find out about Baladin. She was sorry for putting me through so much aggravation and pain, for hurting me when she wasn't herself. She went on and on about how she would never be able to forgive herself if she'd hurt me worse, or anyone else. And since I didn't trust her, there was no point in her staying. She hardly trusted herself anymore, and felt her sanity slipping out of her grasp day by day. She wasn't pack, and she doubted there'd ever been a chance for her to be pack the way I expected her to be. The vice around my heart tightened with each sentence I read, tearing me apart until I was suddenly numb. The last bit was what made my pain flare into anger. She would always care for me but she knew there wasn't a chance the two of us could actually work without one of us getting hurt in the end. She would do her part to save the realms and then she would leave them. Forever. In my rage I crumpled the note and threw it across the room. How could she think I didn't care for her as much as she did for me? I made a mistake, I knew that, but that did not mean I was just going to let her walk out of my life without any sort of blowback. Tristan, Craig said as he knocked on my door. Enter, I snarled, pacing furiously from one end of my rooms to the other. I'm going to assume your note was bad. I growled in answer. Silver Valley. That's where they went, and that's where I'm going. You sure that's really where she went? That something else isn't going on. I whirled around and grabbed him by his shirt, shoving him into the wall. I am not going to let her walk out of my life because she believes I don't trust her, that I don't love her. She has no right to do this to me. He nodded slowly, not seeming to be bothered by my taking my anger out on him. I don't blame you. Kate's letter, it's like she's saying goodbye. What? I released him, and he handed it to me. I asked if he was sure and he nodded, so I read through it quickly. There was so much raw emotion pouring out of this one, just like with Sabella's, but he was right. Kate wasn't just saying they would be back whenever they got the information they were after. She was telling Craig how much she cherished their time together, no matter how short. I walked across the room and grabbed the balled up letter from Sabella, and read it again. And again. Each time, the true meaning of her goodbye sank in, and I was shaking my head, not about to accept this. She saw something, I whispered. 
she saw something and refused to tell me, to tell us. We're going after them, right now. I sprinted out the door, furious at Sabella for doing this to me. All I could think of was that she saw her own death, and instead of confiding in me and finding a way to stop it, she kept it to herself to what? Save me from having to face whatever the future held for her. The wolf in me wanted to burst free and track down the one person in this life I was meant to be with. I barely managed to keep it in check, but when we entered the courtyard, a guard called out, pointing to the darkness overhead. A large blue and white shape was descending toward us. Dragon. We made room in the courtyard as the beast circled, then finally landed, shifting as he did. He bowed his head when he spotted Craig and I before running to us. King Forest requests your aid, he said out of breath. The banshees and hellhounds are out of control and terrorizing the outer villages. His numbers are too small to stop them. Now. I snapped. The dragon stepped back at my outburst. Give us a moment, Craig told the dragon, and he backed away further. They're going to Silver Valley, they'll be safe with Drake and his army of elves. You're serious? You want to go fight banshees and hellhounds instead of finding out why Kate and Sabella decided to up and leave? I ranted. I knew we were having problems, but I was willing to try and work them out. Guessed I just wasn't fast enough. I stopped my pacing short and grunted in frustration. But the dragon and demon numbers were still recovering from the fight against Cassius. If he was calling for aid, then Forrest meant it. He was in serious trouble. Fine, we'll help Forrest, but the moment his people are safe, I'm going to Silver Valley with or without you. Craig ran to the dragon and told him we'd be on our way. We had to gather those shifters not needed to defend the castle and our own villages, while Craig would send a message to Boshan and have Luca send whatever aid they could spare. Orders delivered, I mounted a fresh horse, but when I neared the gate, I turned back to stare at the corner where Sabella's room sat. Would she ever be in there again? Would I ever hear her quiet steps walk into my room at night to keep me company when the rest of the world threatened to suffocate me? Tristan let's go, Craig urged. The dragon had already taken to the skies, and the rest of my shifters were moving out. I'd get her back. One way or another, I would make her see no matter what she might see in those damned visions of hers, she and I were meant to face this darkness together. Chapter 8. Sabella. Wow, I whispered in awe as the first few elf dwellings came into view along the main road. Silver and gold torches lined the way, flickering in the evening breeze as elves walked alongside us, calling out greetings and waving excitedly to Kate. You know them? Craig and I came here on my tour of the rest of the realms, she explained. They're probably the friendliest group I've met. Seem like it. I imagined Tristan and I finally going on our own adventure through the realms, but then my vision came back to slap me into reality. It was better this way. Leave now and cut myself off from causing him pain. Well, any more pain. I'd wanted a chance at a life with him. Have a romance as strong as Kate and Craig seem to, but something was missing for us. Deep down I thought he hoped to find another shifter to help him rule his pack, and instead he'd found himself tethered to a seer. Sabella, Kate said, tapping my arm and pointing. Huh. I looked in that direction and my jaw dropped. That's the elven palace? All glass and silver, Kate explained. I admired the view of the four towers rising up behind a formidable stone wall. The gates were open and several well-armed soldiers stood at attention. The inside is even more incredible. Gardens everywhere, a stream runs through the middle of it too, and an incredible garden that'll leave you breathless. The candles and fires burning from within the palace made it glow, a beacon of pure light against the darkness. A sense of peace came over me at the sight, knowing that we hadn't lost this battle yet. There was hope still, and with my being here, learning about myself and Baladin, I clung to that hope like a lifeline. They are expecting us, Hank stated. Grayson! I sent word to Hansi, in my own special way, he said with a smile. Come, the elves are known for their feasts when guests come to visit. Food was the last thing on my mind, and I was about to tell Grayson I didn't think wasting time was a good idea, but then we were going through the main gate, 
and I was swept away by the graciousness of our hosts as well as the beauty surrounding me. The riverlands had their own form of beauty, the rolling grasses and the rushing river. But this was an elegant charm instead of rustic allure, something I only ever expected to experience in books I'd read at the asylum. Stable hands met us to take our horses and Drake was there to shake hands with Grayson and kiss Kate on the cheek. I'd only met him once, when Tristan called a council meeting to discuss the darkness that had fallen over the realms. He'd been there when I faced down the Stone Guardian the first time, but I hadn't officially been introduced until later. As he approached me now, he took my hand and kissed the back of it. Welcome Sabella. Thanks for letting us come. I know it's a bit unexpected. It's wartime. Nothing is unexpected, though I will admit I have been kept in the dark as to the purpose of your visit and why Tristan and Craig are not accompanying you. His curious gaze shifted from me to Kate, both of us shifting our way, clearly feeling guilty. Hum, I sense there is a story, and for a story we need wine. Come, a feast has been prepared. And Hansi. Is he here? I asked, noting how Hank fell right in step behind me, true to his orders to guard me. That should make Tristan feel a little better, at least. He is and will be available to you after the feast. King Drake, I really don't think we have much time to waste, I said, trying to be as polite as I could. We're on a bit of a time crunch. Have you eaten in the last 12 hours? The ride here took four days, and I hardly touched any of our rations during that time. Well, I mean we had breakfast, a while ago, I mumbled. He arched his brow. If you are to be locked away with that old scholar in his tower for the next few days, trust me, you'll want to eat as much as you can while you have the chance. Life is precious now, during this dark time. Let yourself enjoy the little things. He patted my hand, and then continued to lead the way inside the glass and silver palace. It was more impressive than the outside view, and I let myself be taken in by the sight. We were led into a large hall with a ceiling that would have given us a gorgeous view of the night sky, if we could ever get rid of the darkness. I missed seeing stars and the moon. They'd been my closest friends for so many years while I was stuck in a room, thinking I'd never be sane, never leave that building until I died from old age. We were seated near the head of the table. Drake took the chair to the right, the left already occupied by a beautiful, dark-skinned woman, her ebony hair falling over her shoulders and her smile friendly and graceful. Her pointed ears, studded with diamonds and emeralds, poked out of her hair. May I introduce to you Queen Ashen of the Elves, my cherished wife for more than what, 300 years now? She pouted. 400 but you knew that. He kissed her warmly, taking his seat. Her pout vanished, replaced by a smile. Please sit down and join us. I sense from the looks on your faces, we have not been as kept up to date on the happenings in Torolf as I expected. Kate and I exchanged a worried glance as we sat. There have been some new developments, Kate said lightly. And also, from the sudden guilt on Sabella's face, Tristan and Craig do not know you are here. I gulped, reaching for the glass before me and drinking down the wine to avoid answering. I thought as much. Well then, first we eat, and then you will tell us why you both ran away from your kings. Not my king, I whispered sadly. Tristan wouldn't forgive me, not this time. And I couldn't blame him either. I glanced up to catch Ashen studying me with an intrigued look and realized she'd heard every word I said. Sorry I forgot, Elven hearing and all that. No need to apologize. Eat and we will discuss what troubles you after. A plate was set before me, fresh greens and fish. I picked at it, trying to find my appetite. I wasn't going to eat, but then I heard Tristan's worried growling in my ear and turned, certain he was right behind me. But there was just an elf with a curious expression, asking if I needed something. No sorry, I mumbled and turned back around. I ate the food, though I couldn't explain how I'd heard him so clearly. Like it was in the dream I had. I would have sworn that moment was real, and he had not just been another figment of my imagination. Leaving him was going to be more difficult than I assumed, but what choice did I have? I knew what I saw in that vision, and I would not be the reason he succumbed to the curse of his race. If I wound up dying at the end of this, well then, that was on me. 
He deserved a chance to be happy with another shifter, someone who understood him and what he needed. That was clearly not me. When we finished eating, the plates were cleared away, and Ashen requested we join her and Drake out in the gardens. I wanted a minute alone to talk to Kate about what we would say, but then we were outside sitting around a warm fire, surrounded by padded benches. Now we've heard of several skirmishes with these nightmarish creatures, Drake said. We wiped out a nest of malicious vampire bats only four days ago, and then yesterday struck down several trolls that had tried to tunnel under the wall. Spiders, I said with a cringe. That's what we had last. I briefly told them about the fight on the hillside, against those monsters that would have killed me if Tristan hadn't been there to save my ass. Don't forget the basilisks, Kate reminded me. They were surrounded by those on their way back to investigate the seam into that pocket dimension. Where you were found with Craig? Ashen asked. Kate nodded. And, did they find anything of use? Baladin ready and waiting to give up, perhaps? She waited for me and Kate to answer, but we hadn't stuck around long enough to know what they found. We remained silent after looking at each other quickly. So Ashen continued with her questions. Right then, what else has happened? Sabella, does this have anything to do with your visions? I nervously leaned back and avoided their stares. I might be having some issues with those of late, as in I'm not exactly myself when I come out of them. What do you mean? Drake asked. I forget who I am, who everyone is, I explained. Sometimes it's just for a few minutes but this last time. I sucked in a breath to get up the nerve to keep going. The last time I attacked Tristan hurt him. Ashen's and Drake's brows furrowed at the same time. You poor thing. It's fine, really I just, ah, I wasn't going to risk hurting him or anyone else, which is why we need to talk to Hansi as soon as possible. Ashen stared at me long and hard before she stood and walked around the fire. She held out her hand. Come with me my dear. I glanced around, searching for someone to tell me what was going on, but she merely smiled happily down at me. Don't worry, I don't bite. I took her hand and she pulled me to my feet. Where are we going? I asked as she led me away from the fire and deeper into the gardens. I have been around for a very long time, she said softly, and I know when someone is in pain. You my dear are hurting so much it breaks my own heart. You have found your soulmate, so why are you not happy, hum? I was. When he found me in the woods for the first time in my life, I was sane, I told her. I could think clearly, figure out who I am. And now? Now, now it's complicated. Love is often so, trust me, she said with a quiet laugh. But with us, I feel like we're missing something. And everything's happened so fast. We've been on the move ever since I came here, fighting against Baladin and these monsters, trying to figure out how to win this war, I rambled. There hasn't been a chance for us to talk about us and what we're doing. But then neither one of us makes time for it. That's not right, is it? And when we do have time, all he does is lecture me on how I need to listen to him and become part of the pack. What is that even supposed to mean? I'm half God and a seer. And I feel that insanity creeping back the longer this darkness stays, and I'm sorry, I said quickly when I glanced over and saw Ashen's wide-eyed look. I haven't exactly had a chance to vent to anyone. She squeezed my hand as we kept walking. You are under a lot of stress, you both are, she said as if that explained everything. There is a war going on, and this darkness can make the best of us lose ourselves. But I am actually losing myself, I insisted. Every time I get a vision and come back, it takes longer for everything to click. You said Tristan helped you with this. He does or did, but lately I don't know. Maybe we were both wrong and we're not meant for each other. I needed that to be the truth, so if this went bad, if I ended up dying he would be spared a terrible fate. Or maybe you are scared. It's a war, isn't everyone scared? Not of Baladin and his monsters, she argued. You don't fear them, not after how you went after those spiders without a second thought for your own safety. I wasn't going to let Tristan and those villagers be killed. I had to do something. You are a true-born warrior, Sabella, gifted with both the light and the sight. 
She smiled at her tiny rhyme. You are more than capable of facing the dangers of this world. But you said I was scared. Scared of what you and Tristan can be together. But we're not together, I argued, annoyed, not at her, just at how the past few months had gone. I wanted us to be, but he's too stubborn to listen to me and understand. And you are very good at explaining exactly how you feel, yes? I grimaced. Well, not exactly. That's what I thought. We came to a bench beneath a weeping willow, and I sat down, hanging my head. What am I supposed to do? Talk to him, no matter how hard it is. And, tell him about what you saw. I shot upright, noticing how she tilted her head as if she was listening to someone talking. Are you, are you like me? A seer. Sadly no but I have my own gift thanks to a long line of witches and the like. She sat beside me with a cringe of her own. I may have heard a few of your thoughts during dinner. Hard not to when you're practically yelling inside your own mind. You're a telepath? Yes though I do my best not to pry into people's heads. You, however, make it rather difficult. Sorry I think? She smiled. I know you are worried about a vision you had, which is the true reason why you have come, is it not? There was no point in lying to her. I had a vision, and I saw. I saw myself dead, as well as Kate and a faceless person. Tristan though, he gave in to the curse seeing me like that, and if it's really going to happen, if I'm going to end up dead. Then you're hoping to save him from the pain of losing you by what? Losing you sooner. I'm trying to protect him. Or you're protecting yourself from guilt, she corrected. Sabella, you two are stronger together. You yourself have said so. You can't lose faith in that bond, not now. Now when you're going to need him the most. But we have no answers yet. We have no idea how to get to Baladin, or how many gods he has trapped and now he's speaking through me. He's using me, messing with my head. He's speaking through you, she asked alarmed. It's only happened once, but I saw him in that last vision too, and he was the reason I came out of it not remembering anything. I fought back the angry tears and planted my hands on my thighs. I have to do this alone, without him. Her friendly smile was gone replaced by extreme worry. First thing in the morning, you will meet with Hansi. There is a chance he can help you with your visions, find a way to keep Baladin from getting inside your head again. And if not, if he's listening to this right now through me? Do you feel like he is? Not now. She stood, nodding her head firmly. You will get some sleep tonight and in the morning, I will help you in any way I can, but Sabella, you must tell Tristan the truth of why you left. The real truth, not what you think to be the truth. I groaned in annoyance but got up. And what makes you think he still wants to talk to me? You are young and so is he. Trust me, he wants to see you. Her talk did nothing to make me feel better. As soon as Tristan realized I was gone and found that note, he would lose it. We were almost back to the fire with everyone when I turned, hearing a growl again, his growl. Slowly I spun all the way around, but only the wind was blowing through the garden, rustling the leaves. I longed to see Tristan stalking through those trees, his yellow eyes staring into mine as they'd done so often, telling me what his words never did. But he wasn't here, and I had more important issues to deal with. Like making sure I didn't go completely insane before we had a chance to stop Baladin. All throughout the night I sensed Tristan, heard his growl or felt his arms around me. After a while I gave up on sleep and lay there, staring at the glass ceiling, imagining how amazing the night sky would look like from here. The list of growing concerns continued to grow with each deep breath I took. Baladin had Farah, and who knew how many other gods in his grasp. His monsters were running rampant through the realms, and though we'd killed what felt like hundreds of them so far, we had no way of knowing how many more were left or still coming for us. My visions were leaving me confused and lost, and of course there was the newly added concern of Baladin entering my head. And the riddle. That damned riddle I still couldn't figure out. I'd memorized it by now and wondered if Hansi might have some magical insight on that too. Oh, and how could I forget the vision of seeing myself dead? Yeah, there was that too because my days weren't complicated enough or dark enough. 
because I already wasn't freaking out half the time of finding the last shreds of my sanity gone. Now I had to worry about winding up dead. And Tristan, Ashen was right, about him being hurt no matter how much distance I put between us. Sabella, you awake? Kate called through the door. Yeah, not like I slept anyway, I added the last quietly. Grayson said to get dressed and then we're going to meet with Hansie. See you downstairs. I dragged my butt out of bed and splashed cold from the basin water on my face. I ran my fingers through my hair, then braided it. The bags under my eyes told a story of someone who hadn't gotten any sleep in weeks. The only time I managed to relax long enough to sleep had been with Tristan. And now I didn't have him. I just started for the door when a rush of voices assaulted my head, and I fell to my knees. They muttered and screamed, talking too fast for me to understand them. I wanted to cry out, yell at them to stop, but if Kate saw me like this or anyone else, they'd send for Tristan. I was not ready to see him. Not until I knew I was safe. I heard a door crash open, and then two hands were placed at my temples. Immediately, the voices stopped, and I fell backward in relief. Ashen. What, what did you do? She shook her head as she released mine. I silenced them, but it won't last forever. She winced and held her head for a moment. You cannot stay away from Tristan forever, Sabella. How do you plan on attacking Baladin if you can't think straight enough to stand? I rested my head back against the wall, feeling the tears I'd managed to hold back yesterday fall down my cheeks now. I don't know. I don't know anything. Come with me. You are seeing Hansi, right now. She took my hand firmly in hers and pulled me out into the hall. Kate and Grayson were there, as well as Hank, who was speaking with an elf guard. One look at my face and the way Ashen pulled me along seemed to kick everyone else into high gear, following us. There wasn't going to be a tour of the palace today. Ashen had an almost crazed determined look on her face as she rushed through the halls and down a set of stairs, across a walkway that spanned from one end of the palace to the other, with the gardens beneath. Then we were back inside and climbing stairs that wound around and around. When the end finally came into sight I was panting, and my legs were screaming in protest. We're here, she said simply and pushed open the door. Hansi you have guests. Good morning my queen, a voice fluttered down from somewhere far above us. I walked in and leaned back and then back further. How tall is this tower? It's an illusion, Ashen said. The tower itself is only three stories high. The enchantment on it, however, gives Hansi the room he needs to work. And it is still not enough room. I craned my neck, searching for a face to put with the voice, when there was a loud pop, and a man appeared before me making me jump. His eyes were violet and vibrant, his smile kind, and he reminded me of the grandfather in the family that's exceptionally old and always trying to pass on his wisdom to grandkids who never listened. Ashen smiled, making me wonder if she was still listening in on my thoughts. Sabella, the old elf said and held out his hand for mine. I am Hansi. It is a pleasure to meet you. A seer. After all these years. Thanks. I took his hand. He held mine firmly and turned it over, so he could stare at my palm. And part God. Fascinating, truly. You, my dear, are very gifted, and yet I sense you are troubled. Is it these troubles that have brought you to me this day? I think so, I said slowly, not sure how I was supposed to respond. How about a cup of tea, hum? Tea? I glanced at Ashen. She rolled her eyes, the first time I'd seen the elegant elf queen show a more down-to-earth side of her. I don't think we really have time for tea, Hansi. We're in the middle of war which I'm sure you've noticed, and there's the god of monsters about to run loose and do who knows what else in the realms. There is always time for tea. Please have a seat, make yourselves comfortable. Hansi, you better be going somewhere with this, Ashan said, refusing to take a seat in the cluttered and mismatched sitting area. Hansi. Yes, I heard you, my impatient queen, he said with a smile. Kate at least looked as confused as I felt about who this elf was. I expected him to be like Grayson or even Lucy, but I wasn't sure what to think of this old man puttering around, humming as he set out cups. 
He removed a teapot from a table close by and poured a dark liquid into my cup, and Kate's. Drink up, drink up, he urged. Only after will we talk him. I picked up my cup, blew once over it, and then drank it down. The liquid was far from smooth, leaving gritty bits in my teeth. I choked on it, coughing a few times until I could breathe again. What is this? He picked up my cup and spun it around, bobbing his head and mumbling under his breath, completely ignoring me. Kate hadn't drunk hers yet, and seemed to be debating if she should or not. You too, my dear, Hansie said. Kate frowned but chugged the gritty tea. She coughed a few times too, and set her cup down for him to examine. The silence stretched on as he continued to examine my cup, set it down, then picked up Kate's. I shot a look to Grayson and he shrugged, seeming lost himself. Hank appeared bored at his post by the door. Well then, that answers a few questions. It does? I asked. About what? Yes. But I will not bore you with the details. You are here to learn more about your uncle, the god Baladin. You also seek a way to keep him from your mind, and to find the gods trapped by his darkness. And finally, you fear the vision you saw of your death. I'd been waving my hand, trying to cut him off, but too late now. Hank was at my side in a shot. What did he say, he growled. It's not what you think, I started to say as Hansie repeated word for word what I'd seen in my vision as if he'd seen it himself. Hank was growling by the end of it. I was too shocked to do anything except lean back in my chair and stare. How? I know many things, Sabella. The tea tells me so. Old tricks but good tricks. You need to tell Tristan, Hank snapped. Right now. Why do you think she left? Hansie asked calmly. Hank's growl intensified. We're leaving. No, we're not. I came here to get answers and figure out how to make myself not a danger to him or anyone else. And to learn about Baladin, my uncle, who if you remember is causing all of this, I yelled. You are not the Alpha, and you will not order me around. I am your queen, and you will do as I say. I waited for Hank to get mad at me, to yell back, do anything, but instead he smiled and bowed his head as Kate whistled, a smile on her face. As you command, my queen. I wait, no that's not, what just happened? You acted like a shifter, Hansie explained. Something you seem to believe you cannot do or be. Because I'm not a shifter. No, not in the normal sense, but your mother is a goddess, yes? Yeah, but... And where did all the races stem from? The gods, of course, which means essentially, on some level, you have a bit of every race residing within you. He grinned at me. But... I started and stopped, scratching my head to try and make sense of what he was saying. Are you sure? Because I don't exactly feel like I'm a shifter, at all, ever. I feel like I want to kill the Alpha every other day for being so stubborn. His grin turned into a knowing smile. That is what it means to be with the Alpha. You are two halves to a much bigger whole, needed to balance out the other. And what is that supposed to mean? Tristan cannot only be Tristan, just as you are not only a seer or half-god. You both are many things, and though your relationship will not be easy, you two are meant to be together. Running away, no matter how far, will not change that. He tapped the side of his nose then clapped his hands. Now then, why don't we get into the more interesting topic of your uncle? What just like that? Be happy you received this much already, Ashen stated. I heard much less when I was to be wed to Drake, an elf I did not know. And look how happy you are now. Hansie pointed out as he pushed out of his chair and with a pop and vanished from sight. Now then Baladun. He is a nasty god, one of the worst. They were right to lock him away, and it's a pity he managed to escape, is it not, Catherine? Kate glowered up into the tower. Quite. But that is neither here nor there, he continued, calling down to us. Is this normal? I whispered to Ashen. Sadly yes. However, the amount of information in that elf's head is staggering. Trust me, it's worth putting up with his eccentricities. Her pointed ears twitched, matching her aggravated sigh. We waited for Hansi to rejoin us on the main level of his tower and with another pop, 
I didn't jump this time at least, he was there again, holding out a text to me. Very old text with pages that appeared to shimmer in and out of sight. What is this? I asked as he handed the book to me. It was heavier than I expected, and I nearly dropped it. The pages, they're not really here. They are and they aren't, he said by way of explanation and then Pop was gone again. I carried the book to a table and set it down, staring at the image of the creature displayed on the page. Baladin. The twisted horns were against his head just as I'd witnessed. Those eyes flared red with living flames and a tail curled around his feet. Spikes I hadn't noticed the first time we met ran along the tail. But the shadows that surrounded him, those I'd seen all too well and too many times. He carried the same dark staff with a glowing crimson stone, and though this was only a drawing, I felt those eyes pulling me in deeper and deeper, until a hand grabbed my shoulder and gave me a shake. Sorry, I muttered to Kate. What is this? she yelled up to Hansi. That is a text of the gods from the gods, Hansi replied from somewhere overhead. It's very old and very, very powerful. Be careful and don't stare at the images too long. Now he tells me. My fingers hovered over the image, too scared to touch it just in case. Does it say anything about him? There are no words on the page, I pointed out. Then turn the page, Hansi instructed. I did as he said and reached for the semi-translucent page. When I turned it the next two appeared blank at first but then words appeared before my eyes, glowing, written in scrolling cursive. I don't see anything, Kate said. I do. I see it all, I whispered and started reading. Baladin was one of the first gods, along with Pharaoh of the Light, his opposite. There were many, many more, but I skimmed over their names, wanting more specific information. I tapped the page when I reached something interesting, but Kate gave me an annoyed look. Right, I guess it's a god thing, I muttered and cleared my throat. It says Baladin was meant to be a balance to the light, and his monsters were only ever created to test the races when the time arose for them to prove themselves. But he started creating more monstrous nightmares and unleashing them without cause, started several wars and finally killed one of their own, Eben, god of joy and hope. After Eben's murder, the other gods banished Baladin and his monsters, locking him away, but he swore vengeance in the form of a war that would, would cover the world in darkness. Well, I'd say he's getting close to accomplishing that goal. Anything else? Like where he might be? Kate asked. I read the next page but all it did was list his charges, and then the next page moved on to a different god. Nothing that's it. Hansi. This isn't very helpful. Did you read about his abilities? I rolled my eyes but read back over the page. Monsters and shadows can suck the light out of the world, and he feeds on fear and negativity. So. He popped in front of me. I did jump this time, the damned elf. Tell me, you're worried about Baladin getting inside your head, yes? Because he has done so two times? Yeah, and? And what were you doing before each of those times, Sabella? I didn't have to think too hard to know exactly what was going on. Tristan and I were, we were fighting, I mumbled. We were angry with each other and scared. Exactly. You gave Baladin the way into your mind. The more negativity, the more fear you let seep into your mind, into your soul, that's what lets the darkness inside. And there it festers and grows, but, if you hold true to hope and love, Baladin will not be able to access your mind. He gave me that grandfatherly smile again as he added, You and Tristan need to be together. You are stronger together because of the love you share for each other. That is what will keep Baladin from your head. He tapped my forehead hard and I frowned in annoyance, rubbing the spot while he walked away. That's it. That's the great wisdom of the elves. Stay happy. I grumbled. How else do you combat darkness? Hank chuckled from his spot by the door. I shot him a look. He's got a point, Kate told me. When I was taken over, it was because I'd let the darkness in just enough, and then I had to fight to get back to Craig and Forrest. We're in the middle of a war. How am I supposed to stay hopeful and happy? Have you looked outside? I marched to the window, motioning to the dark sky. 
We can't even tell if it's night or day anymore. It's making me crazier than I already am. Hansi was turning more pages in the book on the table. He waved me back over. This is your mother, Sabella. She is the embodiment of light. She was created to keep the darkness at bay, but now that she's been taken, she passes the mantle on to you. You have to be strong for all of us now. That is your destiny. My destiny is to die, I reminded him. No it's not, he said fiercely. Your visions are never certain truths. They are given to you to give you a chance to make a choice on how to act. Was he right? Everything I'd seen so far had come true, hadn't it? Or mostly. Why would this vision be any different? I replayed it over again in my mind and then heard the words of the riddle with it, pausing when the words started to make sense. Three must rise, three rings abound. Sabella. Kate asked. Sorry, just a lot going on in here. I pointed to my head. That riddle and the vision, I think they're connected. The key to everything, Hansi murmured. We both turned to stare at him. What did you say? That riddle, it is the key. Solve it, and you solve the mystery. Come, we have much to discuss, and the day is young. Who wants more tea? We all shook our heads, and he laughed. I glanced down at the page in the book of Farah. She was magnificent with fiery red hair just like mine, though my eyes were cranes, according to Grayson. Light magic wreathed around Farah, and her face wore a fierce smile as she appeared to protect those behind her. I rested my hand on the page, and a burst of warmth filled me from my head to my toes. I gasped, the weight of this war lifting free of my shoulders only for a few seconds, but it was enough to make it easier to breathe and to know what had to be done. Baladin, I said quietly when I removed my hand. We have to find him and save the gods before he kills them all. How? Kate shrugged. We have no leads on how to get to him, and we've no news about what they found at the seam. I heard the worry in her voice, the same worry that hit me again, that Tristan and Craig could have walked right into a trap, but my gut told me they were both safe. Baladin wouldn't have stayed there, I said, unsure of how I could be so certain. But if we don't get ahead of his plans, we'll be too late to stop him. Then let's start hunting, Kate said, rubbing her hands together. Hansi. He grinned broadly and pointed upward. Time to show you my collection. Chapter 9 Sabella You should get some sleep at some point. Huh. I blinked against the candlelight in Hansi's tower as Ashen set down a steaming mug of something in front of me. Please tell me that's not more of his tea. She laughed lightly. No, elven coffee has a bit of a kick. I thanked her for it and took two gulps. Seconds later I was wide awake and my hands were shaking. What's in that stuff? Our version of caffeine. I suggest you drink it slowly. I pushed the mug away, so I wouldn't pick up and drink out of habit. Any news? No not yet but I'm sure if they find something they will send word. I wish we had something. I shut the book I'd fallen asleep paging through and glanced at Kate, passed out on the couch by the hearth. Nothing on how to track a god or find a god. Nothing on how to get to their realm. Nothing. And you don't think you already know how, instinctively, I mean, to find them? I shook my head. Hansi and I had worked with my godly powers. I managed to get a few flickers in my hands, but nothing to the extent I used when defeating the Stone Guardian. He too thought I had to have some sort of connection to the gods through my blood and be able to find them, but no matter how hard I meditated, focusing on that part of me, nothing happened. I couldn't sense my mother or the other gods. On the bright side, I couldn't sense Baladin either, and the voices were still being kept at bay thanks to Ashen. And then after that, I sat down to research whatever I could find on Baladin and his plague of darkness. A few times I thought I'd heard Tristan's growling voice in my ear, but each time I opened my eyes it was just me and Hansi in this tower I felt I was never going to leave. Then I fell asleep over the book. Have you had any more visions? Ashen asked, pulling me from my thoughts. Not that I know of, though lately it's been almost every day. I'm kind of surprised I haven't had one in a bit. 
And if you tried to get one? I almost picked up the mug of coffee to take another drink to buy myself some time, but my hands were still a bit shaky from the first few gulps, so I paused. I try but nothing happens. It appears I'm useless at the moment. Can't make my light work and the visions refuse to come and help me out. You my dear are far from useless. You heard Hansi. You're important to this war. How? I haven't done anything except hurt Tristan and nearly get myself killed. What did Hansi tell you, she said sternly. Have faith I got it. Do you, she challenged. You're letting the darkness get to you. It's not that easy keeping it away. You must have one central thought that you can hold on to that pulls you back from the brink every time you feel it creeping closer, she said softly, her eyes taking on a faraway look. One single memory that reminds you what you're fighting for. Any of those happy memories involve Tristan, and I focused on the last time we were together, not fighting. We'd been sitting before the fire in his rooms on the pile of furs he favoured over his bed. For the first time in a long time, we'd been talking about ridiculous things, things that didn't hold any weight to our current predicament. And we laughed. I smiled sadly, realising how much I missed that warm, growling chuckle, how it would vibrate through his body and into mine. I kicked myself for not making time for more moments like that. The war couldn't be put on hold, but we lost so many moments together because of our stubbornness and fear. I pictured that night perfectly in my mind, and my whole body felt lighter. Sabella, Ashen whispered. I opened my eyes to find a smile plastered on her face. My eyes were glowing, lighting up the room as was the rest of me. It only lasted a few seconds but in those few seconds I sensed my mother's power flowing through me again, and I breathed easier, just as I had when I touched Farah's page in the book. There see. You have it within you, and you can keep denying it all you want, but Tristan is your center. Your love for him. You can't abandon it now. You're right, I admitted and she balked in surprise. What? There's no point wasting time fighting the truth, but I can't go back to him yet. Not until we have a way to get to Baladun, and hopefully stop my vision from coming true. There was a knock at the door. Hank, who had taken up his post right beside it in a chair, jerked awake, falling to the floor with a growl. I bit back a giggle as he scrambled back up and opened it. Grayson stood there with Hansi, both wearing concerned frowns. And they weren't alone. You are in deep shit, Danielle said once she was through the door. Just remember that. I went to greet her and winced when she squeezed my hand a bit tighter than necessary. I know, and I'm sorry for doing that to you. Not to me, to our Alpha. I had no choice, all right? We needed answers, and he was being a stubborn furball about it. To keep you safe. Yeah, and putting everyone else at risk. She ground her teeth and glared at Hank when he sidled over to my side. Was it worth it, at least? Though I knew at any second Ashen's shield on my mind could break, and the voices would come rushing back, being here had helped me find a sort of inner peace and tapped into my god powers if nothing else. The visions, well, we'd get to that eventually, I hoped. Yes and no. We're no closer to finding Baladin, but I believe I've figured out how to stop him from getting inside my head. She dug around in her cloak and pulled out a heavy stack of papers. Maybe these can be of some use. Tristan and Craig explored the stone maze and castle ruins, but there was no sign of Baladin. However, they sent these back to the castle, hoping Grayson would be able to identify the symbols if they mean anything. I can't, Grayson said as I opened my mouth to ask him, but Hansi, he knows of them. Hansi. I turned to hand him the papers, but he was gone. Hansi. Up here. I have to find it. I frowned, setting the papers on the table. And Tristan and Craig? Where are they now? I asked hesitantly, worried the Alpha himself was standing out in the hall now. They were called away to Gregorneth to assist King Forrest with the Banshees and Hellhounds there, she informed me and Kate, who had woken with the knock on the door. But, they have ordered me to tell the both of you, you are in deep shit when they are able to come to Silver Valley. You said that already, and if we find a way to Baladin, it'll be worth it. I hoped. 
I kept that last part to myself, but from the look on Danielle's face, Tristan was more worried about my running off than he was pissed. It didn't take long before Hansi was back on the main floor with us, holding a stack of texts he dumped on the table. Frantically, he shuffled through them as I examined the pages Danielle brought us. What's this matter of an orb? I asked pointing to the sketch. The orb of the gods, Hansi explained, thumbing through a book then tossing it aside when it didn't have what he wanted. What they used as a portal, a doorway of sorts, into their realms. It was an orb? I turned to the next page which was scribbled notes. Wait, Baladin had this? They think so, Danielle said. They found a pedestal within the ruins, and it appeared some sort of round object had rested on it. If Baladin has the orb, it would make sense how he managed to not only find the gods when they had banished him from their realms, but take them away, keep them hidden. The doorway opens seams and splits, Hansi said in a rush. But the dimension we found him in, the stone maze, wasn't that a pocket dimension created when the realms were put back together? I was confused, my head throbbing as I tried to keep up with this new information overload. That is what we first thought, but I'm afraid we were wrong, Grayson said as he turned to another few pages. This realm we found him in belonged to another god. When he took over, he corrupted it and twisted it to mold his image. So the orb was there? No. Hansi let out an excited yell, making us all jump. Sorry, sorry, but here it is. The orb of the gods. He set the book down before us, and we all leaned in. There was a blue glowing orb, set atop a silver and iron pedestal. I had never seen anything like it, but according to the text beneath the image, there was a keeper of the orb, a protector of sorts. Mori. She is its keeper, what happened to her? I asked as I met Hansi's gaze. It would appear she has either been killed or captured, Hansi said sadly. And if so, I'm afraid Baladin can go wherever he pleases and create whatever realms he wishes. So we're screwed? That's great. Great news. I stalked away from the table, furious we hit another dead end. My head throbbed again and the room started to spin around me. I heard Ashen telling me to remember my one moment, and I shut my eyes tight, stilling myself as I pictured that night by the fire, Tristan at my side. The pain in my temples and the dizziness faded away, and I was able to open my eyes again. Sabella. I held up my hand to stop Kate. I'm all right. I'm good. No vision, no voice. Right so, she said, turning back to Hansi. If this orb is gone and this keeper is gone, there's no good news in any of this? Hansi grinned and tapped the side of his nose again, something I noticed he did when he had an idea. Whether or not it was a good idea, that I was starting to call into question. He pulled another book from the stack, opened it, and slid it toward me. What am I looking at? I asked. There was an image of a similar orb on the right page, and what looked like a story telling how the first orb of the gods was brought about. You are going to make us another orb, Hansi stated. I'm sorry what? You have the power within you, Sabella. If you wish to find Baladun, this is how to do it. Create a new orb and break into his dimension. He made it sound so damn simple, but staring at those two pages, I knew it was going to be anything but simple. Was I strong enough? The vision of my death, and Kate's and the deaths of so many other innocent people hung over my head. I didn't have a choice. If I couldn't be strong enough, we were all going to die. Chapter 10 Tristan I lunged out of the shadows and slammed my shoulder into the side of the hellhound. We rolled across the ground, the mangy black furred beast snarling as those red eyes flared at me, but I was bigger and more pissed off. I clamped my canines around its throat, biting until I tasted the vile blood running through its veins. Its growl turned into a cry, and then it went limp. Something else was rushing through the trees, and I turned, the hellhound still in my jaws, to find Craig ready to come to my aid, the executioner blade in his hands. It dripped more black blood, and he grinned as he lowered it. Hungry? I spat the beast out of my mouth and snarled at him. Think that was the last of them. Forrest has two more down in the field. I shifted back, wiping the blood from my mouth and spitting to try and clear out the taste. 
Craig tossed me a wineskin filled with demon grog. I hated the stuff, but it'd get rid of the hellhound in my mouth. I drank it down and tossed it back with a grunt of thanks. Did you work out all your anger yet? Might be a few banshees left to round up. I'd been going non-stop since we arrived in Gregorneth over a week ago, venting my anger and hurt against the hellhounds and banshees. They destroyed an entire village, crops, and killed livestock by the time we got here. Forrest had been ready to torch half the countryside, so he could at least save his people if not the land, but my shifters managed to track down the hellhounds leaving the banshees to him and his dragons. Took a few days but we weeded them out one by one. Now nah, I'm good. And hungry, I commented. What, you don't like hellhound, he joked. I glowered at him. Just saying. After you. I nudged the beast with my foot. He glanced at it and cringed. We need to burn the bodies. I bent down and tossed the corpse over my shoulders, cursing at the weight of it, but started through the trees. We walked in silence, him as lost in his thoughts as I was in mine. These were the moments I dreaded. The silence. The calmness. Every time I smelled lilac or swore I heard her voice calling my name somewhere nearby. Every damn time. But she wasn't here. Even as far away as Silver Valley, I sensed her. She could keep telling herself all she wanted we weren't meant to be, but every shifter instinct in me was screaming to go to her. Protect her. She was mine. She could run all she wanted but the truth wouldn't change. As we cleared the trees, Forrest landed near the pile of hellhounds my shifters were piling in an open field away from the trees, so they could be set the bodies on fire. He shifted when his feet hit the grass and hustled toward us. Is this all of them? Last one. I tossed the body onto the pile. Your lands are purged of hellhounds. Why couldn't we have had hellhounds instead of snakes? Forrest shuddered. I'm a dragon and I hate snakes. Well they're all dead and so are these bastards. Care to do the honors? I asked him. Forrest stepped up to the pile, sucked in a deep breath and unleashed his fire. The fur of the hellhounds caught instantly and spread quickly, engulfing every last one. The banshees have been obliterated, though I think I'll hear their screaming in my dreams for many nights to come. He stuck a finger in his ear and wiggled it, glaring with annoyance at the flames stretching into the sky. And I can't thank you enough. I know you both have your own issues to contend with. Craig and I huffed at the same time, and Forrest laughed. Just you wait, Craig warned him. The second you find yourself a girl, and she thinks she can take on the world alone, you'll be as upset as we are. Kate knows what she's doing, he assured him. And so does Sabella. I growled. He might know Kate because of their connection from their past lives. But Sabella, there were days she wasn't even sure of herself. He had no right to say anything about her. Let's head back, Forrest suggested, failing to hide his smile. We'll get some food, drink some ale, and see if any messengers have come from Drake. I doubted it. Sabella made it quite clear in her letter, she would not be speaking to me again, unless I went to her and forced her. Which I was going to do, as soon as I felt I was in somewhat control of my emotions. She'd not only left me, but she also left the pack, whether she thought it or not. She was their queen, they'd accepted her, and she up and left them. Her motives meant nothing, not in a pack mindset. I stalked along beside Craig and Forrest, only half listening to their conversation about plans to track down Baladin. That in itself was becoming an impossible task. The symbols in that maze, they were important, but until we had someone who knew exactly what they pertained to, all we could do was sit around and twiddle our thumbs, waiting for the next attack. Baladin's words repeated themselves over in my mind, telling me I was going to be tested, but how? These monsters he kept throwing at us weren't a true test of anything. No, it had to do with Sabella. And what did she do? She ran off on me. For all I knew, he was inside her head, messing with her mind, making her forget the moments we shared. Our time together. You growl any louder, you're going to lose your voice. Forrest grabbed my arm and pulled me to a stop. She'll be fine Tristan. And how do you know that, huh? How? Because she's made it this far in her life without anyone helping her. She'll survive a few days. I knew what she'd been through before coming to my kingdom, 
but then she'd been on the brink of going completely insane. How could I know for sure that wasn't happening while she was away from me for this long? The Dara lands have been cleared of the harpies that had tried to move in, Forrest said as we walked, picking up the previous conversation. Any other monster problems you've got? Craig asked. You see what happens when we leave you alone. Honestly man, and you call yourself a king. He shook his head as they laughed. Once upon a time, those two had been enemies on sight, and now they acted like brothers. Baladin might be trying to tear our realms apart, but it was going to take far more than countless monster attacks to do that, after what we'd all been through recently. That looks like an elf banner. Craig pointed to a rider nearing the gate of the castle. News from Silver Valley. A dragon guard called out to Forrest and handed him a missive. Forrest ripped it open and skimmed it, his eyes widening. What is it, what's wrong? I demanded as my pulse raced. Sabella and Kate are being well looked after, he informed us, and Danielle has delivered what was found at the stone maze by you two and Lucy. It appears they might be onto something. Something good? Craig pushed. A way to find Baladin. Just like that? How? I demanded and held my hand out for the letter. Forrest handed it over and I skimmed it. Hansi. Who the hell is Hansi? As far as I know, he's an elf scholar who has made it his life's mission to study anything and everything about the gods, Forrest said. If he says there's a way to find Baladin, then I believe him. We'll take the next few hours, eat, rest and then head out to Silver Valley. I stared toward the east, wanting to leave right then, but Forrest and Craig were already moving inside. I was filthy from the last few fights. Since arriving here, it had been endless hunting and killing. I'd hadn't stopped to get myself cleaned up except to wipe the blood from my face. A few hours of resting would be good for us, and give me a bit more time to work out what exactly I wanted to say to Sabella. I read through the letter again, but Drake was very unhelpful in saying exactly how Sabella was holding up. It did say she had spoken several times with Ashen one-on-one, -on -one, and the current situation was well under control. Did she have another vision? Was it worse than the last time she forgot herself? Or were the voices back? There were no specifics, and I'd be sure to point that out to Drake once I saw him again. I had no doubt if it was it his wife that had come running to me, he'd be furious with the lack of any actual detail on her well-being. Where do you think Baladin is? I asked the other two. In another realm, worse than the one we found him in the first time, Forrest suggested. And you truly believe this Hansi knows what he's talking about? Yes I do. He's been one of Drake's most trusted advisors for hundreds of years, Forrest told me as he grabbed my shoulder. I'm sure whatever he's found has nothing to do with Sabella either, so quit worrying for just five minutes, go get cleaned up, and there'll be a feast waiting for us all in the hall. I handed back the missive, and headed to the guest chamber to get cleaned up. Food and drink would not be enough to quell the growing anxiety in my gut, the one telling me whatever this Hansi came up with involved Sabella. She was part god. Made sense the way to find another god was to use her somehow. Avoiding that type of plan was the real reason I hadn't wanted her running off anywhere with Grayson. She had enough to deal with, and adding to the mix tracking down Baladin was only going to make matters worse for her. As I scrubbed at the blood and dirt on my skin, I imagined what she was doing now. If she regretted running away as she did. If she regretted leaving me. I was the Alpha. I was the one meant to carry the heavy burden of saving my pack, not her. I was meant to protect her and have her by my side. I stared at my reflection in the mirror, watching as my eyes flared yellow. Had she been right? That maybe the two of us couldn't work together, because she wasn't a shifter? Doesn't matter, I muttered to my reflection. You'll see her soon enough, and then she can make her final decision. I couldn't bring myself to join the happy chorus of laughter and talking in the hall, so I stayed in my room, piled the blankets on the floor by the fire, and settled in for another few hours of torment. Tristan. Sabella cried out as I sprinted through the trees on all fours. Branches whipped me in the face, roots trying to trip me up, but I had to keep going. Sabella. She was out here, and she was in trouble. 
I strained to hear her call out again, but each time it grew more distant. I was losing her. I dug my paws in, running as fast as I'd ever gone. Tristan. This time she screamed as if being tortured. My paws tripped over themselves as I skidded to a stop, spinning around and sniffing the air. She was close. I took off in another direction. A dark cackle split through the darkness, sharp against my ears. They flattened to my head to block out the sound, but it reached me anyway. Each second I was forced to listen to that horrid sound sapped me of strength. I growled furiously pushing myself harder, but my body gave out. I shifted back, unable to hold my form. Sabella. Where are you? Tristan. I jumped. Her voice came from right behind me. Legs quaking with sudden weakness, I managed to turn. I snarled at the sight of her with her hands bound to the arms of a wooden chair. Shadows trailed up her body like snakes, writhing with power as they drained her of hers. The light that shone so bright in her eyes dimmed with each pulse, killing her slowly. No, no. Run, she whispered, barely able to keep her eyes open. Please just run. I won't leave you. You can't save her. From the darkness behind Sabella a shadow broke free, forming into the shape of a man, reaching ten feet tall at least, with horns curling at his head and a tail that trailed on the ground behind him. He gripped a staff in his hands with a stone that glowed red, matching the fire in his eyes. Release her. Why should I, he said, running his fingers down Sabella's cheek. She was too weak to pull back, and my chest tightened with rage, my wolf begging to be let free, but I was too weak. He sneered. She clearly doesn't want to be with you. And you, what have you done to make her want to be with you anyway? No, she's better off with me than with a mangy mutt like yourself. That's not true, I yelled. You're certain? What have you ever offered her, hmm? I, on the other hand, can give her what she needs, what she truly craves. Freedom and power that she controls, he hissed as he stalked around her. I am her family after all. I am a god. Please, Sabella whispered again, tears streaming down her face. Just go. No. You belong with me. You know it, I urged, reaching out for her, but my hand fell short. Each time I took a step, reaching again, I was always too far away. Sabella. Baladin lifted his staff, spun around, and drove it into Sabella's chest. I bellowed, struggling to reach her. Her scream was ringing in my ears, then I was thrown backward. And jerked awake, drenched in sweat, lying on the floor in my room. I leapt to my feet, spinning around as the last dredges of sleep disappeared, but the nightmare that stayed with me. Sabella, trapped just like those other gods, and being turned by Baladin. She was safe in Silver Valley, but no matter how many times I repeated that fact to myself, it wasn't enough to convince me. I had nearly ruined what we could have together because of my fear for her safety, fear for her being hurt or killed. Fear of losing the faith of the pack because the one I loved was not a shifter. I scrounged for my boots and tugged them on before I grabbed my cloak and sword, darting out of my room and flying through the castle. The halls were empty, minus a few dragon guards. When I was in the courtyard, one of them asked if everything was all right. No, no, it's damned well not, I snapped as I mounted my horse. Tell your king I'll see him in Silver Valley. I kicked the horse into a gallop and took off into the darkness. Chapter 11 Tristan The ride from Gregorneth to Silver Valley usually took four full days. I made it in two and a half, stopping first in Boshan and then Torolf, for a fresh horse before continuing on my journey, not telling anyone a thing except that I needed a fresh horse. By the time I galloped through the gate of the Elven Palace and slid off my horse, I was beyond exhausted, covered in mud and grime from the road, but none of that mattered. Tristan, Drake said in surprise as he and four of his guards came rushing out of his palace. My gods man you're a mess. What's happened, where are Forrest and Craig? Catching up. Where is she? He took in my disheveled clothing. She's really fine, you didn't have to rush here. I raised my brow, waiting for him to say anything else except an answer to my question. Inside. I'll show you to her. No need, I said as I pushed past him. I'll find her just fine. I swore I heard him laugh behind me, but I didn't bother turning back to see. 
Once inside the palace, I took a deep breath and picked up immediately on the strong trail of lilac. Sniffing the air every few feet, following the trail, I hurried through twisting corridors and upstairs, across a walkway and into another part of the palace. King Tristan, a woman called out to me, and I turned enough to catch Ashen approaching. Someone I can help you find? I'm doing just fine on my own, I muttered. I hope you're not tracking her down to yell at her. I opened my mouth to tell her it was none of her business, but she was smiling. Something happened I should know about? No, I am glad you're here though, she said and pointed toward my left. That way. Thanks. I ducked down the corridor she'd motioned to and took the stairs two at a time until I reached a set of doors. I raised my fist to knock then decided that was too polite and took too long. After the dream I had, I had to see her. Now. I grabbed the door handles and pushed the final obstacle open wide. Tristan. Sabella stood, her red hair loose around her shoulders, near a table with several writings. Kate was beside her, as well as Hank and Danielle. At the sight of me, those two bowed their heads, Hank looked like he was expecting to be ripped a new one. Later Hank, I promised him, not letting my gaze slip from Sabella's. I have some unfinished business with my beta first. Now just wait a minute, she said, holding up her hand as I stalked toward the table. I left for a reason, all right? I'm trying to keep your stubborn ass safe. And what do you do? You ignore me, again. I'm the seer, remember? I see things for a reason. We both messed up, I told her, moving around the table even as she started to back away. But that does not give you any right to run away. Why the hell not? Her voice shook. You have responsibilities to your pack, I reminded her. And before you go into the argument about you not being a shifter, you're right, you're not, and I shouldn't have tried to make you into one. However, you didn't just leave me, you left them too. Alone and confused. She blinked furiously, backing away slowly, not letting herself get within arm's reach of me. I couldn't risk hurting them as I hurt you. Pain filled her eyes as she glanced at my chest. I'm alive, aren't I? But at that moment, you didn't trust me, Tristan. I can't. I don't blame you for that either. I paused for a moment, remembering the hesitation I'd felt at that moment, and how now it was overshadowed by the amount of love I had for this red-headed seer who stumbled into my life. I was scared, I admitted. Hank and Danielle's eyes widened in surprise. Honestly, I still am, for you, for the future of the pack. But Sabella, I can't do this alone. I can't fight the darkness without you by my side. Tears shimmered in her eyes, but she wiped them away, shaking her head vehemently. I can't, she whispered almost pleading. I. I'm scared too of all of this. I reached for her, but she drew back so fast, she crashed into the table and nearly tipped it over. I frowned, glancing at Kate for answers, but she offered nothing. I won't let you run away from us, I swore. Wherever you go, I'll find you. You can't all right. You just, you don't understand. Then help me, I pleaded, moving toward her as she backed herself into the wall and froze when she realized she was trapped. Why are you really scared? I heard footsteps at the door and spotted Ashen and Drake with Forrest and Craig behind them. They must have left a few hours after I did to try and catch up. Or Forrest flew them here, the cheetah. Sabella's eyes were locked on mine, and I stopped a foot away from her, waiting for her to tell me what I was missing. You won't hurt me again, I assured her. We're stronger together, we'll fight this. I know we are, she confessed, laughing bitterly. You keep the insanity away. You and I together, we're strong enough to block Baladin from using me, but I won't be the reason you fall to the curse. That I had not expected to hear. What are you talking about? But she clamped her lips shut and her hands curled into fists at her sides. Sabella, I whispered as I reached out and cupped her cheek, breathing one sigh of relief to have her close again, chasing away the horrible nightmare where I saw her die. Talk to me please. She leaned into my hand, her eyes scrunched shut tightly. I had a vision before I lashed out at you. And? What did you see? A dark voice in the back of my mind told me I already knew, but I had to hear the words from her mouth, 
had to know the truth of why she really ran away from me. Sabella, what did you see? A single tear slipped from her eye, and I wiped it away with my thumb. I saw death, she uttered. Mine? I asked praying that's what she would say, but she shook her head. I saw mine, and not just mine, she murmured, opening her eyes and staring past me to Kate. Kate's too. What? Craig snarled from the doorway. Just calm down for two seconds, Kate told him as he pushed into the room and went to her. Did you see how? I asked, barely able to keep a leash on my already raw emotions. No, that was the problem. There was you, Craig and Forrest and then me, Kate, and someone else I couldn't see, she explained, her whole body shaking now. And, ah, I was just dead and then Kate and the third figure, they collapsed. You, you shifted and you took off and that's all I saw. The flood of agony tearing me apart at the notion of Sabella dead was almost too much. I wrapped my arms around her, and she sank into my embrace, clutching at me as if she was going to die today. Nothing is going to happen to you, I whispered, my lips against her hair. I swear it. You can't know that, she pointed out. And you know for certain that what you saw is going to come true? I demanded. How do you know that vision didn't mean something else, huh? Tristan. I pulled back enough so I could see her face and those green eyes that always saw so much more than just what was on the outside. I love you, I said fiercely, and you and I are meant to be together. Nothing, not even your crazed, demented god of an uncle is going to bring that to an end. Do you hear me? I will not watch you die. Not unless I'm going with you. But that's why I left. I don't want you to die. Do you know what happens to a shifter if they lose their soulmate? I asked her. No but. Even if you were just to leave me, I went on, to try and keep me safe, it would slowly kill me, and that's not some romantic bullshit. That's the honest truth, Sabella. I held her hands in mine firmly, needing her to feel how much she meant to me, visions, insanity, all of it, I would face with her. You are not a shifter and I'm sorry it took me so long to figure out that forcing our ways down your throat wasn't going to work. She laughed through the tears streaming down her cheeks. Too damned long but I wasn't exactly helpful either. Running off into danger without a plan is a bit annoying. As we stared into each other's eyes, all notion of waiting to have our future together disappeared. This, right here and now, this was our present and our future. And I was not going to waste another minute of it. Sabella, I might not be able to see the future, I told her, or know for sure we'll survive this war, but I do know that I love you and these past few days have told me one thing, you and I are far worse off when we're not together. So, will you do me the honor of officially becoming my queen? Tristan, she asked in a breath. Marry me. Now, she asked loudly, and those gathered chuckled. But the war and Baladan. I kissed her warmly, drawing her in close and she kissed me right back, just as fiercely. They can all wait one day I think, I whispered against her lips. Applause erupted and Forrest whistled loudly. Behind us, I heard Craig telling Kate this did not get her off the hook for not telling him the truth either. My arms remained firmly planted around Sabella's waist until Ashen and Kate came over and asked for her hands. Wait where are we going, she asked as they tugged her toward the door. You, my dear, need to get ready for your wedding, Ashen announced, throwing a wink my way as Craig, Forrest and Drake came in to shake my hand. Nicely done, Forrest complimented. Knew you wouldn't wait. Cutting it close though, Craig said, watching Kate through the doorway. I sensed his need to be with Kate now during every second of the day, after learning about Sabella's vision. I felt exactly the same way, but we both held ourselves back. Guess we should get ready too. You stink man. Sorry, I didn't fly here, I said pointedly glaring at Forrest. No idea what you're talking about. Before you duck out, Drake said and turned me around where an old elf beamed at me with a grandfatherly smile, this is Hansi. Pleasure to finally meet you, the elf said warmly. Not sure I can exactly say the same, I said as I shook his hand. I hear you may have found a way to find Baladin? Yes, yes, but that can wait as you said. There is a wedding and I for one, love weddings. He was the next out of the door, muttering to himself about getting himself dressed in his best robes. Grayson followed him after bowing to me. 
As I neared the door, Hank and Danielle came to my side. Hank, if you ever leave with her again and not send a direct message to me, I'll have you on manure duty for the rest of your days, I warned, but then held out my hand for his. As he took it I added, thank you for keeping her safe. He nodded. Of course sire. I wanted to send you word when she let slip about the vision, but she's more shifter than she realizes. She put you in your place? Oh she did that, he said with a chuckle. Damn scary, to be honest with you. Good, now then, I think I'm being summoned to get ready for a wedding. Craig and Forrest pulled me out of the room as Drake mentioned finding me something suitable to wear that was not covered in mud and muck. All I did was smile, knowing that in a few hours my soul would finally be complete. Sabella's possible death hung over my head, but Craig and Forrest did a good job of distracting me from my dark thoughts. Today was my wedding day after all. There was no room for Baladin or the war. There was only room for thoughts of my future with Sabella. Chapter 12. Sabella. So what do you think? Ashen asked, turning me around as she and Kate stepped back to admire their handiwork. A few of her elven ladies were there too, and all of them nodded excitedly. Sabella, it helps if you open your eyes and actually look in the mirror. Slowly and carefully, not wanting to trip and rip the elegant gown, I spun until my face came into view in the mirror. Oh wow, I whispered in awe. Is that me? That's you, Kate assured me. You're beautiful. I slid my hands gently down the front of the green and silver fabric that made up the bodice of the dress, before it gave way to delicate drapes of darker fabric that trailed behind me in a train. There was beading along the V-neckline, and it was sleeveless. They left my hair hanging, adding a simple crown of delicate white, tiny flowers from the garden. Ashen had presented me with a handcrafted silver and emerald necklace, that with a teardrop pendant and matching earrings. I have to pay you back somehow, I said quietly. Ashen was already shaking her head. No. Seeing the love between you two is enough. Oh my dear, you are a vision. That wolf is going to faint when he sees you, she beamed. The others nodded in agreement. Kate came forward and held out a simple bouquet of white roses for me to carry. You ready? Was I? I would be binding myself to Tristan, confirming the love I had for him. If that vision came true, if I died, there was no doubt at all in my mind he would be lost in the curse. But he was right. The future was an unknown. Baladin could attack tomorrow and kill us all and we would have wasted these precious moments stressed and worried, lost in fear, instead of being with the ones we love. Yeah yeah, I'm ready. I smiled at the confidence in my voice, then froze. Wait, what am I even supposed to do? Kate and Ashen laughed as the latter patted my hand. Don't worry. Hansi will walk you through the ceremony. Hansi's marrying us? Yes, and I promise, he will stick to the point and not drive everyone insane. Kate helped me off the short platform I'd been standing on for the last couple of hours while Ashen and her ladies had taken one of Ashen's gowns and turned it into what was now my wedding dress. Years ago, I'd accepted my fate of being trapped in an asylum for the rest of my life. Never having any real friends, never getting married and having that happy love life. If only my past self could have seen this future, she might not have let the darkness in so much. We left the Queen's chambers and walked in a procession through the corridors and down toward the heart of the palace. Everyone who was there smiled and then went on their way, walking toward the garden where the ceremony was going to take place. Wait here until you hear the music, Ashen told me as she wiped happy tears from her eyes. Right then Kate. Coming. She squeezed my hand one more time then followed Ashen. I was left alone, just out of sight of those in the garden. My hands trembled and my breathing suddenly grew ragged. A wave of dizziness hit me, and I sensed the darkness creeping in closer and closer, showing me my dead body again. But I pictured Tristan and how he'd come here to tell me he would never abandon me. That no matter what happened, we would face it together. We were stronger together and after this ceremony, we would truly be the leaders of his pack, one soul. Not even Baladin could break that up. 
Beautiful string music flowed out of the garden, and when I lifted my head, the dizziness gone, I smiled and started forward. Barefoot of course. As soon as I appeared in the doorway, my eyes locked onto the wolf's down at the other end. His back went rigid, and Craig whispered something to him, patting him on the shoulder. Tristan was dressed in an elegant green blouse with a silk vest to match, brown breeches and boots. He was handsome, but it was the raw love in his eyes that pulled me to him, and I started through the soft grass, my toes peeking out with every step. His gaze darted down, and his smile widened even more as we grinned at each other. The music stopped as I reached him. Kate stretched out to take my bouquet. Hansi held up his hands, and there were tears shimmering in the old elf's eyes. Not that I could judge. I was on the verge of crying out of sheer happiness of this moment. We have come together today to join two souls as one, Hansi started. Tristan, Alpha, and King of the Shifters of Torolf, to Sibella, Beta and daughter of Crane and Farah, the Goddess of Light. If you will both proclaim your promise to the other. Wait, what? I asked, panicking. Tristan laughed warmly. No one said I had to say anything. Just say what's in your heart, my dear, Hansi whispered with a wink. Right, that's not hard, I murmured. The guests laughed lightly. I glanced up and as soon as I saw Tristan's eyes, my burst of nervousness faded to the background. You saved me the first time we met. And then you chained me to a wall because you thought I was an enemy, I added, getting more laughs. But despite our rough meeting, you never once let me down. You've been there for me and you've chased away the darkness. Still do. And I can't imagine moving forward without you by my side, and I swear to stay beside yours no matter what. Hansi nodded happily, wiping his eyes. Very good, very good indeed. Tristan. He cleared his throat, and I caught a glistening in his eyes. The first time I saw you, I thought you were truly crazy, wandering around alone barefoot in the woods, but then you told me you came here to save us all, and though I might not have shown it, I trusted you. Something about you made me open up, and I found my true self because of you. His hands gripped mine harder, and I smiled, not even trying to hold back my tears now. I know our lives have not been easy, and doubt they ever will be, but I swear to always do what I can to make this work between us. You are my heart, my reason for being, and I will never leave your side. Show off, I whispered, pretending to be upset his vows sounded better than mine. He laughed as did everyone else. Now then, if I may have the cord? Hansi asked. Drake came forward presenting a long white cord. He winked at me and shook Tristan's hand before returning to his seat in the front row beside Ashen. He took his wife's hand and kissed the back of it as she dabbed at her cheeks with a handkerchief. Your hands please, Hansi whispered. Tristan held out his right and I mirrored him. We clasped them together, and Hansi wrapped the cord around them before he tied a simple knot. He rested his hand on it and whispered a few words I assumed were elven, then raised his hands again. May the gods bless this union of Tristan and Sabella, and with their grace, let it be a long and happy union. I thought that was it, but then the cord glowed bright white, and a hush fell over the garden. What is that? I asked confused. Tristan shook his head slowly as he looked at me. I think. I think the gods are listening for once. This isn't normal. Hansi and Tristan both shook their heads. But it is a very good sign, Hansi assured me. The cord glowed brighter still, warm against my hand. I expected to stop, but then it seemed to meld into our hands and wrists, leaving a tattoo of the cord that bound us together. Tristan and I gasped at the same time as warmth rushed through my body, I assumed the same was happening to him. I guess that's what happens when you marry a half-god, he said in awe. Yeah, guess so, I agreed, admiring the tattoo on his hand and on mine. Hansi clapped his hands as he announced, the gods have seen fit to bless this union. Tristan, you may kiss your wife. We didn't need to be told twice, reaching for each other. Our lips met to the explosion of applause and cheers. We laughed as we held each other, and for one night, the rest of the world fell far, far away. Hand in hand, we left the garden and were directed into the hall. Oh my god, I whispered, stopping short as soon as we entered. When did they do this? Elves they can be quite efficient, Tristan said, his face reflecting the same awe I felt. 
The hall was decked out in white and green banners, with flowers on all the tables, and lining the wall. Fires and braziers were lit to keep out the darkness, but it was the illusion of stars someone had created overhead, that had me giddy. I glanced around and caught sight of Grayson. He bowed his head, and I mouthed a thank you. But then the music was playing, and the hall filled up with people. Tristan pulled me out to the center of the floor. I held up my dress in one hand, and for a wolf, he was an extremely graceful dancer. He led me around that floor until it was time to eat, and drink the rest of the evening away. With no way to tell what time it was, I couldn't say how long we celebrated in the hall of the Elven Palace. Kate and I danced a few songs together with Ashen, laughing like I hadn't in so many years. I took a turn with Craig and Forrest too as well as Drake, before Tristan stole me back. I finally sat, my feet not even hurting, and smiled as Tristan sank down beside me. To us, he toasted, as he handed me a goblet of dark red wine. To us, I repeated, and we clinked our glasses together before we drank. I never saw this coming. Ever. For a while there neither did I, he said as we watched the dancing. We sat in comfortable silence, his arm draped around my shoulders as I leaned into his warmth. I yawned and he stood, offering me his hand. Come on, you're exhausted. I know, but I hate to leave. I yawned again and he grinned, hoisting me to my feet gently, I fell right into his waiting arms. He kissed me warmly and suddenly, I wanted nothing, but to be alone. He glanced around us with a mischievous grin, took my hand and we darted out of the hall. A laughter echoed off the glass as we ran upstairs, me hoisting my dress up in my hand, and then down a long hall toward the room I'd been staying in. At the door we stopped, and Tristan pushed it open. They really outdid themselves, I said as I entered slowly spinning around. Every surface was covered with candles, and a fire was already burning away in the hearth. And I think they knew you were coming after all. Laid out before the fire was a pile of soft furs. Tristan lingered in the doorway. He rubbed the back of his neck, a quiet growl issuing from his mouth. I held out my hand for his, and he took it, letting me pull him inside. The door closed behind him, and we were alone at last. He ran his fingers through my hair, and I sighed at his touch, closing my eyes. When I opened him again, the love I saw in those glowing yellow depths lifted me up, and I pulled him closer, kissing him as the fire crackled happily behind us. Sometime during what I assumed was night, I woke, nestled against Tristan's side. The fire had died down, and he growled in his sleep as I carefully disentangled myself from his arm. I picked up one of the furs and wrapped it around my shoulders, tiptoeing to the bathroom connected to my room. Business taken care of, I returned. I didn't make it to Tristan as I felt myself drawn to the window overlooking the vast grounds surrounding the palace. If only there were only a moon in that swath of darkness, this would feel like the perfect night. I leaned against the wall, remembering all those lonely nights at the asylum, dreaming of a life away from those four walls. A life of adventure. I finally found it, and it might wind up getting me killed. As well as Tristan. In the dull glow from the fire and the few candles still burning, I held up my right hand and saw the tattoo markings from the cord. There was no going back now. We were in this together, till death do us part. I heard a grunt behind me and turned. Tristan lumbered toward me and wrapped his arms warmly around me, kissing my neck. What are you doing up? he asked with a yawn. Probably thinking too much. Probably. No visions or anything. I rested against the safety of his chest. No, no visions, no voices. It's all empty up there except my over-worrying again. Can you do me a favor? Just one? I asked. For now, yes. If you ever have another vision where you see your death, for the love of the gods red, tell me. I have a right to know. I took one of his hands and kissed the place where I could see the cord on his hand. I was protecting you, or thought I was, but, I added quickly when he growled in annoyance, I've since come to understand that we are strong together. And that I might be more shifter than I first realized. Meaning? I told him what Hansi told me, about how the gods were all the races and since I was part god, I was technically also part of the all the races, including Shifter. 
When Tristan didn't reply after a few minutes, I spun around in his arms, catching him grinning like the wolf he was. I punched him in the shoulder until he caught me up in his arms again, and kissed me soundly. It's not funny, I said against his lips. Oh I think it is. Whatever, you're still a furball. Yes but I'm your furball, he reminded me as he clasped his right hand in mine again. No matter what happens next, I trust you. I want you to know that. And I trust you and promise I'll do my best to listen. His brow rose at my words, but if he wanted to lecture me on how many times I'd said that before, and then did the opposite, he kept it to himself. I yawned and he scooped me up in his arms, carrying me back to the furs. He tucked them in around us both, and I curled up against his chest, closing my eyes and feeling safe beside him. I'd enjoy the peace tonight. Tomorrow when he learned how we were going to find Baladun, he was going to be anything but content. But that was tomorrow's problem. Tonight, I was just going to let us be a normal couple. Yeah, as if that would ever happen. Chapter 13 Tristan A few days alone with Sabella, that's what I would have wanted, but as soon as we both woke for a second time and heard the palace stirring around us, we knew there was work still to be done. Which was how we found ourselves back in Hansi's tower as he filled me, Craig and Forrest in on all they'd learned in their few days here. At least there's an easy solution to keeping Baladin out of Sabella's head, I mused as I pored over one of the texts he'd opened in front of me. Until he gets stronger but for now positivity, hope, those are enough. I pursed my lips as I glanced toward the fire where Sabella sat with Kate, both of them talking and laughing quietly. I caught her gaze, her cheeks reddened and she grinned brightly. I was more than ready to go to her, but Hansi was tapping the book in front of me on the table. Right, tell me about this way to find Baladin, I said, struggling to keep myself focused. The gods created a doorway of sorts that accessed all their realms, Hansi said and turned the page before me to show an orb on a pedestal. There was a keeper created to guard said door, a being so pure, she would never use the orb for any other means than for the gods. She is named Mori. Mori? Forrest perked up, his brow furrowing together. You recognize the name? I asked, glancing to Craig to see if he did. Craig looked as clueless as I felt. Yes I mean no. I guess I picked it up somewhere, Forrest muttered. She's the keeper? Yes and we believe she's either been killed or taken, Hansi said slowly, watching Forrest's reaction with curiosity. His face seemed almost strained and his hand gripped the table hard. Forrest might say he didn't know anything about this Mori, but his reactions told a completely different story. He reached out for the book, flipped through a few pages as if searching for an image of the keeper, but there was nothing. Just the orb. She's not dead, he said faintly, then looked up. She's not. How do you know? I asked, confused. I just do, that's all. So this orb, he said loudly, clearing his throat, Baladin has it, I'm assuming. How are we supposed to use it if he has it? That is where Sabella comes in. What? I growled and shot her a look. I knew it, I knew this had something to do with using you. No, it's not happening. Yes it is, she stated, getting up from the couch and marching toward me. We need a way to find Baladun, and this is it. The only lead we've had since figuring out it's him behind the darkness. This is a chance we have to take. I took her hands and pulled her close. I swore I would keep you safe and this would not be holding up to that promise. There has to be another way. There isn't. Besides I'll be fine. It's not like I have to sacrifice myself or something. I arched my brow, her words not doing a damn thing to make me feel better. The gods created the first orb, Sabella. Gods plural. You are just part. You won't be strong enough and what happens when it fails? She patted my cheek. You worry too much. Not enough, I argued. We're not making a complete second orb. We just need one to get us through one doorway. That's it, so I should be enough to do that much. And how do you know where to have this doorway lead to? She sucked in her cheeks and refused to meet my gaze. Sabella? She's going to find him through her visions, Hansi announced when Sabella refused to. 
And once we have a location, then she can create the orb, and you can have a way to reach him and attack. Easy as that. His humming was the only sound in the room, aside from the crackling of the fire. Forrest smirked, but had the decency to look away. Craig went to sit beside Kate near the fire, leaving me to stare down at Sabella, waiting for her to explain who decided to come up with this plan that could very well damage what control she'd managed to find on her sanity. She, however, said nothing and continued to avoid my gaze. I understand how you think this is the only way, but is it worth it? I quietly asked, finally. At the moment, we're losing this war, she said. We're losing because we can't find a way to get to Baladin, or shut down how he's sending monsters through. And each day he drains the gods a bit more makes him stronger. He's weakening us for when he finally attacks himself. If we can get to the gods he has trapped, free them, we have a chance to weaken him. So yes, it's worth it. My instinct was to protect her, not let her put herself directly in the path of harm's way. My arms tightened around her more, and she hugged me back. I don't like it. I knew you wouldn't, which was one of the reasons I'd hoped you'd stay away, but, but I'm glad you didn't. She buried her face in my chest. I can't do this without you, but I do have to do this, shut him down, before he kills all the gods and becomes unstoppable. I wanted to have some ingenious idea that would stop her from having to put herself through another vision, that she might not come back from. But nothing came to me. She was right, and I hated it hated feeling so powerless in the face of the gods. I couldn't bring myself to let her go just yet. I held on tighter, as everyone else in the tower let us have a moment. What about the riddle? I asked her. Did you figure out any more from that? Nothing that will help with finding Baladin. Course not, I muttered. And this orb, what will it take to make it? I asked Hansi, pulling away from her and turning to him. The light that flows through her veins from Farah, he explained. And a few drops of blood. Blood? Just a few drops, Sabella reassured me. It's going to be fine, swear it. None of this is making me feel better. I wish I could, but this is what has to be done. Don't worry, once the orb is made and we find Baladin, you can take out all your rage on him and whatever he has guarding him. Sound good? What sounded good was her not having to exert any form of energy to create this orb, but the darkness was not close to abating, and if we kept getting hit with monster attacks, our forces were going to dwindle and weaken, until there was no one left to put up a fight. I can't believe I'm saying this, but if this is what's going to get us to Baladun, let's do it. Seriously? Just like that? You said it yourself, we're out of options. I stared at Hansi with a warning in my eyes that if this went wrong, if anything happened to Sabella, I would hold him personally responsible. Sabella, you will need to prepare yourself mentally for this. Do what you must to clear your head, and I will summon you back when we're ready to create the orb, yes? Hansi said and waved us all out of his tower. Well then, I guess we have a few hours to kill, Craig said to Kate as she grinned. We'll see you all in a few hours. Then they were gone. Forrest rolled his eyes as he laughed, but before he could walk away, Sabella caught his arm. When Hansi was talking about Mori, you sure there wasn't something else you wanted to say about her? She asked. I was wondering the same thing. He shrugged her question off. You sure? No, it's just... I'm sure it's nothing. And what if it's not? Sabella urged. Come on, I'm sure we've heard crazier things. I mean I am still technically crazy, remember? He scratched at the scruff growing in on his jaw, and mumbled something about a dream. Really, I just saw this girl, but she couldn't have been real. And it was a dream, but that name. I swore I heard it in my dream. What did she look like? Sabella asked, tilting her head as she studied him, like she knew more than she was telling both of us. Forrest smiled softly. She was made of starlight, but it was just a dream. Yeah, just a dream, Sabella murmured. He said he'd see us soon and headed off seeming lost in thought. Huh? Sabella scratched her forehead. Huh what? Something you'd care to share. Maybe, but it's probably nothing, she said as she slipped her hand into mine and we strolled slowly through the palace, headed toward the gardens. 
But in my vision of us there was someone there with Forrest, someone I couldn't make out too well. Just curious is all. Three of you and three, three of us. She'd stopped walking and was whispering to herself. I worried for a second, she was falling into another vision, but her eyes were clear. I leaned in closer and caught a few phrases from the riddle that had been haunting us both. Wait, you think Mori is part of this? I asked. Three must rise, three rings, rings abound, she whispered holding up attitude hands. Maybe, maybe not. The riddle does talk about three and my vision, there were six of us. You, Craig and Forrest. Then me and Kate, and someone I couldn't see just yet. If Mori is part of ending this war, she best be alive. And if she is alive, we can't leave Baladin's dimension until we save her, she added. This might not be the easiest rescue mission in the world. You thought it was going to be before? I asked surprised. She opened her mouth, shut it and frowned. No, but now we have to go in looking for someone instead of just getting out who we can. I got us moving back toward the gardens again. Can't do anything easy. Never. She rested her head against my shoulder, holding my arm, and my worry for what might happen over the next few hours dissipated. All that mattered right now was that Sabella was here with me and we were together. Facing this unknown together. When this is all over, officially over, you owe me a honeymoon, she decided. Done, I promised. I'll take you to the Dara lands and the mountains to the south. There are some great hunting grounds down that way. Oh yes, hunting. That's what I'm interested in. We laughed and meandered through the garden, talking and planning for what we would do once the sun shone again, and we could see the stars. Talking about a happy future relaxed us both, and by the time an elf guard came to fetch us to return to Hansi in his tower, Sabella was calm and looked more than ready to create this orb. When we entered Hansi's tower, only a few candles were lit in the middle of the floor that had been completely cleared of furniture. A symbol was drawn out in chalk, a crescent moon surrounded by a vine with thorns and leaves, one of the many symbols of the gods. Kate, Craig, Forrest, Drake and Ashen came in after us, followed by Grayson, Hank and Danielle. Hansi stood on the other side of the symbol and motioned for Sabella to take a seat in the center. When she went to let go of my hand, I held on and pulled her back for one quick embrace and a kiss. If you don't think it's going to work, you get out of there, promise me, I whispered. If I can, she said. I glowered at her. What? Just being honest. Maybe do not be so honest. I hugged her again and then let her go, stepping back to stand beside Forrest and Craig. Sabella took her seat, sitting cross-legged on the floor, and waited for Hansi's instruction. Hold your hands out before you, he said, and she copied the action, so she held her hands palms facing each other, as if ready to hold something. Close your eyes and focus on your mother, on the gods, their blood running through your veins. Find them and when you have them in your sight, tell me and we will begin. She looked at me one final time, then shut her eyes. I had to remind myself to breathe, as I waited for her to force herself to have a vision. As far as I knew, they just came to her at random times, and here she was, trying to make herself get one. For a few minutes, nothing happened. The only sound was Sabella's deep breaths in and out. I was ready to ask Hansi if there was another way to do this, when the air grew cold, and the candles flickered around Sabella. Her shoulders went rigid as did her back, and I didn't have to see her eyes to know they were fogged over. Hansi knelt in front of her, outside the circle, a stone bowl filled with herbs near him and a knife in his hand. Sabella, he asked gently, but she didn't respond, at least not at first. But when the words came out of her mouth, my first instinct was to go to her. I was a few inches away from the circle, when Hansi yelled for someone to grab me. Craig and Forrest each took an arm as I growled, wrenching against their hold. Sabella. I'm. I'm fine, she gasped, but she looked anything but fine. Her body shook from the effort to hold onto whatever she was seeing. So much pain, so much pain. The gods, do you see them? Hansi asked as I snarled. Yes, they're here. Farah. I can almost make her out, but I can't get to her. She cringed then flinched as if she'd been struck. I'm here Hansi, do it now. He slashed that blade on both her palms and shoved the bowl of herbs beneath to catch the dripping blood. With each drop, 
White smoke billowed up from the bowl and surrounded her body starting at the floor and moving upward. It continued to swirl as her whole body glowed, pulsing as if there was light trying to explode outward from her body. She cursed as she forced it into her arms and each stream shot toward her palms, then outward, bouncing off the other. The light continued to grow until it started to take shape between her hands. Sweat beaded her skin even as she shivered as though she was freezing. I tugged harder against Craig and Forrest, pulling them forward with me until Drake stepped in to help. She's going to be fine, he swore but all I could focus on was the pain she was in. Almost there, she whispered her voice ragged. The orb grew in size and the light became so bright it blinded me. I couldn't look away, not until she came back to me. The light pulsed faster and faster and then she shook her head hard, her body jerking to the right. He's here. Get out of there, I yelled. Sabella. I can't, it's not finished. Her head flew to the left and blood dripped from her nose. The orb in her hands was the size of a large melon, and the light was slowing down. Her head was thrown backward, and she cried out from the hit, but never lowered her hands. I shouted for Hansi to do something, but he ignored me, his eyes glued to the orb. Sabella screamed one more time, light exploded from her body, sending all of us to the floor and blowing out the candles. I was the first one up and moving toward her prone body, in the center of the symbol. Blood trickled from her nose and lip, and her hands looked like they'd been burned. But there, resting on the floor a foot in front of her, was a silver orb glowing with luminescent blue light. Sabella? I tapped her cheeks softly and lifted her into my lap. Open your eyes, Red. You have to open your eyes and look at me. One blinked open, followed by the other. Tristan? My head fell forward in relief to hear my name. You all right? Think so. Did it work? I helped her sit up and pointed to the orb Hansi was carefully picking up with a silk black cloth. I would say yes. You sure you're all right? She winced as she nodded. One hell of a headache though. I went to wipe the blood away from her face but she did it first, cursing at the sight of it on her hand, then at the state her hands were in. They were a bit raw, but the wounds were already healing as we stared at them. I almost got out of there in one piece. You think he'll come after her? I asked Hansi. Can he use that? No he cannot. But if he chooses to attack here, that I cannot say. He carefully set the orb on a pedestal, sitting on the far table. This tower is heavily warded against the darkness, so we would have some warning if he decided to show himself. I supposed it was better than nothing. He has so many, Sabella told us as the others gathered around her. And Farah, her light was so faint it was hard to make her out through the shadows. As soon as you get your strength back, we'll get a plan together and go after her. I held her in my arms as I stood. But for right now, you need rest. You're finished with her, yes? I asked Hansi when he glanced our way. Yes, rest is the best thing for her right now. You should be very proud of yourself, Sabella, I believe your mother will be. Sabella managed a nod, but I sensed her exhaustion, and before anyone else could question her about what she saw while creating the orb, I took her from the room and headed downstairs to the one we shared. She shifted in my arms, curling against my chest as her eyes closed. I said nothing the whole way but my hands protectively held her closer, remembering how much pain she'd been in for those few moments and I'd been unable to stop it. Once inside our room, I gently closed the door with my foot and laid her on the bed, tucking the covers in around her to keep her warm. I dabbed the rest of the blood from her face and kissed her forehead. She was already asleep, and I backed away from the bed, pacing slowly around the room. Her wedding dress from the day before was draped over a chair in the corner. I ran my fingers over the fabric, smiling faintly as our wedding and the evening that followed filled my mind. Happiness, hope, those were the keys to keeping out the darkness. But how could I keep a smile on my face when Baladin was out there, and now he knew Sabella had found him? He would know we were coming for him. No matter what move we made next, it'd be a trap. Blood would be spilled. Lives would be lost. All I could do was pray to whatever gods were left untouched that it wouldn't be hers. Chapter 14 Sabella A warm hand rested in mine but then it was gone. 
My head throbbed, and I couldn't bear to open my eyes to see what was happening. I remembered Tristan carrying me out of the tower and him saying something to me, but then I'd fallen asleep. How long had I been out? A few hours, a whole day. My mouth was dry and I thought I should eat at some point. Waiting for the pain to set in worse, I opened my eyes and looked around the room. Tristan. A few candles were lit, but there was a chill in the air. No fire burned in the hearth and Tristan wasn't in here. Figuring he was with the others, making plans for when we moved to attack Baladin, I got up to go find him. The air grew colder with each step I took, and I snatched up one of the furs to wrap around me before I opened the door to head into the corridor. On the threshold I paused, sensing how wrong the air felt, but I wanted to find Tristan and let him know I was awake at least. I walked along the corridor, expecting to see elven guards, but I passed no one and the hall stretched on far longer than I remembered. My feet stilled as I started back the way I'd come, but the open door to our room was gone. No, I whispered heart pounding as the cold seeped into my bones. This is just a dream. It's a dream and that's it. You're fine, you're perfectly fine. Are you? At the sound of his voice, I shut my eyes, refusing to see whatever shadows were drawing closer and closer. Not that I needed to see to know what was there with me. The temperature dropped even more, and my bare feet burned at the sharpness of the frozen stones beneath them. This is no way to treat family, Baladin hissed, so close now I could smell the decay on his breath. You my sweet sweet niece think you can outsmart me. Is that it? You are not real, I stated keeping my eyes closed. You are in my head and nothing more. Everything in your head is real. Even those voices that damned elven queen think she can silence. Or your filthy dog. How you brought yourself to marry him, pathetic. I shook my head, curling in on myself as I felt him move around me. You know it's funny how everyone hears God of monsters and darkness and assumes it only means the monsters in the physical world, he mused, and my gut churned in anticipation of what was about to happen. They never think of the monsters that traipse around in their own minds, out of sight out of reach. A dull roar started in my ears but I ignored it, thinking of Tristan and our wedding, the evening we spent together. I pictured it all clearly in my mind, but the darkness encroached, pushing against the bubble of light within me. One last chance Sabella. Join me or fall forever into madness. I've been mad all my life, I snapped, finally opening my eyes. I mentally patted myself on the back for not flinching at discovering his red eyes a few inches from mine, him bent down so we could be eye level. What could you do to make it any worse? His smile stretched wider than should have been possible, sending a shiver down my spine. He ran his fingers down my cheek, burning me, they were so cold. He opened his mouth and cackled in delight. The sound intensified until I feared I'd be deaf from it. He raised his staff and slammed it into the stones between us. A bright red flash filled my vision and I fell backward, but there was suddenly no floor. I was falling and falling into nothingness. Baladin's cackling followed me down. Just when I thought I was going to be cursed to fall forever, I hit the ground, grass and dirt beneath me. I spat a clump of leaves and grass out of my mouth and looked around to see if I at least knew where I was. The trees looked like all the other trees I'd run through the last few months, and there was nothing else to give me a hint. No buildings or roads. No streams. Just trees and fog swirling around me. Hello. I yelled, wincing as my word was thrown back at me. Yeah, this is horribly scary. I cursed when those words echoed back as well, hurting my ears. Whatever. You want to throw me in a foggy tree maze? Fine, I'll wander around a foggy tree maze and I'll get myself out. I tugged the fur around my shoulders, picked a random direction and started walking. There was no sound, not my steps or wind. Nothing at all, only utter stillness. I yelled again just for the hell of it, but the words only echoed back to me even louder, so I gave that up. I told myself that Baladin had trapped me in a dream. That's all this was so I just had to find a way to wake myself up, right? A doorway or an exit. I was inside my own head, and I knew my own crazy mind better than some damned god. You hear that, Baladin? I whispered, the silence eating up my words. 
You are not going to beat me down, not now. I had too much going for me. I'd be damned if I was going to let that bastard take it all away. Sabella. My mother? Mum. Farah. Sabella. Sabella. She was close, she had to be. I heard her call my name again and took off at a sprint in that direction, but then slid to a stop. A trick, all of this was a trick meant to trip me up. She wasn't really here. She was trapped with him in his realm. I couldn't save her, not yet. Sabella. The voice was closer that time, and the sound of a cloak dragging over leaves made me freeze. The last time I saw Farah, she was held fast in a chair being drained of her powers. She couldn't be here now. It wasn't possible. Sabella, you have failed us. A bony hand reached out and grabbed my shoulder, whipping me around. You, you're not real, I whispered, the words barely able to get out of my mouth. Farah stood there, her once bright eyes darkened and her skin grey and dead looking. And she wasn't alone. More figures emerged from the fog, cloaked in black, their eyes black pits. Gods, all the gods I'd seen trapped, and so many more I hadn't even seen. I wanted to back away, but Farah's fingers dug into my shoulder, pinching the nerve. A shooting pain jolted through my arm and back. You have left us to die. Do you see what you've caused? We're still trying to save you, I insisted. Let me go. You're too late. Baladin has killed us, he's killed us all. You are nothing to me, nothing but a worthless daughter I never should have borne. Tears stung my eyes but I wiped them away and tore myself free of her. You are not real. None of this is real. It's all in my head, just in my head. I repeated the words over and over as the gods closed in around me, boxing me in, preventing me from escaping. They called me a failure, a plague on this world, a seer too blind to see the future right in front of her. Their hands grabbed at me, bony and dead as I fell to the ground and screamed for them to leave me be. But they blocked out the trees overhead, and my attempts to fight back were useless. I screamed and screamed, but no one was coming to save me. I thrashed, fighting against the hands holding me down. Sabella. Open your eyes, damn it, a voice growled. But that name, that wasn't my name. Who were these people? My eyes shot open. Five or six people stood around me, holding me to a bed. Get off me. Get away. I had to get away from them before they hurt me. None of them were familiar. Strangers. All strangers. I kicked and hit, making contact. Several grunts and curses resounded in the room, but the snarl that drew my attention came from the man to my right, his hands holding my shoulders as his eyes flaring yellow. Stop, just take a breath and let yourself remember, he growled. Why did he sound more like a beast than a man? He was one of them, one of the ones after me. I screamed at the top of my lungs, fighting even harder until I managed to break free of them all and sprinted for the door. The man yelled for them to stop me, but too late. I was in the corridor and running blindly, shoving bodies out of the way as I searched for an exit. A din of voices rose up in my mind, and I clutched my hands to my ears to drown them out, competing with the yells following me through the palace made of glass. The voices in my head turned into screeches. I yelled in anguish, wanting them to be gone. Too much, it was all too much. Sabella, just stop. They were close so close now. I had to keep going. They were going to catch me and trap me here forever. The voices in unison told me to run and I did as they said, hoping it would shut them up. I ran and I ran, sprinting downstairs and around corners but that man was right on my heels. Except when I glanced over my shoulder, he wasn't a man. There was a giant wolf instead, hunkered down low as he hunted me down. I sprinted as fast as I could, but it wasn't fast enough. A blur of fur to my right had me tripping to a stop and falling to the floor as his furry body blocked the doorway ahead. My way out. I was trapped. Then his body shimmered, and the man was back, crouching down as he reached out his hand for mine. Sabella please, I need you to take a deep breath and calm down. You have to remember. I am not going to hurt you. How can I know that? I snapped, withdrawing from him. 
Hurt flood his eyes but then he blinked, and it was gone, replaced with an intense resolve. You have to trust yourself, trust me. Take my hand please. How could I trust him? He was a wolf ten seconds ago, and now he wanted me to trust him? But my hand rose, and I found myself starting to reach for his, until the voices in my head screamed, and I doubled over at the noise. Get back. Clear the palace, the man yelled. I had no idea what got him so worried all of a sudden. Not like I could do anything with the state I was in, but when I looked up, I found my body glowing, light pulsing along my fingertips as if it was alive. What, what's happening? I asked terrified. You need to calm down, all right? You'll be fine but you have to calm down, the man said. I took a deep breath, trying to do as he said, but the light only pulsed faster in time with my beating heart and the voices raging inside my skull. Get everyone out, someone yelled from behind me. Tristan. Get back, he told the woman. Just get back. Sabella, look at me. I shook my head. That's not my name. Yes it is. It's your name, it's who you are. I wanted to believe him, but the voices told me he lied. All of this was a lie. The light grew brighter, and I felt it welling within me, building, and any second it was going to burst free. I wanted to tell this man to run, not wanting to hurt him even though I didn't know him, but then it was too late. My arms shot out from the force of the power exploding out of me as my head fell back with my scream. Stones crumbled, glass cracked. I heard panicked screams. As the blinding light faded, the wall that had been to my left was gone. Glass shattered around us, and I stared in disbelief at my bleeding arms and what I'd done. The man grunted in pain, covered in blood. I was torn on what to do, but then the power was building within me again, fighting against the voices. I had to get out of here, escape before I killed someone. Sharp pain exploded in my skull and then I was down, darkness closing in around me. Chapter 15 Tristan What the hell do you think you're doing? I snarled, crunching over the glass as I reached Sabella, now unconscious thanks to Kate. Saving you and everyone else in this damn palace. She lowered her left arm, and the Vindica shield folded back in on itself. She could have taken the entire palace out. You would have done the same, and you know it. My lip lifted in a snarl, but I didn't curse her out. She was right. Sabella was out cold, and there was blood on the back of her head from where Kate knocked her out. At least she was part god and would heal quick enough. The slashes on her arms and face would have to wait to be cleaned up until I got her secured. Did anyone get hurt? I asked Kate, once Sabella was in my arms and we were headed back upstairs. She decked Craig pretty good probably leave a mark but no, everyone's fine. Sabella was warm, feverish but no light pulsed through her body. One minute she was sleeping soundly in our room, and the next, her ear-splitting scream had reached me all the way in the tower where I was with Craig and Forrest. By the time we reached her room, Kate and Hank were in there trying to subdue her, but she fought against them like they were trying to kill her. Nothing we said brought her out of it, and when she did finally open her eyes, the Sabella I knew was gone. Her outburst could have been so much worse. Until we got her back to herself, she'd have to be locked in a room, tied up if need be. I hated the notion of her waking up again and seeing herself bound, but if she killed anyone, she'd never forgive herself if she ever came back to herself. When we reached our room, I laid Sabella back on the bed and as gently as possible, helped Ashen tie her down. I worried she would hurt herself when she woke again and tried to get free, but we had to keep her here. Once she was secure, I checked the back of her head, taking the bandage Ashen handed me to press against the wound while she tended to the cuts on her arms from the glass. You need to get yourself taken care of too, she insisted, but I refused to move. I'll be fine. Tristan there's glass sticking in your face. Gingerly, I reached up to my cheek and felt a piece there, jutting out of the skin. Nothing had hurt until Ashen said something and now my arms and face stung from the wounds. Kate moved in to take my place, promising, after I snarled at her, that she wouldn't knock Sabella out again. I sat in a chair by the hearth and let Grayson remove the glass. I winced each time he pulled another sliver free. You're lucky you didn't lose an eye he said quietly, removing another large fragment from my arm before he pressed a bandage to it. 
Hold that there. I did as he said, too busy watching Sabella for any sign that she was coming to. This was not like every other time. Her eyes, there'd been so much fear in them, uncertainty, and the way she'd clutched at her head, the voices had to be back. They pushed her closer and closer to that edge of insanity. Just when I thought I finally had her, Baladin threatened to steal her away from me. Finished, Grayson informed me, and I hurried back to Sabella's side. She winced as she slept, her arms and legs shifting beneath the ties holding her down, but her eyes remained closed. Softly, I cupped her cheek in my hand, willing her to know she wasn't alone, that I was here, but then suddenly she screamed, startling everyone in the room. Her back arched off the bed as if she was suffering, and I fought to hold her down before she could injure herself. Sabella, I growled, but her eyes refused to open. What's he doing to her? Ashen reached out and rested a hand on her forehead, cringing before she fell away from the bed. Hank helped her back up and she thanked him. She's being tormented by visions of the gods, they're killing her. No, I grunted and held her face. Sabella, you have to get out of this, all right? It's not real. Whatever you're seeing, it's all a lie. Please, I need you to open your eyes and fight this. I need you to see. She shook her head hard and I struggled to keep her still, as yet another scream ripped through her. My heart lurched to see her in pain, and there was nothing I could do. Keep talking to her, Ashan urged, pressing her hand back to Sabella's forehead. I wasn't sure what I could say, but opened my mouth and let the words come. You are stronger than Baladan. I know it, and so do you. You are part god, you're a seer, and you, you have every strength of the races flowing within you, I told her firmly. You and I, we swore to fight this together, and that is what we're going to do. Do you hear me? You and I are strong. I took her hand in mine and held it tight. I am never going to leave you, so don't you dare leave me, Red. Not now. Her body relaxed, but her face scrunched in confusion. Ashen nodded, appearing to weaken with every passing second. It's working, she whispered. Sabella, come on, I still want you, more than ever, I pleaded. I need you, do you hear me? I need you to survive this war. Please just come back to me. Ashen gasped and pulled her hand back, sinking against Hank. Drake was there a few moments later to hold his wife as she whispered to him, and he smoothed her hair back from her face, scowling at her, helping her away from the bed to a chair. Red? I leaned in and softly kissed Sabella's forehead. She stirred. I pulled back quickly, not sure who I was going to see when those eyes finally opened. Her eyelids fluttered, and I braced for more fighting as I saw a stranger looking up at me. You, she said, her voice ragged from screaming so much. I know you. And I know you. You, you're important to me, but I can't. I can't remember why. Take your time, I said calmly, though the rest of me shook. She blinked again and then sighed, tilting her head to study me. She went to lift her hand, but found herself trapped by the ropes. She sat up more, and I quickly undid them. Did I do something wrong? She asked, sounding devastated. I did, didn't I? I hurt someone. No, Red, we were worried about you hurting yourself. But your face and your arms. She sat up suddenly. Everyone in the room sucked in a collective breath, waiting for her to attack. All she did was run her fingers over the wounds on my cheeks and arms. I did this. It was an accident. You were hurt too. She lifted her arms, studying them carefully. I'm sorry for everything I did to you. It's all right. Can you remember anything else? Silently, I begged for her memories to come back. Her fingers moved to my right arm, then trailed down to the tattoo on my wrist and hand. Her brow furrowed as she held out her right hand next. We have matching tattoos, she mused with a grin. I do know you. I nodded, unable to find the words as she reached for my right hand with hers. As soon as our palms connected, she gasped and her head fell back. I held onto her and waited, counting out the seconds as they dragged on. When she sagged back in on herself, I moved closer, trying to see her eyes. Tristan, she whispered. I hugged her to me. Her arms wrapped quickly around me, and she buried her face in my neck. It was awful. They were there but they were dead, all dead. Tears slipped from her eyes as she shook. 
I know but you're free of it, you're back, I assured her studying her face. You're safe with me, and he is not going to get to you again. You are stronger than him. You broke free of his hold. No, I didn't, we did, she murmured. I pulled her close. Ashen cleared her throat loudly, and I turned to find everyone staring at us with looks of happiness and hope, a few wiping tears from their eyes. I believe we'll leave you two alone to rest. We have a bit of a mess to clean up. Ashen nodded to me. I smiled in thanks as one by one our audience filed out of the room. Mess? Sabella asked as the door closed. What did I do this time? Then her gaze landed on my cheeks and my arms. What the hell? Your power got away from you, but aside from a few cuts we're both fine and no one else was hurt, I assured her. Do not start blaming yourself. The Elven Palace is just going to have a nice facelift in the foyer. A facelift? How bad is it really? I shrugged as I said, you blew out a wall. Just a small one. Her head fell onto my chest as she groaned. It could have been so much worse. But it wasn't. Sounds like you saw enough to punish yourself for it anyway. She nodded but didn't lift her head. Want to talk about it? No, because no matter what I saw, it wasn't real. Sabella, I started, but then she kissed me, and I did the only thing I could think of. I kissed her back and held her close as we chased away the darkness hanging overhead the best we could. We're out of time, Sabella announced once she had recovered enough for us to join the others in the hall. If we're going to attack Baladin, we have to do it now. Won't he expect us? Kate asked. Yes, and that's the idea. The longer we wait, the more time he has to prepare a trap, but if we go now, there's a slim chance we can catch him off guard. Besides, we're not going in to stop him, not yet, Sabella said. Until we have this key figured out, our best hope is to slow down his plans as much as possible by rescuing the gods he has trapped, including the Keeper. Forrest clenched his jaw at the mention of Mori again. There was more to his dream than he'd told us, but if he wanted to keep it to himself for now, that was fine. Once we found her though, he would have to share what he knew. We'll prepare the army, send a message back to Torolf, Hank started to say. I shook my head. He frowned. No army? No. The fewer who go in, the better. But if Baladin attacks, you'll be defenseless, Danielle argued. I took Sabella's hand and kissed the back of it, feeling the warmth of the light flowing through her like never before. No, we won't be. I need you both here to guard the doorway will open, make sure only we come back through with the gods and stop any of Baladin's minions. Understood? Neither one nodded, and I sat up straighter. Hank Danielle please, Sabella said softly. Tristan and I will come back, I swear to you. They exchanged a look then bowed their heads. My chest swelled with pride, and the last few doubts I might have had about us were gone in a heartbeat. Drake, you're going to stay behind too, I said. You cannot command me, King Tristan, he reminded me. No, but with the three of us going in, you are the remaining monarch. If we die, we've all decided you are to take temporary command of the races in the efforts to stop Baladin. Forrest and Craig nodded at his surprised look. No, I can't do that, he uttered. It's already been decided, Craig informed him. Luca will be there to help you with the demons and the Dara lands. And my second as well, Forrest added. They will need someone of strength to turn to, and that will be you and Ashen. If we die, do us a favor and avenge us all. No pressure, Drake sighed rubbing his forehead. You're leaving me with no choice. That's the idea, I said with a nod. I've already sent word for Boris to join us. I will not go into this without him, at least. I'm coming too, Grayson said. You could use the extra firepower. I bowed my head in deference to him. We will be walking into this realm blind, which is why so few of us are going through. With any luck, we'll be able to free all the trapped gods and return without any loss of life. Sabella squeezed my hand and smiled. We will. And you have seen nothing else? Ashen asked curiously. No nothing, Sabella replied. But I have faith this will not be in vain. We'd spent a few hours before this meeting talking about her vision again, the one where she was dead. 
There had been no indication to show how she died or if she was in fact truly dead. But, until we had the sixth person unveiled in her vision, she told me not to worry. Her death wasn't going to happen any time in the near future. Her assurance flowed into me, and instead of worrying about her getting hurt, I focused only on our mission. Once Boris arrives, we'll make ready and use the orb, Sabella said. Until then, I suggest everyone prepare. She kissed my cheek then left the hall with Kate. Both wanted to change into more appropriate attire for whatever fight lay ahead. Ashen went with them, leaving myself Craig, Forrest and Drake at the table. I indicated with a nod for Hank and Danielle to follow behind Sabella. Grayson said he wished to speak to Hansi one more time about the orb. Drake poured out four mugs of ale and slid one across the table to each of us. He lifted his in toast and we did the same. To a successful rescue mission, he announced. May you all come back in one piece and not leave me to rule these bloody realms alone. I smiled into my mug as I drank. You should feel honored we trust you this much. Even your pack agreed to this, he asked. They understand how hard it is to find a new pack leader in a time of war. They will follow the instructions I left for them. Cheer up Drake, I have a good feeling for once. Craig leaned back in his chair with a smug smile on his face. Is that because Sabella finally seems at peace with herself, or whatever else you two have been doing behind closed doors? He waggled his eyebrows, and I aimed a kick at him under the table. Ouch. What just saying? Kate's rubbing off on you too damn much. Probably. I held up my right hand, turning it slowly so I could examine the tattoo. Each small line was another reminder that fate and destiny tied us together, along with our love. Whatever waited for us in Baladin's realm, we would defeat it. We would return, and we would find a way to stop him before it was too late. I glanced beyond my hand to Forrest, who was turning his mug aimlessly around and around on the table. We'll get her out, I told him. Hum? Who? Mori, the woman you've been dreaming about. Craig and Drake perked up at that, but Forrest shook his head with a sad smile on his face. If she is truly the keeper for the gods, what would she ever want with a lowly dragon king like me? You sell yourself short, Craig admonished him. You dreamt of her? I might have, but it was a dream, nothing more. Yes, because no dream has ever told us anything of use. Craig pointed out with an arched brow. You should know better than to dismiss a sign like that. It was nothing, he muttered, drained his mug and stood. Call for me when we're ready to go. Then he was out of the hall, mumbling under his breath to himself. Sabella had told me last night, too, how she felt Forrest was being drawn toward this keeper for one reason or another. All of us were connected to the fate of the realms and stopping Baladin. The sooner Forrest let himself see the truth, the better for all of us. It's my fault is like that, Craig said sadly. He thinks he wasn't good enough, and that's why Kate chose me over him. She loves him, just in her own way. Drake shrugged. Love is a curious thing. That's one way to put it, I grunted, and the three of us laughed. The first time I met Sabella, felt that immediate bond to her, I'd been so reluctant to face what was before me, admit what I felt. Now, I was itching to track her down and tell her again, just so she knew for sure before we left the realm of the elves. Love was definitely strange, but it was powerful. The source of hope and joy in this world had been taken and killed. But love endured, the only thing that could stand against such immense darkness. The three of us sat in that hall, drinking ale, and saying nothing. We were all lost in our own thoughts, but I had no doubt the same question was on all our minds. Who was going to return alive? Chapter 16. Sabella. You sure you're ready? Tristan whispered. I got this, I assured him and moved closer to the table where the orb rested, decked out in new leather armor over my blouse. The orb glowed blue with the power I'd given it as I neared. Gather around and keep your hands and feet tucked at all times. Tristan grunted in annoyance but I heard Kate laugh. Remember what I told you. Hansi instructed me, standing on the other side of the table. We were in the hall of the Elven Palace, nearly every occupant gathered. Boris was with us, as was Lucy, increasing our number, in addition to giving me a bit more security about going in blind. 
You must hold onto the orb to return to the realms. If you lose it, you will be trapped there until you find another way out. Right, don't lose the glowing blue ball, got it. I didn't have to look to know Tristan rolled his eyes and growled at me in annoyance. Everyone ready? I heard a chorus of yeses behind me. I reached out for the orb. My hands were steady as they closed around the sphere, which was warm to the touch and thrumming with power. Tristan, Craig and Kate, Forrest, Boris, Lucy and Grayson all closed in tighter around me as I shut my eyes and thought of the place I'd seen the gods. I counted the seconds in my head, but nothing happened. I frowned at the orb, squinting one eye open, wondering if was doing something wrong, when... Bam! It felt like someone yanked the floor out from under me. There was a loud pop, and the hall disappeared. It was replaced by cracked stone walls dripping water and covered in a thick moss. Firelight lit the space around us, and I tucked the orb safely in the leather pouch at my hip, drawing the string tight to keep it there. Everyone make it? I whispered, peering ahead of us into the gloom. All accounted for, Tristan said. Is this the right place? I nodded, swallowing back the fear threatening to well up in me. Light, I was made of light and Baladin would not extinguish me so easily. Tristan slipped his hand easily into mine, giving me the strength I needed to take my first step. They were separated in groups, I told everyone as we moved quietly along. Shadows hold them to their chairs, draining them. The rooms branched out from this main tunnel but this was all I managed to see. How many are here? Kate asked, the Vindica shield grasped in her left hand and a sword in her right. Craig was beside her, his executioner blade at the ready. Forrest and Boris brought up the rear, keeping Grayson and Lucy ahead of them. It was far from an army, but my hope was with this small of a group, our presence would go unnoticed. I remember nine, maybe ten for Mori, I whispered. But I sense more. You can feel them? Tristan asked. I shut my eyes as I bobbed my head. This tunnel, the rooms branch off it and at the center. I believe that's where Baladin resides but... I can't tell if he's here or not. Then let's get moving before he does show up. Tristan stayed to my right as we continued onward. My arms glowed as light pulled in my hands, ready and waiting. I caught his grin out of the corner of my eye before he went back into serious mode. The tunnel was tall, but only twenty feet or so across. When I'd seen the gods, they'd been in rooms blocked by thick bars with no sign of a lock to be picked or opened with a key. I held up my hand as the light in my hands pulsed as if trying to tell me something. Crouching down, I rested my right hand on the ground and watched the light slip from my fingers into the stone. It trailed away from us, and we hurried to follow it, keeping quiet. The light veered off to the left, and when I caught up to it, we came face to face with one of the barred rooms. Two figures were chained in chairs, shadowed tendrils jutted up from the ground and were wrapped around their legs and arms, creeping closer and closer to their centers with every breath they took. How do we get them out? Craig asked shaking the bars but they held fast. There's no lock. The two gods, women, must have heard us and opened their eyes. I had no knowledge of who they were, but as their gazes locked onto mine and hope flared in their eyes. They at least knew me. Stand back, I told those near me and grabbed hold of the bars. These bars were constructed by Baladin, made from his darkness. But I was of the light, and the light was stronger. I shut my eyes and focused on the power within me. It rose, warming me as I directed it through my arms to my hands. The bars grew hot, and just as I was worried I wasn't going to have enough energy, my hands closed into fists and the metal melted to the ground, forming a hole large enough for us to slip inside one at a time. Forrest, Grayson and Boris remained outside as the rest of us hurried in to work on breaking the two goddesses free. What are you doing here? The one with black hair asked fiercely. He will only capture you next. No he won't not today, I assured her, running my hands over the shadows. What should we do to get them off? Tristan asked me, but I was at a loss. Anything we did, could backfire on the goddesses held captive. Let me, Lucy said and bent down studying where the tendrils came through the stone. She flattened her hand to the stone, whispering under her breath. When her eyes opened again, she glared at the ground. They're made of pure shadow, 
the power they're taking is being sucked away into the ground, to a central system, all leading to a central chamber. The moment you free them, he'll know we're here. We don't have a choice, I whispered and stepped back, aiming my hands at the tendrils, but the light sputtered in my palms. Tristan. He moved behind me with a word and rested his right hand on my shoulder. The light flowed immediately from our combined strength, and I aimed it at the ground. The tendrils vibrated and one by one, popped free of the goddess as they shriveled and faded away into nothing. Lucy and Kate helped her to her feet, while I moved to the second goddess, dressed in silver armor with short spiky hair. Get me out of here, she snarled, her growing rage coming off of her in waves. I repeated the process, but as soon as she was free, I sagged. Tristan held me back against his chest and asked if I was all right. Fine, just taking more out of me than I expected. Then let's hurry. Mori, I asked the two goddesses, the first one we freed being supported by the second. Where is she? Mori. That bastard took her. The spike-haired one snapped. I'll tear him apart. Not now you won't, too weak, the other whispered. We have to leave quickly. Follow the corridor and wait at the end for us. I have our way out, but we're not finished, not yet. The black-haired goddess headed that way, but the second remained with us. I straightened and led the way out of the cell. There were more to find, and just when we were coming upon the second barred room, two gods this time, a cacophony of shrieks reached us. Baladin's minions, the armored goddess stated, spitting in disgust. She shook out her hands, and a short sword appeared in one after several attempts. Get to work, Sabella, we don't have much time. You, you're a goddess of war, aren't you? Kate asked in awe. Agaris, she confirmed with a wink. And you are the Vindica. Shall we kill together? Oh, we shall, Kate agreed, and the two of them moved to the front line. Craig's eyes narrowed with concern, but he remained right by her side, leaving Tristan, me, and Forrest to free the gods. The minions grew closer. The clashing of metal swords and grunts filled the background as I melted the next set of bars and ran inside to free the two gods. They thanked me, these two were weaker than the first pair. Lucy said she would help them get back down the corridor. I watched them leave then turned to Agaris, in the act of slicing her blade through one shadow after another, clearly in need to slaughter something. Kate and Craig fought back to back, but between the three of them, they managed to push the lines of minions back further. Boris and Grayson had joined the fight, and with each new room they moved past, I rushed in with Tristan and Forrest, freeing the gods and goddesses trapped by Baladin. Seven so far. Seven safe from Baladin's grasp. It wasn't until we entered a chamber with a single man in a chair, his beard trailing to the floor, that the first bit of uncertainty struck me in the chest. I made to free him. Sabella wait, Tristan said. It's too late. He's gone. No, I whispered, but when I reached out to touch him, the god's eyes opened wide and two black pits glared back at us. His mouth yawned open and shadows burst forth, snatching and clawing at us. Tristan shoved me behind him, and I ran from the room. Forrest and he fought off the attack. Grayson fell back as I prepared for a defense, but Tristan was yelling at me to keep moving. Sabella, Kate yelled over the increased din of the fighting. Find Mori. We're going to be overrun soon. But the others, I tried to argue until a fresh wave of minions, all shadow and claws sprinted toward our group. Damn it all right. On it. I flattened both hands on the ground, forcing myself to drown out Tristan's snarl of pain as he and Forrest tackled the newly turned god, cutting off our escape. I thought of Mori, of the keeper of the gateway for the gods, and my power pulsed into the stones at my feet. It took off down the tunnel, then veered right. I found her, I yelled. Tristan and Forrest were thrown from the room and right into me. We untangled ourselves as Grayson backed out of the room, his hands thrown out before him and a shimmering silvery shield blocking the god in. Go. I can't hold him forever, he yelled. Mori. I found her, I said. Forrest and Tristan got to their feet, we took off, following the pulsing trail of light on the ground. Kate screamed in fury, drawing my attention as she bashed a minion in the side of the head. Another charged her from behind. Craig was there in a second, snarling in fury as his face shifted with his demon rage. 
He slashed the minion, and it fell dead at his feet. He wrapped an arm around Kate's waist, drawing her in quickly. Then they parted again and were back to the fight. Warriors, all of us were warriors beneath the faces we tried to show, and we all knew the cost of such a life. I just prayed we would not wind up suffering warriors' deaths in the end. Sabella, Tristan urged, and I took off again. The light came to a stop at another barred room. When I peered in this time, the crushing fear of failure threatened to take me under, but Tristan's hand found mine, holding it back. We save those we can, he reminded me. Right, right, I muttered and grabbed for the bars, avoiding staring at the collapsed bodies of three more gods in their chairs, the light completely drained from their bodies. The bars melted, and Forrest was the first one through, sprinting to the rear wall. He's not killing her, I said surprised to see no shadowed tendrils draining the life from the figure before us. Forrest. He had come to a dead stop, before the being I assumed was Mori. Starlight, he whispered. And she was. Pure starlight, though it was dim from being chained here so long. The stars trickled from her hair, trailing to the ground at her feet. He was already moving to undo her hands chained to the wall, forcing her to stay upright. Her head hung to the side, but as soon as she was freed from the restraints, with a groan of pain she fell into Forrest's arms. He sat on the floor with her, giving her a little shake to try and wake her, but she wasn't coming to. Just get her out of here, I told him. Tristan. I know. Farah, he said, and without a word, turned to leave after Forrest was away with Mori. When we entered the tunnel again, the fighting had grown worse, and our line was quickly losing ground. An explosion rocked the tunnel behind us, and I turned in time to see Grayson bashed repeatedly into the stone wall while Lucy came charging from the rear. She threw a vial at the god's feet, lightning crackled around him, rooting him to the spot as the jolts rocked his body. Lucy was picking Grayson up, and they were retreating, but her potion wouldn't hold the god forever. Can you sense her? Tristan asked, his eyes focused on the battle just yards away from us. I'm trying, I muttered, shutting my eyes and thinking of Farah. But then the minion stilled, and another presence swarmed my mind. I cried out at the sharp sting to my temples. Tristan caught me before I could fall, asking what was wrong. You dare enter my realm, Baladin's voice boomed down the tunnel quaking the walls, threatening to bury us alive. I will kill you all. He was coming. We had to retreat. There it was, a faint pulse of light. Farah, I found her. Before he could stop me I jumped to my feet and took off down the tunnel, darting to the right, then left, wondering why this room was so far off the main path. Tristan kept up easily behind me. I waited for him to grab me and try to pull me back to the others, but then we rounded a corner and there she was. Except she was not alone. I gulped as Tristan growled and placed himself protectively in front of me. Hello Sabella. Baladin leered, smiling widely and baring his fangs at me. Trap, I whispered and wanted to kick myself. Of course he'd use my mother as a damned trap. Why couldn't I have seen this coming, why? I can't tell you how glad I am you've come to visit. Please make yourselves at home. You won't be leaving. Chapter 17 Tristan There was no easy way out of this trap. Baladin wrapped his hand around Farah's neck and squeezed. Sabella tried to lunge at him, but I snatched her back at the last second. Her mother's eyes shot open wide as she gasped for air, her nails digging into the wooden arms of the chair that had been her prison for far too long. Her light was fading as we watched. Let her go, Sabella seethed. Or what? You think you and the few measly members of our family you rescued are enough to stand against me? His hand tightened, and Farah's back arched as she struggled to pull free. They all thought they could trap me, that I would never be strong. Now who's the strong one, Farah? Bastard, Farah spat, and he squeezed again. No, that's the easy way out, Baladin suddenly said, releasing her. She sucked in breaths, hacking and coughing severely. You have much to answer for still, as does your daughter. You will not touch her, I warned. Baladin laughed harshly. And you believe you can stop me? Tristan, the great alpha of the shifters. Please, I'm trembling with fear, he mocked. Sabella had slipped her arm from my hold, and I felt how warm her hands were. 
She had a plan, but there was no way for her to tell me with Baladin staring right at us both. Distraction. It was all I could hope to give her. Baladin's eyes narrowed and he twirled his hand, pulling his staff out of the shadows surrounding him like a cloak. Those you have rescued, they mean nothing to me now. I have taken what I need from them. Even Mori. I asked, smirking when his eyes narrowed. We took her away from you. Whatever your plans for her were, they're gone now. It matters not. Clearly, Sabella has found a way to create her own orb. I will simply have her do for me what Mori refused. And why would I help you, she snapped. Baladin aimed his staff at me, the stone glowing red. I readjusted my grip on the hilt of my sword, waiting to throw myself out of the way. If you want him to live long enough to see the end of the realms, you will tell him and your friends to leave without you. Not happening, I muttered. Never going to happen. I am not talking to you. Deal, Sabella said suddenly. My heart dropped to the floor. What? Baladin grinned that nightmarish smile again and lowered his staff. Well now, this is interesting. You really are lovesick for this pup, aren't you? Let my mother loose and you have a deal, she stated. Sabella, what the hell are you doing? I growled but she ignored me. I went to take a step toward her but warmth flowed up my legs and I stilled. Baladin's full focus was on Sabella, not on me or the light that was slowly surrounding my feet and moving up within me. Sabella was moving closer to Farah, and in doing so, Baladin showed me his back. I doubted I could kill him this easily, but it might be enough of the distraction she needed to get Farah free and make a run for it. The fighting was growing worse back in the main tunnel. Several screams reached my ears, and the ground shook again from whatever magic Grayson or Lucy were throwing at the minions. If you let Farah go, at least from these restraints, Tristan and the others will leave, and they'll stay. Baladin's claws clicked on his staff as his fingers rhythmically moved along it. Agreed, but if you attempt to leave, I will find your wolf and slaughter him and his entire pack. Do we understand each other? Sabella nodded. I won't try to leave. Free her. Baladin bowed his horned head. Very well. He waved his hand over the tendrils, holding Farah. She slumped forward in her chair, and the moment Sabella had her arm around her mother, she screamed. Now. There was a blinding flash, and I felt myself given an extra boost as I launched myself through the air and buried my blade to the hilt right where Baladin's heart would be. He bellowed as I released the blade, glowing with a light that could only come from Sabella, and hit the ground hard. He thrashed, spinning around, trying to snatch me in his claws, but I was already running out of the room, following Sabella who was struggling to get Farah to move faster. You will not escape me. Baladin's roar followed us. I caught up with him and picked up Farah in my arms, yelling at Sabella to keep going. Her mother's head lolled against my arm, her eyes fluttering open every now and then, but the light within her was so dim, she didn't have long. Tristan. We have to go, Kate yelled as we reached the main tunnel where Agri's two other gods and Craig fought to push back the minions, they were no longer fighting, just holding the line. Kate go, Sabella ordered. Get everyone out. I handed Farah over to Craig. He and Kate retreated. Sabella and I took their place in the line, the light blasting from her hands shooting through the minions of darkness. Agri's get them and get out. She yelled as she blasted another row backward, her eyes shining as bright as her hands. You have to go now. Agri's cursed, yanked the two gods back by their collars and they took off. You too, she said to me as she backed up, using the light as a shield to block the advancing minions from reaching us. Not leaving your side. How long can you hold the shield? Long enough to get to the others, I hope. I rested my hand on her shoulder, ready to give her whatever strength she needed and we worked our way back down the tunnel, retreating to the gods we managed to rescue, and those few fighters we'd brought with us for the fight. They weren't without injury, but so far, they were all alive. Sabella winced and the light flickered, letting two minions through. I shifted and lunged at them, biting through bone and shadowy flesh, tearing them to shreds before they could reach Sabella. She grunted as she reinforced the shield, and then Craig was there to help me fend off the few getting past her. We're here, I said as I shifted back. 
Sabella, the orb. Take it from the pouch. As soon as I let this fall, they'll be on us. Get everyone gathered up. Her words were cut off when a bolt of shadow struck her in the right shoulder, cutting through the shield of light. Her arms fell but Agri's was there, supporting a partially conscious Farah, and the shield held. Barely. Sabella? I pressed my palm against the blood flowing from the wound as she blinked furiously. Trying to stay awake. I'm fine get get them ready. She pulled the pouch from her hip, handing it to me. Then she was back beside her mother, taking Farah's hand. The shield flared bright white and with a furious growl, knowing this was our only way out, I carefully pulled the orb free, yelling for everyone to huddle as close together as they could. Baladin yelled as he drew closer. A second bolt of shadow burst through the light, striking Farah in the chest. She gasped, collapsing to the ground and nearly taking Sabella with her. I was already moving to block her when a third came, but I took the hit in the leg, snarling in pain. The orb. It was in my hands, and I held it out for Sabella. Take it. We have to go. Blood covered her whole right side, and her eyes widened as she looked behind me. She shoved me down and then she screamed as another strike caught her left shoulder. She held onto the orb with shaking hands, and I closed mine around hers. The shield was faltering, and any second now, Baladin was going to be there to finish us off. But then the orb started to glow with power, and Sabella lowered her head as the light pulsed outward. I can't hold on, she whispered, and I bent my head to hers, lending her the strength I had left. The orb warmed but the light from the shield suddenly vanished. I glanced over my shoulder. Baladun. His minions parted for his massive form, the sword I'd stabbed him with gone from his body. His lip pulled back, revealing rows of sharp, fanged teeth as he lifted his staff. The red stone flared to life, and as he slammed it down, Sabella yanked her hand free from the orb and my grasp. With a yell, she thrust her hand outward, and a flash of pure white light exploded from her body, in a head crash with the red one that was on a trajectory to kill us. The resounding explosion made me deaf and blind as we were thrown every which way. And then there was nothing. I felt Sabella collapse beside me, but couldn't see, couldn't hear anything. Someone was yelling, and then nothing but utter silence. Chapter 18 Sabella I expected to be on my ass after Baladin's attack, but I was standing, and everywhere I looked was a warm soft light like the sun. The sun I'd missed so very much. When I spun back around, Farah stood before me, smiling softly and it hit me. The blast from Baladin, our being thrown out of his realm. Shit I'm dead aren't I, I surmised. Farah laughed lightly. No Sabella, you are not dead. You sure? I reached up to feel both my shoulders, expecting to find blood on my hands but there was nothing. And I was dressed in a white gown of silk. Yeah this feels like I'm dead. This is where every soul goes before they find their way to the afterlife, including those of the gods, Farah explained as she took my hands and clasped them in hers. My daughter, all these years you've suffered, and now that I finally get to see you, talk to you. Tears shone in her eyes, and my heart broke. You're dying, I whispered. She nodded. Tears threatened. No that's not, we came to save you. You can't die now. I need you. I will always be with you, even though you can't see me. It's not the same. Crane's dead. And now you. And you know this is kind of that time in my life, where I could use a mother figure. I just got married and there's a war going on, and I'm not exactly sure where I fit in with all of this. She hugged me and I buried my face in her shoulder, breathing her in. You have nothing to fear going forward. Tristan will always take care of you. You just have to trust in each other to see this through to the end. I would not have found a way to bless your union, if I did not believe his love for you is genuine. Even if that end is with us dying? I said pulling back. My vision, that's what it means right? I'm afraid I can't tell you that. But I can tell you, you will only grow strong because of the sacrifice you were willing to make. Your true self will be unleashed and that my dear is what matters most. Why the hell can't you tell me more? She laughed again, kissing my forehead. There were so many questions I wanted to ask her, 
conversations I wanted to have with her, but I felt her slipping away from me already. If you know, just tell me. This is a journey you must take without my direct influence. Trust in yourself, Sabella. Not so easy when you're half mad. She cupped my face in her hands and stared at me. I'm so sorry we couldn't be there for you when you needed us most, but we are so very proud of you. We? I asked and she turned me around. A man in a robe matching the one Grayson wore stood nearby. And his eyes, his eyes were just like mine. Crane. Sabella. He held out his hand. I ignored it and went to hug him instead. He held me close and Farah joined us, finishing off our small circle of family. I wanted this moment to last forever, but felt myself pulling away as Farah and Crane released me from their embrace. I clung to their hands but the light was fading. What's happening? I asked worried. You must return and finish what you started, Crane told me. How? You have the key now use it, he said. And then they were walking away from me. I tried to go after them but there was a bright flash of light, and my parents were gone. Tears streamed down my cheeks as I called after them, but I was alone as the darkness continued to move in, but this wasn't Baladin. I glanced down at my white dress and saw the blood stains on both shoulders, and more on my midriff. Whatever power allowed me this short moment with my parents was taking me back. My body screamed in pain, and I gasped as I was thrown back into my body just in time to witness my light striking and intercepting Baladin's attack again. Then my body left the ground and cold marble floor was beneath my cheek. Chaos reigned around me and I felt a hand fumbling for mine before it went limp. I tried to reach but the agony was too much and I collapsed. Chapter 19 Tristan He's hurt watch his leg. Hank? I grunted in pain as someone pressed a bandage to my right thigh. Damn it. Tristan, can you hear me? Tristan? Yes, yes, I hear you, I mumbled in reply and managed to pry my eyes open. Where are we? Silver Valley, you're back, he said but he wouldn't look at me and his voice was strained. His skin was pale and when I said his name, he shook his head subtly. I have to stop the bleeding on your leg. Just hold still. I looked around, propped up on my elbow. Grayson and Lucy were being tended to by Hansie not far. Craig and Kate were holding each other up, bloodied but alive. Forrest was bent over a glowing figure on the floor. Mori. We'd gotten her out after all. More glowing figures moved about, all the gods we managed to rescue. Those who weren't too weak, seemed to be helping those of us wounded in the fight to save them. Drake and Ashen were there, calling out orders, but there was a heavy sadness in their eyes, in everyone's eyes. Hank? Farah and Sabella, where are they? He hunched his shoulders, biting his bottom lip as he quickly tugged a bandage around my leg and tied it tight. Hank, I growled and grabbed hold of his arm. Where are they? You should rest for a moment, get your breath back all right? I shook him hard and he grunted. Where is she? Tristan, Boris called out and before I even glanced his way I knew. My body went numb. I released Hank and pushed roughly to my feet. The pain in my leg was nothing compared to the hurt I felt now as I walked, then stumbled my way as fast as I could to Boris' side. Hey furball, Sabella whispered, wincing as Boris and Danielle put pressure on the two wounds at her shoulders. Shush don't talk right now, Just you just have to hang on. We'll get you patched up. I smoothed the hair back from her forehead with a trembling hand. Farah? Boris shook his head once, and I followed his saddened gaze to the body of the goddess a few yards away. No light shone from her now. Nothing at all. Just a dead body. I want you to know. I don't regret anything. Sabella fumbled for my hand. I caught hers, kissing it fiercely. Not a second. Just hush, you're going to be fine. I choked the words out. She smiled but it didn't reach her eyes. Tears slipped from them instead, and she shuddered when Danielle went to move aside her leather chest armor to examine her. She sucked in a breath. I leaned in. The slash cut right across Sabella's abdomen and the bleeding, there was no way to stop it. I'm tired, Sabella whispered and her eyes started to close. 
No, you have to stay awake. Sabella. Look at me, damn it. Her eyes opened, and she reached up a bloodied hand to hold my cheek. I love you, have, have faith Tristan, promise me, promise you won't. She gasped her words out. I pulled her into my lap, cradling her head as I pleaded for her to come back to me. But then her whole body stilled, and one final breath escaped her mouth. Sabella, I pleaded, feeling for a pulse, waiting for her chest to rise and fall. No, you can't leave me, not yet. She's gone, Boris said stunned, and a hush fell over the hall. She's not. I laid her back and breathed into her mouth before I started compressions, needing to feel her pulse, get her heart going. Don't you dare die on me. You can't, all right? I can't. I can't do this without you. Tristan, Boris said and tried to pull me away, but I threw him off with a snarl. Sabella is dead. She's not coming back. His words were a slap in my face, and my hands stopped their movements as sorrow, unlike anything I'd ever experienced before welled in me. Tears seeped from my eyes as I drew her close to me again, willing those empty eyes to show any sign of life. But the longer I stared, the more the harsh reality set in. A reality I hadn't prepared for because I trusted in the vision she'd had, that her time hadn't come yet. She'd been wrong, so terribly wrong. No, I whispered, not caring we were surrounded by the gods we saved. Not caring how many she saved from Baladin, or how much that final attack might have hurt him in turn. Sabella, my Sabella, was dead. Tristan, one of the gods said, and rested a hand on my shoulder. I felt the rush of his power, but I shrugged it off with a snarl. Get away from me. You, you all did this. You took her from me. I tapped her cheeks again, kissing her cold lips, but her eyes remained firmly closed, her body limp in my arms. Please just wake up. Please, Sabella. Tears of pure rage filled my eyes as she stayed lifeless. The wounds she sustained in saving the gods were too much. They'd killed her. It was all their fault, Baladin's fault, mine for not keeping her safe. I lost her. I failed her. I swore I wouldn't let her vision come true, but here was the cold proof in my arms, fate sometimes could not be changed. Tristan, Boris said this time, kneeling on the other side of Sabella's body. You have to let her go. There is still a war to fight. It's not over, and there will be a time to mourn later, but right now, your pack needs you. Your friends, we all need you. I sniffed hard, hating the second I did it when all I smelled was lilac. Hank and Danielle nodded at Boris' words. Craig and Forrest, Kate, they all were there with me. Tears ran down most of their faces, but they couldn't possibly understand this pain that was eating away at me. My heart had been torn from my chest and obliterated. I rested my forehead to Sabella's cold one. She wasn't meant to die this way. Not like this. I remained there for a moment before I glanced straight into Boris' eyes. I can't, I whispered. He hung his head. We need you, he tried again. I set Sabella's body gently on the floor and placed her hands over her body, so she looked like she was sleeping. I straightened and felt the rage of my wolf swell until I could no longer fight it. I threw back my head with a yell until I shifted, and it turned into a mournful howl that shattered the night. I shook out my head, staring at my pack one last time. The curse was taking hold of me, no matter how hard I fought it. Sabella's loss was too great. Even as I backed away, names and faces blurred in my mind, and I was no longer certain who stood around me. Run, I had to run, get away from them before they captured me. Tristan, one of the females pleaded, but I backed away faster when she reached for me. Don't do this. I bared my teeth at her, snapping my jaws in warning before I turned tail and sprinted out the doors, through the stone courtyard, and across the fields, my claws digging into the dirt as I kicked up grass and howled again. Unbearable pain consumed me the harder I ran. How could I keep living like this? I reached the trees and wove between them, pleading for the agony in my chest to stop. What had happened to me? Why was I being punished like this? I ran blindly, slamming into trees and tripping over roots until I found myself sprawled in the mud amidst bushes and piles of leaves. I sniffed hard and paused. Pray there was prey close by. I lifted my head and sniffed again, grunting as I pushed to my feet and stalked through the trees. Hunger. That's all I felt now. Hunger. I paused for a moment, 
a whisper of a word drifting close to my ears but didn't understand the words. I was a predator of the night, nothing more. And out there was the one thing that would sate my hunger. Chapter 20 Sabella I felt fuzzy. Strange somehow. And I couldn't see anything. Voices surrounded me, but I recognized none of them. I listened closely and heard them mention a king and gods. There'd been a fight and every voice I heard rang with the loss. I tried to remember, but there were no memories for me to find. Nothing. Light glowed behind my eyelids, and other sensations eventually came to me. I was lying on something soft, and the air was pleasantly warm. Crying someone cried close by and squeezed my hand. I wanted to squeeze back, but my hand ignored the command. Someone else kissed my forehead and tears splashed wetly on my face. Another and then another person touched their fingers to my forehead as they said goodbye. Why were they all so sad? Where was I going? I never thought I would like you, another female voice whispered roughly, but you gave your life to save the pack, save our alpha. That makes you our beta and our queen in life and death. Those words hit me hard and I expected my lips to part on a gasp, but they remained closed. We can't let him stay out there, a man said, his words filled with sadness. I refuse to let him be another taken by the curse. There's no use. His mind is lost. He is our alpha. He would never just abandon us, so we can't abandon him. Nothing can bring him back to us, just like, just like we lost Sabella, another said harshly. That name. Why did I know that name? And who were they talking about? An alpha. Whoever this person was, they all loved him dearly. My heart ached being surrounded by their pain. I wanted to help them somehow. I felt my fingers twitch the longer I concentrated on moving, but none of the voices stopped their heated discussion about their missing alpha. He was hurting, broken. I had to help. Why? The voice inside my mind confused me. Why wouldn't I help? That's who I was, right? Who are you? My name, what was my name? I'm not staying here, I can't, not while he's out there. And what are you going to do, huh? What? He's given in to the curse. There's no breaking that. He's doomed to wander as a mindless beast for the rest of his days. No, there's a way. Yes, there is. How did the voice know that? Or did I know it? My fingers twitched again. I was here to help these people. I knew I was. My purpose was, was what? I'd been sent to them. These people, these voices, I knew them all, didn't I? Who are you? I was. I was, it slipped from my mind, and I wanted to scream in sudden frustration. Tristan will come back to us, I know he will, a woman said. That name. It hit me harder than the first, and I dug through the mess that was my head, trying to put a face to that name. He was important, their alpha. The alpha of the pack, and I was something to them too. Here to help, that's all I could remember. I had to help them. They needed me before the end. The darkness was still coming for us all, and the worst monster yet was soon to rise. Baladin will be coming after the gods we saved, a man growled. Our focus has to be on keeping them safe, and figuring out how to end this nightmare. They have returned to the few realms untouched by him, but if Baladin still has the gateway, once he recovers from Sabella's attack, he'll just go after them again. We have to destroy him. How? A woman snapped. Yes how indeed. I cursed the voice and its useless questions. The riddle Sabella told us, that has to be the key, but without her, I'm not sure we can decipher its meaning. The woman who spoke sniffed hard, and I heard a man comforting her quietly. I'm sorry, I just can't accept it's going to end like this for them. It's not supposed to. They're meant to be together, not one dead and the other cursed. Life isn't fair, we of all people should know that, a man said bitterly. Come on, we should leave her be until tomorrow. The whole pack will be gathered then, as well as all the others who will come to mourn in Torolf. No, no, they were leaving. I begged for my hands to move, my mouth to open, but the steps left one by one, and then a door closed. The silence fell heavy around me like a blanket. 
Was this really it? I was forced to lie here and listen to their despairs, but not be able to do anything about it? What are you going to do, Sabella? Sabella. That name sounded so familiar, but was it really mine? The question was repeated over and over again, until I mentally screamed for it to stop. I knew exactly what I was going to do. I was going to fight, fight for these people, fight for all of them. I'd been sent to them for a reason, and my job was far from over yet. My fingers twitched, and then I was able to lift my hands, one after the other. Muscles groaned in protest as they came alive and a white light filled my mind, shooting through my body. With a gasp of air, I shot upright and my eyes opened wide. Flickering candlelight filled the room, giving it a soft glow. This room, it looked familiar, the rich tapestries on the walls and the rugs and furs on the floor. The bed itself was soft and warm with more furs piled around me. Why did I know this place? I waited for the voice to taunt me again, but it was silent. Gingerly my bare toes touched the stones, and after a few wobbly seconds I managed to stand upright. I wore black breeches and a loose black blouse, my hair hanging around my shoulders. The sleeves were crusted with something, so was the middle of the shirt and there were several rips in the fabric. I'd worn these before, hadn't I? Knew what my hair looked like as it ran through my fingers. Images of me and another in this room flitted in and out of my mind's sight. Each time I tried to focus on them more they vanished, and I frowned in annoyance taking a few cautious steps forward. Each one seemed to return my strength to me, and I managed to make it to the door, sagging against it. Those voices, they drifted much further away than I expected. It took almost all the strength I had to open the door, and I stumbled out into the corridor. Empty. I opened my mouth, trying to call out, but all that came out was a croak. I breathed deeply, feeling that white light fill me again, and used the wall to support me as I found my way down the corridor. Black banners were draped over several paintings I passed, also over the mirrors in this stone palace. They moved me here. I was sure of it. Before, before there'd been glass, but still, this place was familiar to me. More black silks hung over the railings. I found myself at a set of stairs but still met no one else. The air was heavy with sadness, and I urged my feet to move faster. How I knew where to go, I wasn't sure, but let my instincts guide me. The castle was my home somehow, I knew that to be true, but nothing else came to me yet. The voices I'd heard in my room drifted to my ears again, and I found myself outside a set of double wooden doors. They were just on the other side. Now is your time, Sabella, the voice whispered as I reached for the handles. Show them who you are. Show them what you are made of. Prove that there is light in the darkness. Arm straining I shoved open the doors. They swung inward soundlessly, but the voices stopped one after the other as the familiar faces all turned to stare at me. One by one their eyes widened or their jaws dropped. There were a few gasps, a curse, and a chair fell over as one of the women leapt to her feet and rushed toward me. Sabella. You, you're alive. She hugged me hard and then I was surrounded by them all. They hugged me and kissed my forehead, looks of disbelief on their faces, asking me what happened. I shook my head after they guided me to a chair and sat me down. I'm sorry, I finally managed to get out, but I don't know who Sabella is. The woman who hugged me first shot a worried glance at one of the men as he reached out and took her hand. You're Sabella. A seer. And the beater of this pack another woman stated proudly. And our queen. You have to remember. The name sounds familiar, I admitted, so does this place but, nothing else is coming to me. I took in every face staring down at me and willed myself to know who they were, but my mind was a blank. I do know I'm here to help you. That man you spoke of, the Alpha, you need him back right? A few of them exchanged hopeful glances as the woman with fascinating green eyes nodded. She reached for my hands and held them securely. His name is Tristan, and though you don't remember, he means a great deal to you. To all of us. What happened to him? He left because he thought, he believed the woman he loved was dead. I frowned. That's horrible. Is she? Tears shimmered in her eyes as she laughed warmly. No, no somehow she isn't, but he doesn't know that, 
and now he's in danger of being lost to us forever. There was a curse, and is forgotten who he is. Could I bring him back? All he needed to know was this woman, she was alive. I stood, nodding firmly at them all. I'll find him, and I'll bring him back. How are you going to do that? She asked worriedly. I opened my mouth to explain, then shut it again, tilting my head. I wasn't sure how to explain it myself, but I smiled at them all. I just will. Then I turned on my heel and strolled for the door. Wait Sabella, she called, but I couldn't waste time. They needed this man back for the final battle. That much I knew for certain. I was here to help and to get him back. I picked up my pace, and then I was running out of the castle, through the front gate, passing more people who gasped and muttered in astonishment. I wanted to stay and reassure them all their alpha would be returned to them, but the light inside me spurred me on until I was nothing but a blur of white light in the darkness. I streaked through the shadows, slicing through them like a knife as my bare feet barely touched the ground. I felt lighter than air, my red hair whipping out behind me like a living flame. I cut right, then left, jumping over low-hanging limbs and laughing at the sheer thrill of being so alive. The hair on my arms rose, and I slowed my pace, the light making me glow amongst the trees. Something was close, something large. I peered into the trees and saw one shadow detach itself. The beast walked on four legs, and when it crept closer, I carefully raised my hand to shed more light on it. It growled fiercely, not backing down, and I admired the dark brown and red fur of the great wolf before me. I waited for him to attack me, but he only growled in warning to keep me away. You, I whispered softly, sliding a bit closer, you're the one they lost. He shook out his shaggy head, ears flattening against his skull, as I took another step. His eyes flared yellow and I paused as a new memory slammed into me. I gasped for air, seeing those eyes in another time, and on another face. A man's face. I blinked, catching sight of the wolf for another few seconds before more memories struck me. I staggered backward again and again, holding a hand to my aching chest as I struggled to understand them all. Do you know now? That voice, my mother. Tears sprang to my eyes as I felt her hand cup my cheek for a moment before it was gone. She died. My mother died and I? I was Sabella. When I lifted my head this time and met the wary gaze of the wolf, I failed to blink back the tears at the lack of recognition in that face. A face I knew all too well. Tristan, I whispered, knowing this was all my fault. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. The fight and rescuing the gods. I'd been hurt badly. They thought I was dead. I remembered saying goodbye to him as my eyes closed, for what we both thought was the last time. I lifted my hand, and he snarled, flashing those teeth at me. I swallowed back any doubt in mind that he would hurt me and moved closer. Tristan you have to come back to me, I said sternly as tears streamed down my cheeks. Please? Your pack still needs you, and I... I can't do this without you. His deep growl rumbled through his chest, but his feet stayed planted. I know you're in there. That curse? You can break it, you're stronger than it. I know you are. My fingers brushed along the side of his face, and I wanted to sag in relief against him, but stopped myself. What we have together, that's stronger. I know you believe it, so please just come back to me. Please? He blinked and started to step back. My heart sank, thinking I'd lost him, but then he grunted and his whole body shuddered. He threw his head back, howling into the night, and shifted right before my eyes until I wasn't staring at Tristan the wolf, just the man. He blinked furiously as he tentatively reached out a hand to my cheek. I leaned into his touch and he cursed before he wrapped me up in his arms and kissed me. You were dead, he whispered against my lips. I saw you die in my arms. Guess I was right, I said. He frowned. The god part of me is stronger than we both thought. He kissed me again with a growl, and I sank into the warmth of his arms. I forgot everything, he murmured. Then I saw this light and... Sabella, you're still glowing. He stepped back just enough to stare down at me. Why? Something about fully awakening my godly powers, I said simply, not getting into everything Farah had told me before she died. Sacrifice and all that. 
We held each other beneath the trees, not willing to let the other one go. I should get you back to the castle, I said after a while. I promised everyone I would bring you back to them. I'm sure you scared them all, walking around after you were supposed to be dead. I cringed. I wasn't exactly myself when I came back either. His arm remained around my shoulders and mine around his waist as we took our time walking through the trees, leaning into one another and not needing to say a word. Was there still a war to fight? Yeah there was but none of that mattered. I had died or at least come close enough to death as a half-god could get. I knew that, and Tristan had nearly been lost to the curse. All I cared about as we moved through the never-ending night was staying close to one another. The castle was in view, and I heard Kate and Craig bellowing my name as well as horses being gathered outside the gate. Looks like they're ready to send out a search party for you, Tristan teased. What am I going to do with you, Red? Always causing so much trouble in my realm. I shrugged and stood on my toes to kiss him again. What can I say? It's a gift, and at least you made it back to your realm. Otherwise, I would have been chasing you down in Silver Valley somewhere. He laughed until his brow furrowed, and he stared up at the sky. What is that? What? I leaned my head back as he pointed at the light growing larger overhead. At first I thought it was the darkness receding, but we hadn't weakened Baladin that much, had we? Then the light shot across the sky, crashing toward to the ground and aiming for the castle. Tristan shifted, and I climbed onto his back, digging my hands into his fur as he took off. I kept my eyes locked on that light as it slammed down, preventing me from seeing the castle and everyone who stood outside its walls. Tristan's paws dug in deeper, and I hunkered lower as he bolted. Just as we pulled up short and he shifted back, the bright light of day dimmed until I saw a figure standing in front of Forrest. Mori had returned, clear in the full glory of how she'd been before she'd been taken by Baladin. Forrest was stunned into silence by her beauty, and I couldn't blame him. She was magnificent, and when she glanced around, her eyes were filled with stars from a night sky that I hadn't seen in too many days. Her skin was luminescent, and her silver hair trickled with more stars, dripping to the ground at her feet. Tristan squeezed my hand as if to ask why she was here, but I was just as lost as everyone else. You, she said as she forced her gaze back to Forrest. Maury. Forrest asked in a breath. You've come back. Why? Tristan and I cautiously stepped closer as she reached out to Forrest as if to calm him. First, I must thank you for saving me from Baladin, she told him, bowing her head. And second, I have been sent down to you by the gods to help you prepare. My gut twisted in apprehension. Forrest asked the question on all our minds. Prepare. She nodded. For the final battle. The time has come to destroy the darkness, and I fear you are running out of time, Forrest, King of Gregorneth. You all are running out of time. So much for having a few days to celebrate a small victory. The keeper of the gateway to the gods turned to face me next. At first I was taken aback by her intense stare, but then the words of the riddle that had toyed with me since the day I read the words played through my mind, drowning out all other sounds, and I knew I'd been right to think she was part of ending this darkness. A beast so fierce with eyes of the sky, a secret hidden away from time, a guiding light, at her prime I whispered. Tristan frowned. What are you saying? I think. I think I just figured out how to save the realms. But then the woman turned her back to me, and I was left with a hollow feeling deep in my chest. Whatever Mori's purpose, it was damned clear our hardest battle was waiting for us on the horizon. All I could do was pray to the gods we just rescued that this one would be the last and in the end, we'd all walk away. Alive. I hope you've enjoyed this Kit Blade Grave book. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.